This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. Recorded by Peter Yearsley. Ghost Stories of an Antiquary, Volume 1, by M. R. James. Author's Preface. If anyone is curious about my local settings, let it be recorded that St. Bertrand de Comminges and Viborg are real places, that in O oh, Whistle and I'll Come to You I had Felix Doe in mind. As for the fragments of ostensible erudition which are scattered about my pages, hardly anything in them is not pure invention. There never was, naturally, any such book as that which I quote in The Treasure of Abbot Thomas. Canon Alberic's scrapbook was written in 1894 and printed soon after in the National Review. Lost Hearts appeared in the Pall Mall magazine. Of the next five stories, most of which were read to friends at Christmas time at King's College, Cambridge, I only recollect that I wrote Number 13 in 1899 while the treasure of Abbot Thomas was composed in the summer of 1904. M. R. James Canon Alberic's Scrapbook saint Bertrand de Comminges is a decayed town on the spurs of the Pyrenees, not very far from Toulouse, and still nearer to Bagnères de Luchon. It was the site of a bishopric until the Revolution, and has a cathedral which is visited by a certain number of tourists. In the spring of 1883 an Englishman arrived at this old-world place. I can hardly dignify it with the name of city, for there are not a thousand inhabitants. He was a Cambridge man, who had come specially from Toulouse to see saint Bertrand's church, and had left two friends who were less keen archaeologists than himself, in their hotel at Toulouse, under promise to join him on the following morning. Half an hour at the church would satisfy them, and all three could then pursue their journey in the direction of Auch. But our Englishman had come early on the day in question, and proposed to himself to fill a notebook, and to use several dozens of plates in the process of describing and photographing every corner of the wonderful church that dominates the little hill of Comminges. In order to carry out this design satisfactorily, it was necessary to monopolize the verger of the church for the day. The verger, or sacristan, I prefer the latter appellation, inaccurate as it may be, was accordingly sent for by the somewhat brusque lady who keeps the inn of the Chapeau Rouge, and when he came the Englishman found him an unexpectedly interesting object of study. It was not in the personal appearance of the little, dry, wizened old man that the interest lay, for he was precisely like dozens of other church guardians in France, but in a curious, furtive, or rather hunted and oppressed air which he had. He was perpetually half glancing behind him, the muscles of his back and shoulders seemed to be hunched in a continual nervous contraction, as if he were expecting every moment to find himself in the clutch of an enemy. The Englishman hardly knew whether to put him down as a man haunted by a fixed delusion, or as one oppressed by a guilty conscience, or as an unbearably henpecked husband. The probabilities, when reckoned up, certainly pointed to the last idea, but still the impression conveyed was that of a more formidable persecutor even than a termagant wife. However, the Englishman, let us call him Deniston, was soon too deep in his notebook and too busy with his camera to give more than an occasional glance to the sacristan. Whenever he did look at him, he found him at no great distance, either huddling himself back against the wall or crouching in one of the gorgeous stalls. Deniston became 
rather fidgety after a time, mingled suspicions that he was keeping the old man from his déjeuner, that he was regarded as likely to make away with St. Bertrand's ivory crozier, or with the dusty, stuffed crocodile that hangs over the font, began to torment him. "'Won't you go home?' he said at last. "'I'm quite well able to finish my notes alone. You can lock me in if you like. I shall want at least two hours more here, and it must be cold for you, isn't it?' "'Good heavens!' said the little man, whom the suggestion seemed to throw into a state of unaccountable terror. "'Such a thing cannot be thought of for a moment. Leave Monsieur alone in the church? No, no. Two hours, three hours, all will be the same to me. I have breakfasted. I am not at all cold. With many thanks to Monsieur.' "'Very well, my little man,' quoth Deniston to himself. "'You have been warned, and you must take the consequences.' Before the expiration of the two hours, the stalls, the enormous dilapidated organ, the choir-screen of Bishop Jean de Molian, the remnants of glass and tapestry, and the objects in the treasure-chamber had been well and truly examined, the sacristan still keeping at Deniston's heels, and every now and then whipping round as if he had been stung, when one or other of the strange noises that trouble a large empty building fell on his ear. Curious noises they were sometimes. Once, Deniston said to me, I could have sworn I heard a thin metallic voice laughing high up in the tower. I darted an inquiring glance at my sacristan. He was white to the lips. It is he. That is, it, it is no one. The door is locked, was all that he said, and we looked at each other for a full minute. Another little incident puzzled Deniston a good deal. He was examining a large dark picture that hangs behind the altar, one of a series illustrating the miracles of Saint Bertron. The composition of the picture is well nigh indecipherable, but there is a Latin legend below which runs thus Qualitur es Bertrandus liberavit hominem quem diabolos diu volebat strangulare. How Saint Bertrand delivered a man whom the devil long sought to strangle. Deniston was turning to the sacristan with a smile and a jocular remark of some sort on his lips, but he was confounded to see the old man on his knees, gazing at the picture with the eye of a suppliant in agony, his hands tightly clasped, and a rain of tears on his cheeks. Deniston naturally pretended to have noticed nothing, but the question would not go away from him. Why should a daub of this kind affect anyone so strongly? He seemed to himself to be getting some sort of clue to the reason of the strange look that had been puzzling him all day. The man must be a monomaniac. But what was his monomania? It was nearly five o'clock. The short day was drawing in, and the church began to fill with shadows, while the curious noises, the muffled footfalls and distant talking voices that had been perceptible all day, seemed, no doubt because of the fading light and the consequently quickened sense of hearing, to become more frequent and insistent. The sacristan began for the first time to show signs of hurry and impatience. He heaved a sigh of relief when camera and notebook were finally packed up and stowed away, and hurriedly beckoned Deniston to the western door of the church under the tower. It was time to ring the Angelus. A few pulls at the reluctant rope, and the great belle Bertrand, high in the tower, began to speak, and swung her voice up among the pines and down to the valleys loud with mountain streams, calling the dwellers on those lonely hills to remember and repeat the salutation of the angel to her whom he called blessed among women. With that, a profound quiet seemed to fall for the first time that day upon the little town, and Denistoon and the sacristan went out of the church. On the doorstep they fell into conversation. Monsieur seemed to interest himself in the old choir-books in the sacristy. Undoubtedly, I was going to ask you if there were a library in the town. No, monsieur. 
Perhaps there used to be one belonging to the chapter, but it is now such a small place. Here came a strange pause of irresolution, as it seemed. Then, with a sort of plunge, he went on, But if monsieur is amateur de vieux livres, I have at home something that might interest him. It is not a hundred yards. At once, all Deniston's cherished dreams of finding priceless manuscripts in untrodden corners of France flashed up, to die down again the next moment. It was probably a stupid missile of Plantin's printing, about 1580. Where was the likelihood that a place so near Toulouse would not have been ransacked long ago by collectors? However, it would be foolish not to go. He would reproach himself forever after if he refused. So they set off. On the way, the curious irresolution and sudden determination of the sacristan recurred to Denistoun, and he wondered, in a shamefaced way, whether he was being decoyed into some purlieu to be made away with as a supposed rich Englishman. He contrived, therefore, to begin talking with his guide, and to drag in, in a rather clumsy fashion, the fact that he expected two friends to join him early the next morning. To his surprise the announcement seemed to relieve the sacristan at once of some of the anxiety that oppressed him. "'That is well,' he said quite brightly. "'That is very well. Monsieur will travel in company with his friends. They will always be near him. It is a good thing to travel thus in company, sometimes.' The last word appeared to be added as an afterthought, and to bring with it a relapse into gloom for the poor little man. They were soon at the house, which was one rather larger than its neighbours, stone-built, with a shield carved over the door, the shield of Alberic de Morlion, a collateral descendant, Deniston tells me, of Bishop Jean de Morlion. This Alberic was a canon of Comminges from 1680 to 1701. The upper windows of the mansion were boarded up, and the whole place bore, as does the rest of Comminges, the aspect of decaying age. Arrived on his doorstep, the sacristan paused a moment. Perhaps, he said, perhaps after all, monsieur has not the time. Not at all. Lots of time. Nothing to do till tomorrow. Let us see what it is you have got. The door was opened at this point, and a face looked out, a face far younger than the sacristan's, but bearing something of the same distressing look. Only here it seemed to be the mark not so much of fear for personal safety, as of acute anxiety on behalf of another. Plainly the owner of the face was the sacristan's daughter, and, but for the expression I have described, she was a handsome girl enough. She brightened up considerably on seeing her father accompanied by an able-bodied stranger. A few remarks passed between father and daughter, of which Deniston only caught the words said by the sacristan, "'He was laughing in the church,' words which were answered only by a look of terror from the girl. But in another minute they were in the sitting-room of the house, a small, high chamber with a stone floor, full of moving shadows cast by a wood fire that flickered on a great hearth. Something of the character of an oratory was imparted to it by a tall crucifix, which reached almost to the ceiling on one side. The figure was painted of the natural colours. The cross was black. Under this stood a chest of some age and solidity, and when a lamp had been brought and chairs set, the sacristan went to this chest and produced therefrom, with growing excitement and nervousness, as Dennis soon thought, a large book, wrapped in a white cloth, on which cloth a cross was rudely emblazoned in red thread. Even before the wrapping had been removed, Deniston began to be interested by the size and shape of the volume. Too large for a missal, he thought, and not the shape of an antiphona. Perhaps it may be something good after all. The next moment the book was open and Deniston felt that he had at last lit upon something better than good. Before him lay a large folio, bound, perhaps, late in the seventeenth century, with the arms of Canon Alberic de Molion, stamped in gold on the sides. There may have been a hundred and fifty leaves of paper in the book, 
and on almost every one of them was fastened a leaf from an illuminated manuscript. Such a collection Deniston had hardly dreamed of in his wildest moments. Here were ten leaves from a copy of Genesis, illustrated with pictures which could not be later than A.D. 700. Further on was a complete set of pictures from a Psalter of English execution of the very finest kind that the thirteenth century could produce. And, perhaps best of all, there were twenty leaves of unseal writing in Latin, which, as a few words seen here and there told him at once, must belong to some very early unknown patristic treatise. Could it possibly be a fragment of the copy of Papias on the words of our Lord? which was known to have existed as late as the twelfth century, at Nîmes. Footnote. We now know that these leaves did contain a considerable fragment of that work, if not of that actual copy of it. Return to the text. In any case, his mind was made up. That book must return to Cambridge with him, even if he had to draw the whole of his balance from the bank and stay at Saint-Bertrand till the money came. He glanced up at the sacristan to see if his face yielded any hint that the book was for sale. The sacristan was pale, and his lips were working. "'If monsieur will turn on to the end,' he said. So monsieur turned on, meeting new treasures at every rise of a leaf, and at the end of the book he came upon two sheets of paper of much more recent date than anything he had seen yet which puzzled him considerably. They must be contemporary, he decided, with the unprincipled canon Alberic, who had doubtless plundered the chapter library of Saint-Bertrand to form this priceless scrapbook. On the first of the paper sheets was a plan, carefully drawn and instantly recognisable by a person who knew the ground, of the south aisle and cloisters of Saint-Bertrand's. There were curious signs looking like planetary symbols, and a few Hebrew words in the corners. And in the north-west angle of the cloister was a cross drawn in gold paint. Below the plan were some lines of writing in Latin, which ran thus. Responsa duodecimus dec mille sescenti nonagenta quatuor interrogatum est inveniamne Responsum est, invenies, fiamne dives, fies, vivamne invidendus, vives, moriarne in lecto meo, ita. Answers of the 12th of December, 1694. It was asked, Shall I find it? Answer, Thou shalt. Shall I become rich? Thou wilt. Shall I live an object of envy? Thou wilt. Shall I die in my bed? Thou wilt. A good specimen of the treasure hunter's record quite reminds one of Mr. Minor Canon Quatremain in Old St. Paul's, was Deniston's comment, and he turns the leaf. What he then saw impressed him, as he has often told me, more than he could have conceived any drawing or picture capable of impressing him. And though the drawing he saw is no longer in existence, there is a photograph of it, which I possess, which fully bears out that statement. The picture in question was a sepia drawing at the end of the seventeenth century, representing, one would say at first sight, a biblical scene, for the architecture the picture represented an interior, and the figures had that semi-classical flavour about them which the artists of two hundred years ago thought appropriate to illustrations of the Bible. On the right was a king on his throne, the throne elevated on twelve steps, a canopy overhead, soldiers on either side, evidently King Solomon. He was bending forward with outstretched scepter, in attitude of command. His face expressed horror and disgust, yet there was in it also the mark of imperious command and confident power. The left half of the picture was the strangest, however. 
the interest plainly centred there. On the pavement before the throne were grouped four soldiers, surrounding a crouching figure, which must be described in a moment. A fifth soldier lay dead on the pavement, his neck distorted, and his eyeballs starting from his head. The four surrounding guards were looking at the king. In their faces the sentiment of horror was intensified. They seemed, in fact, only restrained from flight by their implicit trust in their master. All this terror was plainly excited by the being that crouched in their midst. I entirely despair of conveying by any words the impression which this figure makes upon any one who looks at it. I recollect once showing the photograph of the drawing to a lecturer on morphology. A person of, I was going to say, abnormally sane and unimaginative habits of mind. He absolutely refused to be alone for the rest of that evening, and he told me afterwards that for many nights he had not dared to put out his light before going to sleep. However, the main traits of the figure I can at least indicate. At first you saw only a mass of coarse, matted black hair. Presently it was seen that this covered a body of fearful thinness, almost a skeleton, but with the muscles standing out like wires. The hands were of a dusky pallor, covered like the body with long coarse hairs and hideously taloned. The eyes, touched in with a burning yellow, had intensely black pupils, and were fixed upon the throned king with a look of beast-like hate. Imagine one of the awful bird-catching spiders of South America translated into human form, and endowed with intelligence just less than human, and you will have some faint conception of the terror inspired by the appalling effigy. One remark is universally made by those to whom I have shown the picture. It was drawn from the life. As soon as the first shock of his irresistible fright had subsided, Deniston stole a look at his hosts. The sacristan's hands were pressed upon his eyes. His daughter, looking up at the cross on the wall, was telling her beads feverishly. At last the question was asked, Is this book for sale? There was the same hesitation, the same plunge of determination that he had noticed before. And then came the welcome answer. If monsieur pleases. How much do you ask for it? I will take, I will take two hundred and fifty francs. This was confounding. Even a collector's conscience is sometimes stirred, and Deniston's conscience was tenderer than a collector's. My good man, he said again and again, your book is worth far more than two hundred and fifty francs. I assure you, far more. But the answer did not vary. I will take two hundred and fifty francs, not more. There was really no possibility of refusing such a chance. The money was paid, the receipt signed, a glass of wine drunk over the transaction, and then the sacristan seemed to become a new man. He stood upright, he ceased to throw those suspicious glances behind him, he actually laughed or tried to laugh. Deniston rose to go. "'I shall have the honour of accompanying monsieur to his hotel,' said the sacristan. "'Oh, no, thanks. It isn't a hundred yards. I know the way perfectly. And there is a moon.' The offer was pressed three or four times, and refused as often. "'Though monsieur will summon me if—if if he finds occasion. He will keep the middle of the road. The sides are so rough.' "'Certainly, certainly,' said Deniston who was impatient to examine his prize by himself, and he stepped out into the passage with his book under his arm. Here he was met by the daughter. She, it appeared, was anxious to do a little business on her own account, perhaps like Gehazi, to take somewhat from the foreigner whom her father had spared. A silver crucifix and chain for the neck? Monsieur would perhaps be good enough to accept it? Well, really, Deniston hadn't much use for these things. What did Mademoiselle want for it? Nothing, nothing in the world. Monsieur is more than welcome to it. 
The tone in which this and much more was said was unmistakably genuine, so that Deniston was reduced to profuse thanks and submitted to have the chain put round his neck. It really seemed as if he had rendered the father and daughter some service which they hardly knew how to repay. As he set off with his book they stood at the door looking after him, and they were still looking when he waved them a last good night from the steps of the Chapeau Rouge. Dinner was over, and Deniston was in his bedroom, shut up alone with his acquisition. The landlady had manifested a particular interest in him, since he had told her that he had paid a visit to the sacristan, and bought an old book from him. He thought, too, that he had heard a hurried dialogue between her and the said sacristan in the passage outside the salle à manger, some words to the effect that Pierre and Bertrand would be sleeping in the house, had closed the conversation. All this time a growing feeling of discomfort had been creeping over him, nervous reaction perhaps after the delight of his discovery. Whatever it was, it resulted in a conviction that there was someone behind him, and that he was far more comfortable with his back to the wall. All of this, of course, weighed light in the balance as against the obvious value of the collection he had acquired. And now, as I said, he was alone in his bedroom, taking stock of Canon Alberic's treasures, in which every moment revealed something more charming. "'Bless Canon Alberic,' said Deniston, who had an inveterate habit of talking to himself. "'I wonder where he is now. Dear me, I wish that landlady would learn to laugh in a more cheering manner. It makes one feel as if there was someone dead in the house. Half a pipe more, did you say? I think perhaps you're right. I wonder what that crucifix is that the young woman insisted on giving me. Last century, I suppose?' Yes, probably. It is rather a nuisance of a thing to have round one's neck. Just too heavy. Most likely her father has been wearing it for years. I think I might give it a clean-up before I put it away. He had taken the crucifix off and laid it on the table, when his attention was caught by an object lying on the red cloth just by his left elbow. Two or three ideas of what it might be flitted through his brain with their own incalculable quickness. A pen-wiper? No, no such thing in the house. A rat? No, too black. A large spider? I trust to goodness not. No. Good God. A hand? Like the hand in that picture? In another infinitesimal flash he had taken it in. Pale, dusky skin, covering nothing but bones and tendons of appalling strength coarse black hairs, longer than ever grew on a human hand, nails rising from the ends of the fingers and curling sharply down and forward, grey, horny, and wrinkled. He flew out of his chair with deadly, inconceivable terror clutching at his heart. The shape, whose left hand rested on the table, was rising to a standing posture behind his seat, its right hand crooked above his scalp. There was black and tattered drapery about it. The coarse hair covered it as in the drawing. The lower jaw was thin. What can I call it? Shallow, like a beast's. Teeth showed behind the black lips. There was no nose. The eyes of a fiery yellow, against which the pupils showed black and intense, and the exulting hate and thirst to destroy life, which shone there, were the most horrifying features in the whole vision. There was intelligence of a kind in them intelligence beyond that of a beast, below that of a man. The feelings which this horror stirred in Deniston were the intensest physical fear and the most profound mental loathing. What did he do? What could he do? He has never been quite certain what words he said, but he knows that he spoke, that he grasped blindly at the silver crucifix, that he was conscious of a movement towards him on the part of the demon and that he screamed with the voice of an animal in hideous pain. Pierre and Bertrand, the two sturdy little serving-men who rushed in, saw nothing, but felt themselves thrust aside by something that passed out between them, and found Deniston in a swoon. They sat up with him that night, and his two friends were at Saint-Bertrand by nine o'clock next morning. He himself, though 
still shaken and nervous, was almost himself by that time, and his story found credence with them, though not until they had seen the drawing and talked with the sacristan. Almost at dawn the little man had come to the inn on some pretense, and had listened with the deepest interest to the story retailed by the landlady. He showed no surprise. "'It is he! It is he! I have seen him myself!' was his only comment, and to all questionings but one reply was vouchsafed. "'Deux fois je l'ai vu, mille fois je l'ai senti.' He would tell them nothing of the provenance of the book, nor any details of his experiences. I shall soon sleep, and my rest will be sweet. Why should you trouble me? he said. Footnote. He died that summer. His daughter married, and settled at Saint-Papou. She never understood the circumstances of her father's obsession. Return to text. We shall never know what he or Canon Alberic de Molion suffered. At the back of that fateful drawing were some lines of writing which may be supposed to throw light on the situation. Contradict Salomonis cum demonio nocturno, Albericus de Molione delineavit, ve Deus in adiutorium, pies qui habitat, Sancte Patronde demoniorum effugator, indicede pro me miserimo, primum iudi nocte, duo decimus, dec, mille sescenti, non aginta, quatuor, uidibo mox ultimum, pecari et passus sum, plura adhuc passurus, dec, viginti novem, mille septigenti unum, i.e., the dispute of Solomon with a demon of the night, drawn by Albrecht de Molion, versicle, O Lord, make haste to help me, psalm, Whoso dwelleth, 91, Saint Bertrand, who puttest devils to flight, pray for me, most unhappy. I saw it first on the night of December the 12th, 1694. Soon I shall see it for the last time. I have sinned and suffered, and have more to suffer yet. December the 29th, 1701. The Gallia Christiana gives the date of the canon's death as December the 31st, 1701, in bed of a sudden seizure. Details of this kind are not common in the great work of the Samarthani. I have never quite understood what was Deniston's view of the events I have narrated. He quoted to me once a text from Ecclesiasticus. Some spirits there be that are created for vengeance, and in their fury lay on sore strokes. On another occasion he said, Isaiah was a very sensible man. Doesn't he say something about night monsters living in the ruins of Babylon? These things are rather beyond us at present. Another confidence of his impressed me rather, and I sympathized with it. We had been last year to Comminges to see Canon Alberic's tomb. It is a great marble erection with an effigy of the canon in a large wig and soutane, and an elaborate eulogy of his learning below. I saw Deniston talking for some time with the vicar of St. Bertrand's, and as we drove away he said to me, I hope it isn't wrong. You know I am a Presbyterian, but I, I believe there will be saying of mass and singing of dirges for Albrecht de Molion's rest. Then he added, with a touch of the northern British in his tone, I had no notion they came so dear. The book is in the Wentworth collection at Cambridge. The drawing was photographed and then burned by Deniston on the day when he left Comminges on the occasion of his first visit. End of Canon Albrecht's scrapbook in M. R. James's Ghost Stories of an Antiquary, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All the LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how to volunteer, 
please contact LibriVox.org. Recorded by Peter Yearsley. Ghost Stories of an Antiquary, Volume 1, by M. R. James. Lost Hearts. It was, as far as I can ascertain, in September of the year 1811, that a post-chaise drew up before the door of Azelby Hall in the heart of Lincolnshire. The little boy who was the only passenger in the chaise, and who jumped out as soon as it had stopped, looked about him with the keenest curiosity during the short interval that elapsed between the ringing of the bell and the opening of the hall door. He saw a tall, square, red-brick house, built in the reign of Anne. A stone-pillared porch had been added in the purer classical style of 1790. The windows of the house were many, tall and narrow, with small panes and thick white woodwork. A pediment pierced with a round window crowned the front. There were wings to the right and left, connected by curious glazed galleries supported by colonnades, with the central block. These wings plainly contained the stables and offices of the house. Each was surmounted by an ornamental cupola with a gilded vane. An evening light shone on the building, making the window panes glow like so many fires. Away from the hall in front stretched a flat park, studded with oaks and fringed with firs, which stood out against the sky. The clock in the church tower, buried in trees on the edge of the park, only its golden weathercock catching the light, was striking six, and the sound came gently beating down the wind. It was altogether a pleasant impression, though tinged with the sort of melancholy appropriate to an evening in early autumn that was conveyed to the mind of the boy who was standing in the porch waiting for the door to open to him. The post-chaise had brought him from Warwickshire, where some six months before he had been left an orphan. Now, owing to the generous offer of his elderly cousin, Mr. Abney, he had come to live at Aswerby. The offer was unexpected, because all who knew anything of Mr. Abney looked upon him as a somewhat austere recluse, into whose steady-going household the advent of a small boy would import a new and, it seemed, incongruous element. The truth is that very little was known of Mr. Abney's pursuits or temper. The professor of Greek at Cambridge had been heard to say that no one knew more of the religious beliefs of the later pagans than did the owner of Azubi. Certainly his library contained all the then available books bearing on the mysteries, the Orphic poems, the worship of Mithras, and the Neoplatonists. In the marble-paved hall stood a fine group of Mithras slaying a bull, which had been imported from the Levant at great expense by the owner. He had contributed a description of it to the gentleman's magazine, and he had written a remarkable series of articles in the Critical Museum on the superstitions of the Romans of the Lower Empire. He was looked upon, in fine, as a man wrapped up in his books, and it was a matter of great surprise among his neighbours that he should ever have heard of his orphan cousin, Stephen Elliot, much more than he should have volunteered to make him an inmate of Azerby Hall. Whatever may have been expected by his neighbours, it is certain that Mr. Abney, the tall, the thin, the austere, seemed inclined to give his young cousin a kindly reception. The moment the front door was opened, he darted out of his study, rubbing his hands with delight. "'How are you, my boy? How are you? How old are you?' said he. "'That is, you're not too much tired, I hope, by your journey to eat your supper.' "'No, thank you, sir,' said Master Elliot. "'I am pretty well.' "'That's a good lad,' said Mr. Abney. "'And how old are you, my boy?' It seemed a little odd that he should have asked the question twice in the first two minutes of their acquaintance. 
"'I'm twelve years old next birthday, sir,' said Stephen. "'And when is your birthday, my dear boy? Eleventh of September, eh? "'That's well, that's very well. Nearly a year hence, isn't it? "'I like, <laughs> I like to get these things down in my book. "'Sure it's twelve? Mm, certain?' "'Yes, quite sure, sir. "'Well, well. Um, "'Take him to Mrs. Bunch's room, Parks, "'and let him have his tea, supper, whatever it is.' "'Yes, sir,' answered the staid Mr. Parks, "'and conducted Stephen to the lower regions. "'Mrs. Bunch was the most comfortable and human person "'whom Stephen had as yet met at Asaby. "'She made him completely at home, they were great friends in a quarter of an hour, and great friends they remained. Mrs. Bunch had been born in the neighbourhood some fifty-five years before the date of Stephen's arrival, and her residence at the hall was of twenty years' standing. Consequently, if anyone knew the ins and outs of the house and the district, Mrs. Bunch knew them, and she was by no means disinclined to communicate her information. Certainly, there were plenty of things about the hall and the hall gardens which Stephen, who was of an adventurous and inquiring turn, was anxious to have explained to him. Who built the temple at the end of the laurel walk? Who was the old man whose picture hung on the staircase, sitting at a table with a skull under his hand? These and many similar points were cleared up by the resources of Mrs. Bunch's powerful intellect. There were others, however, of which the explanations furnished were less satisfactory. One November evening, Stephen was sitting by the fire in the housekeeper's room, reflecting on his surroundings. "'Is Mr. Abney a good man, and will he go to heaven?' he suddenly asked, with the peculiar confidence which children possess in the ability of their elders to settle these questions, the decision of which is believed to be reserved for other tribunals. "'Good bless the child,' said Mrs. Bunch. "'Master's as kind a soul as ever I see. Didn't I never tell you of the little boy as he took in out of the street, as you may say, this seven years back, and the little girl, two years after I first come here?' "'No, do tell me all about them, Mrs. Bunch. Now, this minute.' "'Well,' said Mrs. Bunch, the little girl I don't seem to recollect so much about. I know Master brought her back with him from his walk one day, and give orders to Mrs. Ellis, as, as was housekeeper then, as she should be took every care with. And the poor child hadn't no one belonging to her. She told me so her own self, and here she lived with us a matter of three weeks, it might be, and then, whether she was something of a gypsy in her blood or what not, but one morning she out of a bed afore any of us had opened an eye, and neither track nor yet trace of her have I set eyes on since. Master was wonderful put about, and had all the ponds dragged, but it's my belief she was had away by them gypsies, for there was singing around the house for as much as an hour the night she went. And Parks, he declare as he heard them a-calling in the woods all that afternoon. Dear, dear, a hod child she was. So silent in her ways and all, but I was wonderful taken up with her. So domesticated she was, surprising. And what about the little boy? said Stephen. Ah, oh, that poor boy, sighed Mrs. Bunch. He were a foreigner, Jeveny he called himself, and he come a tweaking his hurdy gurdy round and about the drive one winter day, and Master had him in that minute, and asked all about where he came from and how old he was, and how he made his way, and where was his relatives, and all as kind as heart could wish. But it went the same way with him. They're a unruly lot, them foreign nations, I do suppose, and he was off one fine morning just the same as the girl. Why he went, and what he done, was our question for as much as a year after, for he never took his hurdy gurdy and there it lays on the shelf. The remainder of the evening was spent by Stephen in miscellaneous cross-examination of Mrs. Bunch, and in efforts to extract a tune from the hurdy-gurdy. That night he had a curious dream. At the end of the passage, at the top of the house, in which his bedroom was situated, 
there was an old disused bathroom. It was kept locked, but the upper half of the door was glazed, and, since the muslin curtains which used to hang there had long been gone, you could look in and see the lead-lined bath affixed to the wall on the right hand, with its head towards the window. On the night of which I am speaking, Stephen Elliot found himself, as he thought, looking through the glazed door. The moon was shining through the window, and he was glazing at a figure which lay in the bath. His description of what he saw reminds me of what I once beheld myself in the famous vaults of St. Michan's Church in Dublin, which possesses the horrid property of preserving corpses from decay for centuries. A figure inexpressibly thin and pathetic, of a dusty leaden colour, enveloped in a shroud-like garment, the thin lips crooked into a faint and dreadful smile, the hands pressed tightly over the region of the heart. As he looked upon it, a distant, almost inaudible moan seemed to issue from its lips, and the arms began to stir. The terror of the sight forced Stephen backwards, and he awoke to the fact that he was indeed standing on the cold boarded floor of the passage, in the full light of the moon. With a courage which I do not think can be common among boys of his age, he went to the door of the bathroom to ascertain if the figure of his dreams were really there. It was not, and he went back to bed. Mrs. Bunch was much impressed next morning by his story, and went so far as to replace the muslin curtain over the glazed door of the bathroom. Mr. Abney, moreover, to whom he confided his experiences at breakfast, was greatly interested, and made notes of the matter in what he called his book. The spring equinox was approaching, as Mr. Abney frequently reminded his cousin, adding that this had been always considered by the ancients to be a critical time for the young, that Stephen would do well to take care of himself, and to shut his bedroom window at night, and that Censorinus had some valuable remarks on the subject. Two incidents that occurred about this time made an impression upon Stephen's mind. The first was after an unusually uneasy and oppressed night that he had passed though he could not recall any particular dream that he had had. The following evening Mrs. Bunch was occupying herself in mending his nightgown. "'Gracious me, Master Stephen,' she broke forth rather irritably, "'how do you manage to tear your nightdress all to flinders this way? Look here, sir, what trouble you do give to poor servants that have to darn and mend after you?' There was, indeed, a most destructive and apparently wanton series of slits or scorings in the garment, which would undoubtedly require a skilful needle to make good. They were confined to the left side of the chest, long, parallel slits about six inches in length, some of them not quite piercing the texture of the linen. Stephen could only express his entire ignorance of their origin. He was sure they were not there the night before. But he said, Mrs. Bunch, they're just the same as the scratches on the outside of my bedroom door, and I'm sure I never had anything to do with making them. Mrs. Bunch gazed at him open-mouthed, then snatched up a candle, departed hastily from the room, and was heard making her way upstairs. In a few minutes she came down. Well, she said, Master Stephen, it's a funny thing to me how them marks and scratches can have come there too high up for any cat or dog to have made em, much less a rat, for all the world like a Chinaman's fingernails, as my uncle in the tea trade used to tell us of when we was girls together. I wouldn't say nothing to Master, not if I was you, Master Stephen, my dear, and just turn the key of the door when you go up to your bed. I always do, Mrs. Bunch, as soon as I've said my prayers. Ah, oh, that's a good child. Always say your prayers, and then no one can't hurt you. Herewith Mrs. Bunch addressed herself to mending the injured nightgown, with intervals of meditation, until bedtime. This was on a Friday night in March, 1812. 
On the following evening, the usual duet of Stephen and Mrs. Bunch was augmented by the sudden arrival of Mr. Parks, the butler, who as a rule kept himself rather to himself in his own pantry. He did not see that Stephen was there. He was moreover flustered, and less slow of speech than was his wont. "'Master may get up his own wine if he likes of an evening,' was his first remark. "'Either I do it in the daytime or not at all, Mrs. Bunch. I don't know what it may be. Very like it's the rats, or the wind got into the cellars, but I'm not so young as I was, and I can't go through with it as I have done. Well, Mr. Parks, you know it is a surprising place for the rats, is the hole. I am not denying that, Mrs. Bunch, and to be sure many a time I've heard the tale from the men in the shipyards about the rat that could speak. I never laid no confidence in that before, but to-night, if I'd demeaned myself to lay my ear on the door of the further bin, I could pretty much have heard what they were saying. Oh, there, Mr. Park, I've no patience with your fancies. Rats talking in the wine cellar, indeed. Well, Mrs. Bunch, I've no wish to argue with you. All I say is, if you choose to go to the far bin and lay your ear to the door, you may prove my words this minute. What nonsense you do talk, Mr. Parks. Not fit for children to listen to. Why, you'll be frightening Master Stephen there out of his wits. What? Master Stephen? said Parks awaking to the consciousness of the boy's presence. Master Stephen knows well enough when I am playing a joke with you, Mrs. Bunch. In fact, Master Stephen knew much too well to suppose that Mr. Parks had in the first instance intended a joke. He was interested, not altogether pleasantly, in the situation, but all his questions were unsuccessful in inducing the butler to give any more detailed account of his experiences in the wine cellar. We have now arrived at March the 24th, 1812. It was a day of curious experiences for Stephen. A windy, noisy day, which filled the house and the gardens with a restless impression. As Stephen stood by the fence of the grounds, and looked out into the park, he felt as if an endless procession of unseen people were sweeping past him on the wind, borne on resistlessly and aimlessly, vainly striving to stop themselves, to catch at something that might arrest their flight, and bring them once again into contact with the living world of which they had formed a part. After luncheon that day, Mr. Abney said, "'Stephen, my boy, do you think you could manage to come to me tonight, as late as eleven o'clock in my study? I shall be busy until that time, and I wish to show you something connected with your future life, which it is most important that you should know. You are not to mention this matter to Mrs. Bunch, nor to anyone else in the house, and you had better go to your room at the usual time." Here was a new excitement added to life. Stephen eagerly grasped at the opportunity of sitting up till eleven o'clock. He looked in at the library door on his way upstairs that evening, and saw a brazier, which he had often noticed in the corner of the room, moved out before the fire. An old silver gilt cup stood on the table, filled with red wine, and some written sheets of paper lay near it. Mr. Abney was sprinkling some incense on the brazier from a round silver box as Stephen passed, but did not seem to notice his step. The wind had fallen, and there was a still night and a full moon. At about ten o'clock Stephen was standing at the open window of his bedroom, looking out over the country. Still as the night was, the mysterious population of the distant moonlit woods was not yet lulled to rest. From time to time strange cries, as of lost and despairing wanderers, sounded from across the mere. They might be the notes of owls or water-birds, yet they did not quite resemble either sound. Were they not coming nearer? Now they sounded from the nearer side of the water, and in a few moments they seemed to be floating about among the shrubberies. Then they ceased. But just as Stephen was thinking of shutting the window and resuming his reading of Robinson Crusoe, he caught sight of two figures standing on the gravelled terrace that ran along the garden side of the hall, the figures of a boy and girl, as it seemed. 
they stood side by side, looking up at the windows. Something in the form of the girl recalled irresistibly his dream of the figure in the bath. The boy inspired him with more acute fear. Whilst the girl stood still, half smiling, with her hands clasped over her heart, the boy, a thin shape with black hair and ragged clothing, raised his arms in the air with an appearance of menace and of unappeasable hunger and longing. The moon shone upon his almost transparent hands, and Stephen saw that the nails were fearfully long, and that the light shone through them. As he stood with his arms thus raised, he disclosed a terrifying spectacle. On the left side of his chest there opened a black and gaping rent, and there fell upon Stephen's brain, rather than upon his ear, the impression of one of those hungry and desolate cries that he had heard resounding over the woods of Azubi all that evening. In another moment this dreadful pair had moved swiftly and noiselessly over the dry gravel, and he saw them no more. Inexpressibly frightened as he was, he determined to take his candle and go down to Mr. Abney's study, for the hour appointed for their meeting was near at hand. The study, or library, opened out of the front hall on one side, and Stephen, urged on by his terrors, did not take long in getting there. To effect an entrance was not so easy. It was not locked, he felt sure, for the key was on the outside of the door as usual. His repeated knocks produced no answer. Mr. Abney was engaged. He was speaking. What? Why did he try to cry out? And why was the cry choked in his throat? Had he, too, seen the mysterious children? But now everything was quiet, and the door yielded to Stephen's terrified and frantic pushing. On the table in Mr. Abney's study certain papers were found which explained the situation to Stephen Elliot when he was of an age to understand them. The most important sentences were as follows. It was a belief very strongly and generally held by the ancients, of whose wisdom in these matters I have had such experience as induces me to place confidence in their assertions, that by enacting certain processes which to us moderns have something of a barbaric complexion, a very remarkable enlightenment of the spiritual faculties in man may be attained. That, for example, by absorbing the personalities of a certain number of his fellow creatures, an individual may gain a complete ascendancy over those orders of spiritual beings which control the elemental forces of our universe. It is recorded of Simon Magus that he was able to fly in the air to become invisible, or to assume any form he pleased, by the agency of the soul of a boy whom, to use the libelous phrase employed by the author of the Clementine Recognitions, he had murdered. I find it set down, moreover, with considerable detail in the writings of Hermes Trismegistus, that similar happy results may be produced by the absorption of the hearts of not less than three human beings below the age of twenty-one years. To the testing of the truth of this recipe I have devoted the greater part of the last twenty years, selecting as the corpora villia of my experiment such persons as could conveniently be removed without occasioning a sensible gap in society. The first step I effected by the removal of one Phoebe Stanley, a girl of gypsy extraction, on March the 22nd, 1792, the second by the removal of a wandering Italian lad named Giovanni Paoli, on the night of March the 23rd, 1805, the final victim, to employ a word repugnant in the highest degree to my feelings, must be my cousin Stephen Elliot. His day must be this March 24th, 1812. The best means of effecting the required absorption is to remove the heart from the living subject, to reduce it to ashes, and to mingle them with about a pint of some red wine, preferably port. The remains of the first two subjects, at least, it will be well to conceal, 
A disused bathroom or wine cellar will be found convenient for such a purpose. Some annoyance may be experienced from the psychic portion of the subjects, which popular language dignifies with the name of ghosts, but the man of philosophic temperament, to whom alone the experiment is appropriate, will be little prone to attach importance to the feeble efforts of these beings to wreak their vengeance on him. I contemplate with the liveliest satisfaction the enlarged and emancipated existence which the experiment, if successful, will confer on me, not only placing me beyond the reach of human justice, so called, but eliminating, to a great extent, the prospect of death itself. Mr. Abney was found in his chair, his head thrown back, his face stamped with an expression of rage, fright, and mortal pain. In his left side was a terrible lacerated wound exposing the heart. There was no blood on his hands, and a long knife that lay on the table was perfectly clean. A savage wildcat might have inflicted the injuries. The window of the study was open, and it was the opinion of the coroner that Mr. Abney had met his death by the agency of some wild creature. But Stephen Elliot's study of the papers I have quoted led him to a very different conclusion. End of Lost Hearts in M. R. James's Ghost Stories of an Antiquary, Volume 1
As his museum already contained an enormous accumulation of topographical pictures, he was a regular rather than a copious buyer, and he rather looked to Mr. Britnell to fill up gaps in the rank and file of his collection than to supply him with rarities. Now, in February of last year, there appeared upon Mr. Williams's desk at the museum a catalogue from Mr. Britnell's emporium, and accompanying it was a typewritten communication from the dealer himself. This letter ran as follows. Dear Sir, we beg to call your attention to number 978 in our accompanying catalogue, which we shall be glad to send on approval. Yours faithfully, J. W. Britnell. To turn to number 978 in the accompanying catalogue was, with Mr. Williams, as he observed to himself, the work of a moment, and in the place indicated he found the following entry, 978, unknown, interesting mezzotint, view of a manor house, early part of the century, 15 by 10 inches, black frame, two pounds, two shillings. It was not specially exciting, and the price seemed high. However, as Mr. Britnell, who knew his business and his customer, seemed to set store by it, Mr. Williams wrote a postcard asking for the article to be sent on approval, along with some other engravings and sketches, which appeared in the same catalogue. And so he passed without much excitement of anticipation to the ordinary labours of the day. A parcel of any kind always arrives a day later than you expect it, and that of Mr. Britnell proved, as I believe the right phrase goes, no exception to the rule. It was delivered at the museum by the afternoon post of Saturday, after Mr. Williams had left his work, and it was accordingly brought round to his rooms in college by the attendant, in order that he might not have to wait over Sunday before looking through it, and returning such of the contents as he did not propose to keep. And here he found it, when he came in to tea, with a friend. The only item with which I am concerned was the rather large black-framed mezzotint, of which I have already quoted the short description given in Mr. Britnell's catalogue. Some more details of it will have to be given, though I cannot hope to put before you the look of the picture as clearly as it is present to my own eye. Very nearly the exact duplicate of it may be seen in a good many old inn parlours, or in the passages of undisturbed country mansions at the present moment. It was a rather indifferent mezzotint, and an indifferent mezzotint is perhaps the worst form of engraving known. It presented a full-face view of a not very large manor house of the last century, with three rows of plain sashed windows with rusticated masonry about them, a parapet with balls or vases at the angles, and a small portico in the centre. On either side were trees, and in front a considerable expanse of lawn. The legend A. W. F. Sculpsit was engraved on the narrow margin, and there was no further inscription. The whole thing gave the impression that it was the work of an amateur. What in the world Mr. Britnell could mean by affixing the price of two guineas to such an object was more than Mr. Williams could imagine. He turned it over with a good deal of contempt. Upon the back was a paper label, the left-hand half of which had been torn off. All that remained were the ends of two lines of writing. The first had the letters Ngli Hall N G L E Y H A W -L, L the second S S E X. It would perhaps be just worth while to identify the place represented, which he could easily do with the help of a gazetteer, and then he would send it back to Mr Britnell with some remarks reflecting upon the judgment of that gentleman. He lighted the candles, for it was now dark, made the tea, and supplied the friend with whom he had been playing golf, for I believe the authorities of the university I write of 
indulge in that pursuit by way of relaxation. And tea was taken to the accompaniment of a discussion which golfing persons can imagine for themselves, but which the conscientious writer has no right to inflict upon any non-golfing persons. The conclusion arrived at was that certain strokes might have been better, and that in certain emergencies neither player had experienced that amount of luck which a human being has a right to expect. It was now that the friend, let us call him Professor Binks, took up the framed engraving and said, "'What's this place, Williams?' "'Just what I was going to try to find out,' said Williams, going to the shelf for a gazetteer. "'Look at the back. Something Lee Hall, either in Sussex or Essex. Half the name's gone, you see. You don't happen to know it, I suppose.' "'It's from that man Britnell, I suppose, isn't it?' said Binks. "'Is it for the museum?' "'Well, I think I should buy it if the price was five shillings,' said Williams. "'But for some unearthly reason he wants two guineas for it. "'I can't conceive why. It's a wretched engraving, "'and there aren't even any figures to give it life.' "'It's not worth two guineas, I should think,' said Binks. "'But I don't think it's so badly done. "'The moonlight seems rather good to me, "'and I should have thought that there were figures, or at least a figure, just on the edge in front. Let's look, said Williams. Well, it, it's true the light is rather cleverly given. Where's your figure? Oh, yes, just the head in the very front of the picture. And indeed there was, hardly more than a black blot on the extreme edge of the engraving. The head of a man or woman, a good deal muffled up, the back turned to the spectator, and looking towards the house. Williams had not noticed it before. Still, he said, though it's a cleverer thing than I thought, I can't spend two guineas of museum money on a picture of a place I don't know. Professor Binks had his work to do, and soon went, and very nearly up to hall time, Williams was engaged in a vain attempt to identify the subject of his picture. If the vowel before the ng had only been left, it would have been easy enough he thought. But as it is, the name may be anything from Guestingly to Langley, and there are many more names ending like this than I thought, and this rotten book has no index of terminations. Hall in Mr. Williams's college was at seven. It need not be dwelt upon, the less so as he met their colleagues who had been playing golf during the afternoon, and words with which we have no concern were freely banded across the table, merely golfing words, I would hasten to explain. I suppose an hour or more to have been spent in what is called common room, after dinner. Later in the evening, some few retired to Williams's rooms, and I have little doubt that whist was played and tobacco smoked. During a lull in these operations, Williams picked up the mezzotint from the table without looking at it and handed it to a person mildly interested in art, telling him where it had come from, and the other particulars which we already know. The gentleman took it carelessly, looked at it, then said, in a tone of some interest, "'It's really a very good piece of work, Williams. It has quite a feeling of the Romantic period. The light is admirably managed, it seems to me.' and the figure, though it's rather too grotesque, is somehow very impressive. "'Yes, isn't it?' said Williams, who was just then busy giving whisky and soda to others of the company, and was unable to come across the room to look at the view again. It was, by this time, rather late in the evening, and the visitors were on the move. After they went, Williams was obliged to write a letter or two, and clear up some odd bits of work. At last, some time past midnight, he was disposed to turn in, and he put out his lamp after lighting his bedroom candle. The picture lay face upwards on the table where the last man who looked at it had put it, and it caught his eye as he turned the lamp down. What he saw made him very nearly drop the candle on the floor, and he declares now, if he had been left in the dark at that moment, he would have had a fit 
but as that did not happen, he was able to put down the light on the table and take a good look at the picture. It was indubitably, rankly impossible, no doubt, but absolutely certain. In the middle of the lawn, in front of the unknown house, there was a figure where no figure had been at five o'clock that afternoon. It was crawling on all fours towards the house, and it was muffled in a strange black garment with a white cross on the back. I do not know what is the ideal course to pursue in a situation of this kind. I can only tell you what Mr. Williams did. He took the picture by one corner and carried it across the passage to a second set of rooms which he possessed. There he locked it up in a drawer, sported the doors of both rooms, and retired to bed. But first he wrote out and signed an account of the extraordinary change which the picture had undergone since it had come into his possession. Sleep visited him rather late, but it was consoling to reflect that the behaviour of the picture did not depend upon his own unsupported testimony. Evidently the man who had looked at it the night before had seen something of the same kind as he had otherwise he might have been tempted to think that something gravely wrong was happening, either to his eyes or his mind. This possibility being fortunately precluded, two matters awaited him on the morrow. He must take stock of the picture very carefully, and call in a witness for the purpose, and he must make a determined effort to ascertain what house it was that was represented. He would therefore ask his neighbour Nisbet to breakfast with him, and he would subsequently spend the morning over the gazetteer. Nisbet was disengaged, and arrived about nine-twenty. His host was not quite dressed, I am sorry to say, even at this late hour. During breakfast nothing was said about the mezzotint by Williams, save that he had a picture on which he wished for Nisbet's opinion. But those who are familiar with university life, can picture for themselves the wide and delightful range of subjects over which the conversation of two fellows of Canterbury College is likely to extend during a Sunday morning breakfast. Hardly a topic was left unchallenged from golf to lawn tennis. Yet I am bound to say that Williams was rather distraught, for his interest, naturally centred in that very strange picture, which was now reposing face downwards in the drawer in the room opposite. The morning pipe was at last lighted, and the moment had arrived for which he looked. With very considerable, almost tremulous excitement, he ran across, unlocked the drawer, and extracting the picture still face downwards, ran back and put it into Nisbet's hands. Now, he said, Nisbet, I want you to tell me exactly what you see in that picture. Describe it, if you don't mind, rather minutely. I'll tell you why afterwards. Well, said Nisbet, I have here a view of a country house, English, I presume, by moonlight. Moonlight? You're sure of that? Certainly. The moon appears to be on the wane, if you wish for details, and there are clouds in the sky. All right. Go on. I'll swear added Williams in an aside. There was no moon when I saw it first. Well, there's not much more to be said, Nisbet continued. The house has one, two, three rows of windows, five in each row except at the bottom where there's a porch instead of the middle one, and, uh, but what about figures? said Williams with marked interest. There aren't any, said Nisbet. But what, no figure on the grass in front? Not a thing. You'll swear to that? Certainly I will. But there's just one other thing. What? Why, one of the windows on the ground floor, left of the door, is open. Is it really so? My goodness! He must have got in, said Williams with great excitement, and he hurried to the back of the sofa on which Nisbet was sitting, and catching the picture from him, verified the matter for himself. It was quite true there was no figure. 
and there was the open window. Williams, after a moment of speechless surprise, went to the writing-table and scribbled for a short time. Then he brought two papers to Nisbet, and asked him first to sign one, it was his own description of the picture, which you have just heard, and then to read the other, which was William's statement written the night before. "'What can it all mean?' said Nisbet. "'Exactly,' said Williams. "'Well, one thing I must do, or three things now I think of it, I must find out from Garwood,' this was his last night's visitor, "'what he saw. "'And then I must get the thing photographed before it goes further. "'And then I must find out what the place is.' "'I can do the photographing myself,' said Nisbet, "'and I will. "'But, you know, it looks very much as if we were assisting "'at the working out of a tragedy somewhere. "'The question is, has it happened already, "'or is it going to come off? "'You must find out what the place is. "'Yes,' he said, looking at the picture again, "'I expect you're right. "'He has got in. "'And if I don't mistake, there'll be the devil to pay.' in one of the rooms upstairs. "'I'll tell you what,' said Williams. "'I'll take the picture across to Old Green.' This was the senior fellow of the college, who had been bursar for many years. "'It's quite likely he'll know it. We have property in Essex and Sussex, and he must have been over the two counties a lot in his time.' "'Quite likely he will,' said Nisbet. "'But just let me take my photograph first. "'But look here. I rather think Green isn't up today. He wasn't in hall last night, and I think I heard him say he was going down for the Sunday. That's true, too, said Williams. I know he's gone to Brighton. Well, if you'll photograph it now, I'll go across to Garwood and get his statement. And you keep an eye on it while I'm gone. I'm beginning to think two guineas is not a very exorbitant price for it now. In a short time he had returned, and brought Mr. Garwood with him. Garwood's statement was to the effect that the figure, when he had seen it, was clear of the edge of the picture, but had not got far across the lawn. He remembered a white mark on the back of its drapery, but could not have been sure it was a cross. A document to this effect was then drawn up and signed, and Nisbet proceeded to photograph the picture. "'Now what do you want to do?' he said. "'Are you going to sit and watch it all day?' "'Well, no, I think not,' said Williams. "'I rather imagine we're meant to see the whole thing. "'You see, between the time I saw it last night and this morning, "'there was time for lots of things to happen, "'but the creature only got into the house. "'It could easily have got through its business in the time "'and gone to its own place again, "'but the fact of the window being open, I think, "'must mean that it's in there now. "'So I feel quite easy about leaving it. And besides, I have a kind of idea that it wouldn't change much, if at all, in the daytime. We might go out for a walk this afternoon, and come in to tea, or whenever it gets dark. I shall leave it out on the table here, and sport the door. My skip can get in, but no one else. The three agreed that this would be a good plan, and further, that if they spent the afternoon together they would be less likely to talk about the business to other people, for any rumour of such a transaction as was going on would bring the whole of the phasmatological society about their ears. We may give them a respite until five o'clock. At or near that hour the three were entering Williams's staircase. They were at first slightly annoyed to see that the door of his rooms was unsported. But in a moment it was remembered that on Sunday the skips came for orders an hour or so earlier than on weekdays. However, a surprise was awaiting them. The first thing they saw was the picture leaning up against a pile of books on the table, as it had been left. And the next thing was Williams's skip, seated on a chair opposite, gazing at it, with undisguised horror. How was this? Mr. Filcher, the name is not my own invention, was a servant of considerable standing, and set the standards of etiquette to all his own college, and to several neighbouring ones. 
and nothing could be more alien to his practice than to be found sitting on his master's chair, or appearing to take any particular notice of his master's furniture or pictures. Indeed, he seemed to feel this himself. He started violently when the three men were in the room, and got up with a marked effort. Then he said, "'I ask your pardon, sir, for taking such a freedom as to sit down.' "'Not at all, Robert,' interposed Mr. Williams. "'I was meaning to ask you some time what you thought of that picture.' "'Well, sir, of course I don't set up my opinion against yours, "'but it ain't the picture I should hang where my little girl could see it, sir.' "'Wouldn't you, Robert? Why not?' "'No, sir. Why, the poor child, I recollect once she sees a door Bible with pictures, "'not half what that is, and we had to set up with her three or four nights afterwards, "'if you'll believe me. And if she was to catch a sight of this skellington here, "'or whatever it is, carrying off the poor baby,' She would be in a taking. You know how it is with children, how nervous they get with a little thing and all. But what I should say, it don't seem a right picture to be laying about, sir, not where anyone that's liable to be startled could come on it. Should you be wanting anything this evening, sir? Thank you, sir. With these words, the excellent man went to continue the round of his masters, and you may be sure the gentleman whom he left lost no time in gathering round the engraving. There was the house, as before, under the waning moon and the drifting clouds. The window that had been open was shut, and the figure was once more on the lawn, but not, this time, crawling cautiously on hands and knees. Now it was erect, and stepping swiftly with long strides towards the front of the picture, the moon was behind it, and the black drapery hung down over its face, so that only hints of that could be seen, and what was visible made the spectators profoundly thankful that they could see no more than a white, dome-like forehead and a few straggling hairs. The head was bent down, and the arms were tightly clasped over an object which could be dimly seen and identified as a child, whether dead or living it was not possible to say the legs of the appearance alone could be plainly discerned, and they were horribly thin. From five to seven the three companions sat and watched the picture by turns, but it never changed. They agreed at last that it would be safe to leave it, and that they would return after hall and await further developments. When they assembled again, at the earliest possible moment, the engraving was there, but the figure was gone, and the house was quiet under the moonbeams. There was nothing for it but to spend the evening over gazetteers and guide-books. Williams was the lucky one at last, and perhaps he deserved it. At 11.30 p.m. he read from Murray's Guide to Essex the following lines. Sixteen and one half miles, Anningley. The church has been an interesting building of Norman date, but was extensively classicized in the last century. It contains the tomb of the family of Francis, whose mansion Anningley Hall, a solid Queen Anne house, stands immediately beyond the churchyard in a park of about eighty acres. The family is now extinct the last heir having disappeared mysteriously in infancy in the year 1802. The father, Mr. Arthur Francis, was locally known as a talented amateur engraver in mezzotint. After his son's disappearance, he lived in complete retirement at the hall, and was found dead in his studio on the third anniversary of the disaster, having just completed an engraving of the house, impressions of which are of considerable rarity. This looked like business, and indeed Mr. Green on his return at once identified the house as Anningley Hall. "'Is there any kind of explanation of the figure, Green?' was the question which Williams naturally asked. "'I don't know, I'm sure, Williams. What used to be said in the place when I first knew it, which was before I came up here, was just this. Old Francis was always very much down on these poaching fellows, 
and whenever he got a chance he used to get a man whom he suspected of it turned off the estate, and by degrees he got rid of them all but one. Squires could do a lot of things then that they daren't think of now. Well, this man that was left was what you find pretty often in that country. The last remains of a very old family. I believe they were lords of the manor at one time. I recollect just the same thing in my own parish. What, like the man in Tess of the D'Urbervilles? Williams put in. Yes, I dare say. It's not a book I could ever read myself, but this fellow could show a row of tombs in the church there that belonged to his ancestors, and all that went to sour him a bit. But uh, Francis, they said, could never get at him. He always kept just on the right side of the law. Until one night the keepers found him at it in a wood right at the end of the estate. I could show you the place now. It marches with some land that used to belong to an uncle of mine. And you can imagine there was a row. And this man Gordy, that was the name, to be sure, Gordy. I thought I should get it. Gordy. He was unlucky enough, poor chap, to shoot a keeper. Well, that was what Francis wanted. And grand juries, you know what they would have been then. And poor Gordy was strung up in double-quick time. And I've been shown the place he was buried in on the north side of the church. You know the way in that part of the world. Anyone that's been hanged or made away with themselves, they bury them that side. And the idea was that some friend of Gordy's, not a relation, because he had none, poor devil, he was the last of his line, kind of spes ultima gentis, must have planned to get hold of Francis's boy and put an end to his line too. I don't know. It's rather an out-of-the-way thing for an Essex poacher to think of. But, uh, you know, I should say now it looks more as if old Gordy had managed the job himself. Ugh, I hate to think of it. Have some whisky, Williams. The facts were communicated by Williams to Deniston, and by him to a mixed company of which I was one, and the Sadducean professor of Ophiology another. I am sorry to say that the latter, when asked what he thought of it, only remarked, Oh, those Bridgeford people will say anything, a sentiment which met with the reception it deserved. I have only to add that the picture is now in the Ashleyan Museum, that it has been treated with a view to discovering whether sympathetic ink has been used in it, but without effect, that Mr. Britnell knew nothing of it, save that he was sure it was uncommon, and that, though carefully watched, it has never be known to change again. End of the Mezzo Tint From Ghost Stories of an Antiquary By M. R. James This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. Recorded by Peter Yearsley. Ghost Stories of an Antiquary by M. R. James. The Ash Tree. Everyone who has travelled over eastern England knows the smaller country houses with which it is studied the rather dank little buildings, usually in the Italian style, surrounded with parks of some eighty to a hundred acres. For me, they have always had a very strong attraction, with the grey paling of split oak, the noble trees, the meres with their reed beds, and the line of distant woods. Then I like the pillared portico, perhaps stuck on to a red brick Queen Anne house, which has been faced with stucco to bring it into line with the Grecian taste of the end of the eighteenth century. The hall inside, going up to the roof, which hall ought always to be provided with a gallery and a small organ. I like the library, too, where you may find anything from a Psalter of the thirteenth century to a Shakespeare quarto. I like the pictures, of course, and, perhaps most of all, I like fancying what life in such a house was, 
when it was first built, and in the piping times of landlord's prosperity, and not least now, when, if money is not so plentiful, taste is more varied, and life quite as interesting. I wish to have one of these houses, and enough money to keep it together, and entertain my friends in it modestly. But this is a digression. I have to tell you of a curious series of events which happened in such a house as I have tried to describe. It is Castringham Hall, in Suffolk. I think a good deal has been done to the building since the period of my story, but the essential features I have sketched are still there. Italian portico, square block of white house, older inside than out, park with fringe of woods, and mere. The one feature that marked out the house from a score of others is gone. As you looked at it from the park, you saw on the right a great old ash tree, growing within half a dozen yards of the wall, and almost or quite touching the building with its branches. I suppose it had stood there ever since Castringham ceased to be a fortified place and since the moat was filled in and the Elizabethan dwelling-house built. At any rate, it had well nigh attained its full dimensions in the year 1690. In that year, the district in which the hall is situated was the scene of a number of witch trials. It will be long, I think, before we arrive at a just estimate of the amount of solid reason, if there was any, which lay at the root of the universal fear of witches in old times. Whether the persons accused of this offence really did imagine that they were possessed of unusual power of any kind, or whether they had the will at least, if not the power, of doing mischief to their neighbours, or whether all the confessions, of which there are so many, were extorted by the cruelty of the witch-finders, these are questions which are not, I fancy, yet solved, and the present narrative gives me pause. I cannot altogether sweep it away as mere invention. The reader must judge for himself. Castringham contributed a victim to the auto da fe. Mrs. Mothersole was her name, and she differed from the ordinary run of village witches only in being rather better off and in a more influential position. Efforts were made to save her by several reputable farmers of the parish. They did their best to testify to her character, and showed considerable anxiety as to the verdict of the jury. But what seems to have been fatal to the woman was the evidence of the then proprietor of Castringham Hall, Sir Matthew Fell. He deposed to having watched her on three different occasions from his window at the full of the moon, gathering sprigs from the ash-tree near my house. She had climbed into the branches, clad only in her shift, and was cutting off small twigs with a peculiarly curved knife, and as she did so she seemed to be talking to herself. On each occasion Sir Matthew had done his best to capture the woman, but she had always taken alarm at some accidental noise he had made and all he could see when he got down to the garden was a hare running across the path in the direction of the village. On the third night he had been at pains to follow at his best speed, and had gone straight to Mrs. Mothersole's house, but he had had to wait a quarter of an hour battering at her door, and then she had come out very cross, and apparently very sleepy, as if just out of bed, and he had no good explanation to offer of his visit. Mainly on this evidence, though there was much more of a less striking and unusual kind from other parishioners, Mrs. Mothersole was found guilty and condemned to die. She was hanged a week after the trial, with five or six more unhappy creatures at Bury St. Edmunds. Sir Matthew Fell, then deputy sheriff, was present at the execution. It was a damp, drizzly March morning when the cart made its way up the rough grass hill outside Northgate, where the gallows stood. The other victims were apathetic or broken down with misery, 
but Mrs. Mothersoul was, as in life, so in death, of a very different temper. Her poisonous rage, as a reporter of the time put it, did so work upon the bystanders, yea, even upon the hangman, that it was constantly affirmed of all that saw her that she presented the living aspect of a mad devil, yet she offered no resistance to the officers of the law. Only she looked upon those that laid hands upon her with so direful and venomous an aspect that, as one of them afterwards assured me, the mere thought of it preyed inwardly upon his mind for six months after. However, all that she is reported to have said were the seemingly meaningless words, There will be guests at the hall, which she repeated more than once in an undertone. Sir Matthew Fell was not unimpressed by the bearing of the woman. He had some talk upon the matter with the vicar of his parish, with whom he travelled home after the assize business was over. His evidence at the trial had not been very willingly given. He was not specially infected with the witch-finding mania, but he declared, then and afterwards, that he could not give any other account of the matter than that he had given and that he could not possibly have been mistaken as to what he saw. The whole transaction had been repugnant to him, for he was a man who liked to be on pleasant terms with those about him, but he saw a duty to be done in this business, and he had done it. That seems to have been the gist of his sentiments, and the vicar applauded it, as any reasonable man must have done. A few weeks after, when the moon of May was at the full, vicar and squire met again in the park, and walked to the hall together. Lady Fell was with her mother, who was dangerously ill, and Sir Matthew was alone at home. So the vicar, Mr. Crome, was easily persuaded to take a late supper at the hall. Sir Matthew was not very good company this evening. The talk ran chiefly on family and parish matters and, as luck would have it, Sir Matthew made a memorandum in writing of certain wishes or intentions of his regarding his estates, which afterwards proved exceedingly useful. When Mr. Crome thought of starting for home, about half-past nine o'clock, Sir Matthew and he took a preliminary turn on the gravelled walk at the back of the house. The only incident that struck Mr. Crome was this. They were in sight of the ash-tree which I described as growing near the windows of the building, when Sir Matthew stopped and said, "'What is that that runs up and down the stem of the ash? It is never a squirrel. They will all be in their nests by now.' The vicar looked and saw the moving creature, but he could make nothing of its colour in the moonlight. The sharp outline, however, seen for an instant, was imprinted on his brain, and he could have sworn, he said, though it sounded foolish, that squirrel or not, it had more than four legs. Still not much was to be made of the momentary vision, and the two men parted. They may have met since then, but it was not for a score of years. Next day Sir Matthew Fell was not downstairs at six in the morning, as was his custom, nor at seven, nor yet at eight. Hereupon the servants went and knocked at his chamber door. I need not prolong the description of their anxious listenings and renewed batterings on the panels. The door was opened at last from the outside, and they found their master dead and black. So much you have guessed. That there were any marks of violence did not at the moment appear, but the window was open. One of the men went to fetch the parson and then by his directions rode on to give notice to the coroner. Mr. Crome himself went as quick as he might to the hall, and was shown to the room where the dead man lay. He has left some notes among his papers, which show how genuine a respect and sorrow was felt for Sir Matthew. And there is also this passage, which I transcribe for the sake of the light it throws upon the course of events, and also upon the common beliefs of the time. There was not any the least trace of an entrance having been forced to the chamber. But the casement stood open, as my poor friend would always have it in this season. He had his evening drink of small ale in a silver vessel of about a pint measure, 
and to-night had not drunk it out. This drink was examined by the physician from Berry, a Mr. Hodgkins, who could not, however, as he afterwards declared upon his oath, before the coroner's quest, discover that any matter of a venomous kind was present in it. For, as was natural, in the great swelling and blackness of the corpse, there was talk made among the neighbours of poison. The body was very much disordered as it lay in the bed, being twisted after so extreme a sort, as gave too probable conjecture that my worthy friend and patron had expired in great pain and agony. And what is as yet unexplained, and to myself the argument of some horrible and artful design in the perpetrators of this barbarous murder, was this, that the women which were entrusted with the laying out of the corpse and washing it, being both sad persons and very well respected in their mournful profession, came to me in a great pain and distress, both of mind and body, saying, what was indeed confirmed upon the first view, that they had no sooner touched the breast of the corpse with their naked hands, than they were sensible of a more than ordinary violent smart and aching in their palms, which with their whole forearms in no long time swelled so immoderately, the pain still continuing, that, as afterwards proved, during many weeks they were forced to lay by the exercise of their calling, and yet no mark seen on the skin. Upon hearing this I sent for the physician, who was still in the house, and we made as careful a proof as we were able, by the help of a small magnifying lens of crystal, of the condition of the skin in this part of the body, but could not detect, with the instrument we had, any matter of importance, beyond a couple of small punctures or pricks, which we then concluded were the spots by which the poison might be introduced, remembering that uh, ring of Pope Borgia, with other known specimens of the horrible art of the Italian poisoners of the last age. So much is to be said of the symptoms seen on the corpse. As to what I am to add, it is merely my own experiment, and to be left to posterity to judge whether there be anything of value therein. There was, on the table by the bedside, a Bible of the small size, in which my friend, punctual as in the matters of less moment, so in this more weighty one, used nightly, and upon his first rising, to read a set portion, and I, taking it up, not without a tear duly paid to him which from the study of this poorer adumbration was now passed to the contemplation of its great original, it came into my thoughts, as at such moments of helplessness we are prone to catch at any the least glimmer that makes promise of light, to make trial of that old, and by many accounted superstitious, practice of drawing the sorties, of which a principal instance, in the case of his late sacred majesty, the blessed martyr King Charles, and my lord Falkland, was now much talked of. I must needs admit that by my trial not much assistance was afforded me. Yet, as the cause and origin of these dreadful events may hereafter be searched out, I set down the results. In the case it may be found that they pointed the true quarter of the mischief to a quicker intelligence than my own. I made, then, three trials, opening the book and placing my finger upon certain words, which gave in the first these words, from Luke 13, verse 7, cut it down, in the second, Isaiah 13, verse 20, it shall never be inhabited. And upon the third experiment, Job 39, verse 30, her young ones also suck up blood. This is all that need be quoted from Mr. Crome's papers. Sir Matthew Fell was duly coffined and laid into the earth, and his funeral sermon, preached by Mr. Crome on the following Sunday, has been printed under the title of The Unsearchable Way, or England's danger and the malicious dealings of Antichrist. It being the vicar's view, as well as that most commonly held in the neighbourhood, that the squire was a victim of a recrudescence of the popish plot. His son, Sir Matthew the Second, succeeded to the title and estates, and so ends the first act 
of the Castringham tragedy. It is to be mentioned, though the fact is not surprising, that the new baronet did not occupy the room in which his father had died, nor indeed was it slept in by any one but an occasional visitor during the whole of his occupation. He died in 1735, and I do not find that anything particular marked his reign, save a curiously constant mortality among his cattle and livestock in general, which showed a tendency to increase slightly as time went on. Those who are interested in the details will find a statistical account in a letter to the Gentleman's Magazine of 1772, which draws the facts from the baronet's own papers. He put an end to it at last by a very simple expedient, that of shutting up all his beasts in sheds at night, and keeping no sheep in his park. For he had noticed that nothing was ever attacked that spent the night indoors. After that the disorder confined itself to wild birds and beasts of chase, but as we have no good account of the symptoms, and as all night watching was quite unproductive of any clue, I do not dwell on what the Suffolk farmers called the Castringham sickness. The second Sir Matthew died in 1735, as I said, and was duly succeeded by his son, Sir Richard. It was in his time that the great family pew was built out on the north side of the parish church. So large were the squire's ideas that several of the graves on that unhallowed side of the building had to be disturbed to satisfy his requirements. Among them was that of Mrs. Mothersoul, the position of which was accurately known, thanks to a note on a plan of the church and yard, both made by Mr. Crome. A certain amount of interest was excited in the village when it was known that the famous witch, who was still remembered by a few, was to be exhumed, and the feeling of surprise and, indeed, disquiet, was very strong when it was found that though her coffin was fairly sound and unbroken, there was no trace whatever inside it of body, bones, or dust. Indeed, it is a curious phenomenon, for at the time of her burying no such things were dreamt of as resurrection men, and it is difficult to conceive any rational motive for stealing a body otherwise than for the uses of the dissecting room. The incident revived for a time all the stories of witch trials and of the exploits of the witches, dormant for forty years, and Sir Richard's orders that the coffin should be burnt were thought by a good many to be rather foolhardy, though they were duly carried out. Sir Richard was a pestilent innovator, it is certain. Before his time the hall had been a fine block of the mellowest red brick, but Sir Richard had travelled in Italy and became infected with the Italian taste, and having more money than his predecessors, he determined to leave an Italian palace where he had found an English house. So stucco and ashlar masked the brick. Some indifferent Roman marbles were planted about in the entrance hall and gardens. A reproduction of the Sibyl's temple at Tivoli was erected on the opposite bank of the mere, and Castringham took on an entirely new and, I must say, a less engaging aspect. But it was much admired, and served as a model to a good many of the neighbouring gentry in after years. One morning, it was in 1754, Sir Richard woke after a night of discomfort. It had been windy, and his chimney had smoked persistently, and yet it was so cold that he must keep up a fire. Also, something had so rattled about the window that no man could get a moment's peace. Further, there was the prospect of several guests of position arriving in the course of the day, who would expect sport of some kind, and the inroads of the distemper, which continued among his game, had been lately so serious that he was afraid for his reputation as a game preserver. But what really touched him most nearly was the other matter of his sleepless night. He could certainly not sleep in that room again. That was the chief subject of his meditations at breakfast, and after it he began a systematic examination of the rooms to see which would suit his notions best. 
It was long before he found one. This had a window with an eastern aspect, and that with a northern. This door the servants would always be passing, and he did not like the bedstead in that. No, he must have a room with a western lookout, so that the sun could not wake him early, and it must be out of the way of the business of the house. The housekeeper was at the end of her resources. "'Well, Sir Richard,' she said, "'you know that there is but the one room like that in the house.' "'Which may that be?' said Sir Richard. "'And that is Sir Matthew's, the west chamber.' "'Well, put me in there, for there I'll lie to-night,' said her master. "'Which way is it? Here, to be sure.' And he hurried off. "'Oh, Sir Richard, but no one has slept there these forty years. The air has hardly been changed since Sir Matthew died there.' Thus she spoke, and rustled after him. "'Come, open the door, Mrs. Chirruck. I'll see the chamber at least.' So it was opened. And, indeed, the smell was very close and earthy. Sir Richard crossed to the window, and impatiently, as was his wont, threw the shutters back and flung open the casement, for this end of the house was one which the alterations had barely touched, grown up as it was with the great ash-tree, and being otherwise concealed from view. Air it, Mrs. Chiddock, all to-day, and move my bed-furniture in, in the afternoon. Put the Bishop of Kilmore in my old room. Pray, Sir Richard, said a new voice, breaking in on this speech, might I have the favour of a moment's interview? Sir Richard turned round, and saw a man in black in the doorway, who bowed. "'I must ask your indulgence for this intrusion, Sir Richard. You will perhaps hardly remember me. My name is William Crone, and my grandfather was vicar in your grandfather's time.' "'Well, sir,' said Sir Richard, "'the name of Crome is always a passport to Castringham. I am glad to renew a friendship of two generations standing. In what can I serve you?' for your hour of calling, and, if I do not mistake you, your bearing, shows you to be in some haste. That is no more than the truth, sir. I am riding from Norwich to Bury St. Edmunds, with what haste I can make, and I have called in on my way to leave you with some papers, which we have but just come upon in looking over what my grandfather left at his death. It is thought you may find some matters of family interest in them. You are mighty obliging, Mr. Crome, and if you will be so good as to follow me to the parlour, and drink a glass of wine, we will take a first look at these papers together. And you, Mrs. Chidder, as I said, be about airing this chamber. Yes, it is here my grandfather died. Yes, the tree perhaps does make the place a little dampish. No, I do not wish to listen to any more. Make no difficulties, I beg. You have your orders. Go. Will you follow me, sir? They went to the study. The packet which young Mr. Crome had brought he was then just become a fellow of Clare Hall in Cambridge, I may say, and subsequently brought out a respectable edition of Polyenus. Contained, among other things, the notes which the old vicar had made upon the occasion of Sir Matthew Fell's death. And for the first time, and for the first time, Sir Richard was confronted with the enigmatical Sortes Biblici, which you have heard. They amused him a good deal. Well, he said, my grandfather's Bible gave one prudent piece of advice. Cut it down. If that stands for the ash-tree, he may rest assured I shall not neglect it. Such a nest of catars and agues was never seen. The parlour contained the family books, which, pending the arrival of a collection which Sir Richard had made in Italy, and the building of a proper room to receive them, were not many in number. Sir Richard looked up from the paper to the bookcase. "'I wonder,' says he, whether the old prophet is there yet. I fancy I see him. Crossing the room, he took out a dumpy Bible, which, sure enough, bore on the fly-leaf the inscription, To Matthew Fell, from his loving godmother, Anne Aldous, 2nd of September, 1659. It would be no bad plan to test him again, Mr. Crome. I will wager we get a couple of names in the chronicles. Oh. What have we here? Thou shalt seek me in the morning, and I shall not be. Well, well, your grandfather would have made a fine omen of that, eh? No more profits for me, they're all in a tale. And now, Mr. Crome, I'm infinitely obliged to you for your packet. You will, I fear, be impatient to get on. Pray allow me another glass. So, with offers of hospitality, which were genuinely meant, 
for Sir Richard thought well of the young man's address and manner, they parted. In the afternoon came the guests, the Bishop of Kilmore, Lady Mary Hervey, Sir William Kentfield, etc. Dinner at five, wine, cards, supper, and dispersal to bed. Next morning Sir Richard is disinclined to take his gun with the rest. He talks with the Bishop of Kilmore. This prelate, unlike a good many of the Irish bishops of his day, had visited his see, and indeed resided there for some considerable time. This morning, as the two were walking along the terrace, and talking over the alterations and improvements in the house, the bishop said, pointing to the window of the west room, "'You could never get one of my Irish flock to occupy that room, Sir Richard.' "'Why is that, my lord? It is in fact my own.' Well, our Irish peasantry will always have it that it brings the worst of luck to sleep near an ash tree, and you have a fine growth of ash not two yards from your chamber window. Perhaps, the bishop went on with a smile, it has given you a touch of its quality already, for you do not seem, if I may say it, so much the fresher for your night's rest as your friends would like to see you. That, or something else, it is true, cost me my sleep from twelve to four, my lord. But the tree is to come down to-morrow, so I shall not hear much more from it. I applaud your determination. It can hardly be wholesome to have the air you breathe strained, as it were, through all that leafage. Your lordship is right there, I think. But I had not my window open last night. It was rather the noise that went on, no doubt from the twigs sweeping the glass, that kept me open-eyed. I think that can hardly be, Sir Richard. Here, you can see it from this point. None of these nearest branches, even, can touch your casement unless there were a gale, and there was none of that last night. They missed the panes by a foot. No, sir, true. What then will it be, I wonder, that scratched and rustled so? I had covered the dust on my sill with lines and marks. At last they agreed that the rats must have come up through the ivy. That was the bishop's idea, and Sir Richard jumped at it. So the day passed quietly and night came, and the party dispersed to their rooms, and wished Sir Richard a better night. And now we are in his bedroom, with the light out, and the squire in bed. The room is over the kitchen, and the night outside still and warm, so the window stands open. There is very little light about the bedstead, but there is a strange movement there, it seems as if Sir Richard were moving his head rapidly to and fro, with only the slightest possible sound. And now you would guess, so deceptive is the half-darkness, that he had several heads, round and brownish, which move back and forward, even as low as his chest. It is a horrible illusion. Is it nothing more? There, something drops off the bed with a soft plump like a kitten and is out of the window in a flash. Another. Four. And after that there is quiet again. Thou shalt seek me in the morning, and I shall not be. As with Sir Matthew, so with Sir Richard, dead and black in his bed. A pale and silent party of guests and servants gathered under the window when the news was known. Italian poisoners, popish emissaries, infected air, all these and more guesses were hazarded, and the Bishop of Kilmore looked at the tree, in the fork of whose lower boughs a white tomcat was crouching, looking down the hollow which years had gnawed in the trunk. It was watching something inside the tree with great interest. Suddenly it got up and craned over the hole, then a bit of the edge on which it stood gave way, and it went slithering in. Everyone looked up at the noise of the fall. It is known to most of us that a cat can cry, but few of us have heard, I hope, such a yell as came out of the trunk of the great ash. Two or three screams there were, the witnesses are not sure which, and then a slight and muffled noise of some commotion or struggling was all that came. But Lady Mary Hervey fainted outright, and the housekeeper stopped her ears, and fled till she fell on the terrace. The Bishop of Kilmore and Sir William Kentfield stayed, 
yet even they were daunted, though it was only at the cry of a cat, and Sir William swallowed once or twice before he could say, "'There is something more than we know of in that tree, my lord. I am for an instant search,' and this was agreed upon. A ladder was brought, and one of the gardeners went up, and, looking down the hollow, could detect nothing but a few dim indications of something moving. They got a lantern, and let it down by rope. "'We must get at the bottom of this. My life upon it, my lord, that the secret of these terrible deaths is there.' Up went the gardener again with the lantern, and let it down the hole cautiously. They saw the yellow light upon his face as he bent over, and saw his face struck with an incredulous terror and loathing, before he cried out in a dreadful voice and fell back from the ladder, where, happily, he was caught by two of the men, letting the lantern fall inside the tree. He was in a dead faint, and it was some time before any word could be got from him. By then they had something else to look at. The lantern must have broken at the bottom, and the light in it caught upon dry leaves and rubbish that lay there, for in a few minutes a dense smoke began to come up, and then flame, and, to be short, the tree was in a blaze. The bystanders made a ring at some yard's distance, and Sir William and the bishop sent men to get what weapons and tools they could, for clearly whatever might be using the tree as its lair would be forced out by the fire. So it was. First, at the fork, they saw a round body covered with fire, the size of a man's head, appear very suddenly, then seem to collapse and fall back. This five or six times, then a similar ball leapt into the air and fell on the grass, where after a moment it lay still. The bishop went as near as he dared to it, and saw what but the remains of an enormous spider, venous and seared. And as the fire burned lower down, more terrible bodies like this began to break out from the trunk, and it was seen that these were covered with greyish hair. All that day the ash burned, and until it fell to pieces the men stood about it, and from time to time killed the brutes as they darted out. At last there was a long interval when none appeared, and they cautiously closed in and examined the roots of the tree. They found said the Bishop of Kilmore, below it, a rounded hollow place in the earth, wherein were two or three bodies of these creatures that had plainly been smothered by the smoke, and, what is to me more curious, at the side of this den, against the wall, was crouching the anatomy or skeleton of a human being, with the skin dried upon the bones, having some remains of black hair, which was pronounced by those that examined it to be undoubtedly the body of a woman, and clearly dead for a period of fifty years. The End of the Ash Tree From Ghost Stories of an Antiquary by M. R. James This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. Recorded by Peter Yearsley. Ghost Stories of an Antiquary by M. R. James. Number 13. Among the towns of Jutland, Viborg justly holds a high place. It is the seat of a bishopric. It has a handsome but almost entirely new cathedral, a charming garden, a lake of great beauty, and many storks. Near it is Hal, accounted one of the prettiest things in Denmark, and hard by is Finderhub, where Mersk Stieg murdered King Erkliping on St. Cecilia's Day in the year 1286, fifty-six blows of square-headed iron maces were traced on Erk's skull, 
when his tomb was opened in the seventeenth century. But I'm not writing a guidebook. There are good hotels in Vibor. Priceless and the Phoenix are all that can be desired. But my cousin, whose experiences I have to tell you now, went to the Golden Lion the first time that he visited Viborg. He has not been there since, and the following pages will perhaps explain the reason of his abstention. The Golden Lion is one of the very few houses in the town that were not destroyed in the Great Fire of 1726, which practically demolished the cathedral, the Sortenkirche, the Raus, and so much else that was old and interesting. It is a great red brick house, that is, the front of it is of brick, with corby steps on the gables and a text over the door, but the courtyard into which the omnibus drives is of black and white wood and plaster. The sun was declining in the heavens when my cousin walked up to the door, and the light smote full upon the imposing façade of the house. He was delighted with the old-fashioned aspect of the place, and promised himself a thoroughly satisfactory and amusing stay in an inn so typical of old Jutland. It was not business in the ordinary sense of the word that had brought Mr. Anderson to Viborg. He was engaged upon some researches into the church history of Denmark, and it had come to his knowledge that in the Reichsakku of Viborg there were papers saved from the fire relating to the last days of Roman Catholicism in the country. He proposed, therefore, to spend a considerable time, perhaps as much as a fortnight or three weeks, in examining and copying these, and he hoped that the Golden Lion would be able to give him a room of sufficient size to serve alike as a bedroom and a study. His wishes were explained to the landlord, and after a certain amount of thought the latter suggested that perhaps it might be the best way for the gentleman to look at one or two of the larger rooms and pick one for himself. It seemed a good idea. The top floor was soon rejected, as entailing too much getting upstairs after the day's work. The second floor contained no room of exactly the dimensions required, but on the first floor there was a choice of two or three rooms, which would, so far as size went, suit admirably. The landlord was strongly in favour of number 17, but Mr. Anderson pointed out that its windows commanded only the blank wall of the next house, and that it would be very dark in the afternoon. Either number 12 or number 14 would be better, for both of them looked on the street, and the bright evening light and the pretty view would more than compensate him for the additional amount of noise. Eventually number 12 was selected. Like its neighbours, it had three windows, all on one side of the room. It was fairly high and unusually long. There was, of course, no fireplace, but the stove was handsome and rather old, a cast-iron erection, on the side of which was a representation of Abraham sacrificing Isaac, and the inscription, Ibo Moza Capita To O Tu, above. Nothing else in the room was remarkable. The only interesting picture was an old coloured print of the town, date about 1820. Supper time was approaching, but when Anderson, refreshed by the ordinary ablutions, descended the staircase, there was still a few minutes before the bell rang. He devoted them to examining the list of his fellow lodgers. As is usual in Denmark, their names were displayed on a large blackboard, divided into columns and lines, the numbers of the rooms being painted in at the beginning of each line. The list was not exciting. There was an advocate, or Saffure, a German, and some bagmen from Copenhagen. The one and only point which suggested any food for thought was the absence of any number thirteen from the tale of the rooms, and even this was a thing which Anderson had already noticed half a dozen times in his experience of Danish hotels. He could not help wondering whether the objection to that particular number, common as it is, was so widespread and so strong as to make it difficult to let a room so ticketed, and he resolved to ask the landlord if he and his colleagues in the profession had actually met with many clients who refused to be accommodated in the thirteenth room. He had nothing to tell me 
I am giving the story as I heard it from him, about what passed at supper, and the evening, which was spent in unpacking and arranging his clothes, books, and papers, was not more eventful. Towards eleven o'clock he resolved to go to bed, but with him, as with a good many other people nowadays, an almost necessary preliminary to bed, if he meant to sleep, was the reading of a few pages of print, and he now remembered that the particular book which he had been reading in the train, and which alone would satisfy him at that present moment, was in the pocket of his greatcoat, then hanging on a peg outside the dining-room. To run down and secure it was the work of a moment, and as the passages were by no means dark, it was not difficult for him to find his way back to his own door. So, at least, he thought. But when he arrived there, and turned the handle, the door entirely refused to open, and he caught the sound of a hasty movement towards it from within. He had tried the wrong door, of course. Was his own room to the right or to the left? He glanced at the number. It was thirteen. His room would be on the left, and so it was, and not before he had been in bed for some minutes, had read his wonted three or four pages of his book, blown out his light, and turned over to go to sleep, did it occur to him that, whereas on the blackboard of the hotel there had been no number thirteen, there was undoubtedly a room numbered thirteen in the hotel. He felt rather sorry he had not chosen it for his own. Perhaps he might have done the landlord a little service by occupying it, and given him the chance of saying that a well-born English gentleman had lived in it for three weeks and liked it very much but probably it was used as a servant's room, or something of the kind. After all, it was most likely not so large or so good a room as his own, and he looked drowsily about the room, which was fairly perceptible, in the half-light from the street-lamp. It was a curious effect, he thought. Rooms usually look larger in a dim light than a full one. But this seemed to have contracted in length, and grown proportionately higher. Oh, well. Sleep was more important than these vague ruminations, and to sleep he went. On the day after his arrival, Anderson attacked the Reissachu of Fibor. He was, as one might expect in Denmark, kindly received, and access to all that he wished to see was made as easy for him as possible. The documents laid before him were far more numerous and interesting than he had at all anticipated. Besides official papers, there was a large bundle of correspondence relating to Bishop Jorgen Freys, the last Roman Catholic who held the see, and in these there cropped up many amusing and what are called intimate details of private life and individual character. There was much talk of a house owned by the bishop, but not inhabited by him, in the town. Its tenant was apparently somewhat of a scandal, and a stumbling-block to the reforming party. He was a disgrace, they wrote, to the city. He practised secret and wicked arts, and had sold his soul to the enemy. It was of a piece with the gross corruption and superstition of the Babylonish church, that such a viper and blood-sucking Trollmund should be patronised and harboured by the bishop. The bishop met these reproaches boldly. He protested his own abhorrence of all such things as secret arts, and required his antagonists to bring the matter before the proper court, of course the spiritual court, and sift it to the bottom. No one could be more ready and willing than himself to condemn Mark Nicholas Franken if the evidence showed him to have been guilty of any of the crimes informally alleged against him. Anderson had not time to do more than glance at the next letter of the Protestant leader, Rasmus Nielsen, before the record office was closed for the day, but he gathered its general tenor, which was to the effect that Christian men were now no longer bound by the decisions of bishops of Rome, and that the bishop's court was not, and could not be, a fit or competent tribunal, so grave and weighty a cause. On leaving the office Mr. Anderson was accompanied by the old gentleman who presided over it, and as they walked 
the conversation very naturally turned to the papers of which I have just been speaking. Herr Scavenius, the archivist of Viborg, though very well informed as to the general run of the documents under his charge, was not a specialist in those of the Reformation period. He was much interested in what Anderson had to tell him about them. He looked forward with great pleasure, he said, to seeing the publication in which Mr. Anderson spoke of embodying their contents. This house of the Bishop Freys, he added, it is a great puzzle to me where it could have stood. I have studied carefully the topography of old Viborg, but it is most unlucky of the old terrier of the bishop's property which was made in 1560, and of which we have the greater part in the Arcue, just the piece which had the list of the town property is missing. Never mind, perhaps I shall some day succeed to find him. After taking some exercise, I forget exactly how or where, Anderson went back to the Golden Lion, his supper, his game of patience, and his bed. On the way to his room, it occurred to him that he had forgotten to talk to the landlord about the omission of number 13 from the hotel board, and also that he might as well make sure that number 13 did actually exist, before he made any reference to the matter. The decision was not difficult to arrive at. There was the door with its number, as plain as could be, and work of some kind was evidently going on inside it, for as he neared the door he could hear footsteps and voices, or a voice, within. During the few seconds in which he halted to make sure of the number, the footsteps ceased, seemingly very near the door, and he was a little startled at hearing a quick hissing breathing, as of a person in strong excitement. He went on to his own room, and again he was surprised to find how much smaller it seemed now than it had when he selected it. It was a slight disappointment, but only slight. If he found it really not large enough, he could very easily shift to another. In the meantime he wanted something, as far as I can remember it was a pocket handkerchief, out of his portmanteau, which had been placed by the porter on a very inadequate trestle or stool against the wall at the farthest end of the room from his bed. Here was a very curious thing. The portmanteau was not to be seen. It had been moved by officious servants. Doubtless the contents had been put in the wardrobe. No, none of them were there. This was vexatious. The idea of a theft he dismissed at once. Such things rarely happen in Denmark. But some piece of stupidity had certainly been performed which is not so uncommon, and the stew peer must be severely spoken to. Whatever it was that he wanted, it was not so necessary to his comfort that he could not wait until the morning for it, and he therefore settled not to ring the bell and disturb the servants. He went to the window, the right-hand window it was, and looked out on the quiet street. There was a tall building opposite, with large spaces of dead wall, no passers-by, a dark night, and very little to be seen of any kind. The light was behind him, and he could see his own shadow clearly cast on the wall opposite, also the shadow of the bearded man in number eleven on the left, who passed to and fro in shirt-sleeves once or twice, and was seen first brushing his hair and later on in a nightgown, also the shadow of the occupant of number thirteen on the right. This might be more interesting. Number thirteen was, like himself, leaning on his elbows on the window sill, looking out into the street. He seemed to be a tall, thin man, or was it by any chance a woman? At least it was someone who covered his or her head with some kind of drapery before going to bed, and, he thought, must be possessed of a red lampshade, and the lamp must be flickering very much. There was a distinct playing up and down of a dull red light on the opposite wall. He craned out a little to see if he could make any more of the figure, but beyond a fold of some light, perhaps white, material on the window-sill, he could see nothing. Now came a distant step in the street, and its approach seemed to recall number thirteen, to a sense of his exposed position, 
for very swiftly and suddenly he swept aside from the window, and his red light went out. Anderson, who had been smoking a cigarette, laid the end of it on the window sill, and went to bed. Next morning he was woken by the two pier with hot water, etc. He roused himself, and after thinking out the correct Danish words, said as distinctly as he could, "'You must not move my portmanteau. Where is it?' As is not uncommon, the maid laughed, and went away without making any distinct answer. Anderson, rather irritated, sat up in bed, intending to call her back, but he remained sitting up, staring straight in front of him. There was his portmanteau on its trestle, exactly where he had seen the porter put it when he first arrived. This was a rude shock for a man who prided himself on his accuracy of observation. How it could possibly have escaped him the night before, he did not pretend to understand. At any rate, there it was now. The daylight showed more than the portmanteau. It let the true proportions of the room with its three windows appear, and satisfied its tenant that his choice, after all, had not been a bad one. When he was almost dressed, he walked to the middle one of the three windows to look out at the weather. Another shock awaited him. Strangely unobservant he must have been last night. He could have sworn ten times over that he had been smoking at the right-hand window the last thing before he went to bed, and here was his cigarette end on the sill of the middle window. He started to go down to breakfast. Rather late, but number thirteen was later. Here were his boots still outside his door. A gentleman's boots. So then number thirteen was a man, not a woman. Just then he caught sight of the number on the door. It was fourteen. He thought he must have passed number thirteen without noticing it. Three stupid mistakes in twelve hours were too much for a methodical, accurate-minded man so he turned back to make sure. The next number to fourteen was number twelve, his own room. There was no number thirteen at all. After some minutes devoted to a careful consideration of everything he had had to eat and drink during the last twenty-four hours, Anderson decided to give the question up. If his eyes or his brain were giving way, he would have plenty of opportunities for ascertaining that fact. If not, then he was evidently being treated to a very interesting experience. In either case, the development of events would certainly be worth watching. During the day, he continued his examination of the Episcopal correspondence which I have already summarized. To his disappointment, it was incomplete. Only one other letter could be found which referred to the affair of Monk Nicholas Franken. It was from the Bishop Jorgen Freys to Erasmus Nielsen. He said, Although we are not in the least degree inclined to assent to your judgment concerning our court, and shall be prepared, if need be, to withstand you to the uttermost in that behalf, yet forasmuch as our trusty and well-beloved Magnicolus Franken, against whom you have dared to allege certain false and malicious charges, hath been suddenly removed from among us, it is apparent that the question for this time falls. But forasmuch as you further allege that the Apostle and Evangelist, St. John, in his heavenly apocalypse, describes the Holy Roman Church under the guise and symbol of the Scarlet Woman, be it known to you, etc. Search as he might, Anderson could find no sequel to this letter, nor any clue to the cause or manner of the removal of the Casus Belli. He could only suppose that Franken had died suddenly, and as there were only two days between the date of Nielsen's last letter, when Franken was evidently still in being, and that of the bishop's letter, the death must have been completely unexpected. In the afternoon he paid a short visit to Hull, and took his tea at Berkelun, nor could he notice, though he was in a somewhat nervous frame of mind, that there was any indication of such a failure of eye or brain as his experiences of the morning had led him to fear. At supper 
he found himself next to the landlord. What, he asked him after some indifferent conversation, is the reason why in most of the hotels one visits in this country the number thirteen is left out of the list of rooms? I see you have none here. The landlord seemed amused. To think that you should have noticed a thing like that. I've thought about it once or twice myself, to tell the truth. An educated man, I've said, has no business with these superstitious notions. I was brought up myself here, in the high school of Viborg, and our old master was always a man to set his face against anything of that kind. He's been dead now this many years. A fine upstanding man he was, and ready with his hands as well as his head. I recollect us boys one snowy day. Here he plunged into reminiscence. "'Then you don't think there is any particular objection to having a number thirteen? said Anderson. "'Ah, oh, to be sure. Well, you understand, I was brought up to the business by my poor old father. He kept an hotel in Aarhus first, and then, when we were born, he moved to Vibor here, which was his native place, and had the phoenix here until he died. That was in um, 1876. Then I started business in Sirkovor, and only the year before last I moved into this house. Then followed more details as to the state of the house and business, when first taken over. And when you came here, was there a number thirteen? No, no, I was going to tell you about that. You see, in a place like this, the commercial class, the travellers, are what we have to provide for in general. And put them in number thirteen? Why, they'd as soon sleep in the street, or sooner. As far as I'm concerned myself, it wouldn't make a penny difference to me what the number of my room was, and so I've often said to them, but they stick to it that it brings them bad luck. Quantities of stories they have among them of men that have slept in a number thirteen and never been the same again, or lost their best customers, or one thing and another, said the landlord, after searching for a more graphic phrase. Then what do you use your number thirteen for? said Anderson, conscious, as he said the words, of a curious anxiety quite disproportionate to the importance of the question. My number thirteen? Why don't I tell you that there isn't such a thing in the house? I thought you might have noticed that. If there was, it would be next door to your own room. Well, yes, only I happened to think, that is, I fancied last night, that I had seen a door numbered thirteen in that passage, and really I'm almost certain I must have been right, for I saw it the night before as well. Of course, Herr Christensen laughed this notion to scorn, as Anderson had expected, and emphasized with much iteration the fact that no number thirteen existed, or had existed before him, in that hotel. Anderson was in some ways relieved by his certainty, but still puzzled and he began to think that the best way to make sure whether he had indeed been subject to an illusion or not was to invite the landlord to his room to smoke a cigar later on in the evening. Some photographs of English towns which he had with him formed a sufficiently good excuse. Herr Christensen was flattered by the invitation, and most willingly accepted it. At about ten o'clock he was to make his appearance, but before that Anderson had some letters to write, and retired for the purpose of writing them. He almost blushed to himself at confessing it, but he could not deny that it was the fact that he was becoming quite nervous about the question of the existence of number thirteen. So much so, that he approached his room by way of number eleven, in order that he might not be obliged to pass the door, or the place where the door ought to be. He looked quickly and suspiciously about the room when he entered it, but there was nothing beyond that indefinable air of being smaller than usual to warrant any misgivings. There was no question of the presence or absence of his portmanteau tonight. He had himself emptied it of its contents and lodged it under his bed. With a certain effort he dismissed the thought of number thirteen from his mind and sat down to his writing. His neighbours were quiet enough. Occasionally a door banged in the passage, and a pair of boots was thrown out. 
or a bagman walked past humming to himself. And outside, from time to time, a cart thundered over the atrocious cobblestones, or a quick step hurried along the flags. Anderson finished his letters, ordered in whiskey and soda, and then went to the window and studied the dead wall opposite and the shadows upon it. As far as he could remember, number 14 had been occupied by the lawyer, a staid man who said little at meals, being generally engaged in studying a small bundle of papers beside his plate. Apparently, however, he was in the habit of giving vent to his animal spirits when alone. Why else should he be dancing? The shadow from the next room evidently showed that he was. Again and again his thin form crossed the window, his arms waved, and a gaunt leg was kicked up with surprising agility. He seemed to be barefooted, and the floor must be well laid, for no sound betrayed his movements. Safir Herr Anders Jensen, dancing at ten o'clock at night in a hotel bedroom, seemed a fitting subject for a historical painting in the grand style, and Anderson's thoughts, like those of Emily in The Mysteries of Udolpho, began to arrange themselves in the following lines. When I return to my hotel at ten o'clock p.m., the waiters think I am unwell. I do not care for them. But when I've locked my chamber door and put my boots outside, I dance all night upon the floor. And even if my neighbours swore I'd go on dancing all the more, for I'm acquainted with the law, and in despite of all their jaw, their protests I deride. Had not the landlord at this moment knocked at the door, it is probable quite a long poem might have been laid before the reader. To judge from his look of surprise when he found himself in the room, Herr Christensen was struck, as Anderson had been, by something unusual in its aspect, but he made no remark. Anderson's photographs interested him mightily, and formed the text of many autobiographical discourses. Nor is it quite clear how the conversation could have been diverted into the desired channel of number 13, had not the lawyer at this moment begun to sing, and to sing in a manner which could leave no doubt in anyone's mind that he was either exceedingly drunk or raving mad. It was a high, thin voice that they heard, and it seemed dry as if from long disuse. Of words or tune there was no question. It went sailing up to a surprising height, and was carried down with a despairing moan, as of a winter wind in a hollow chimney, or an organ whose wind fails suddenly. It was a really horrible sound, and Anderson felt that if he had been alone he must have fled for refuge in society to some neighbour bagman's room the landlord sat open-mouthed. "'I don't understand it,' he said at last, wiping his forehead. "'It is dreadful. I've heard it once before, but I made sure it was a cat.' "'Is he mad?' said Anderson. "'He must be. And what a sad thing. Such a good customer, too. And so successful in his business, by what I hear, and a young family to bring up.' Just then came an impatient knock at the door, and the knocker entered without waiting to be asked. It was the lawyer in déshabillé, and very rough-haired, and very angry he looked. "'I beg pardon, sir,' he said, "'but I should be much obliged if you would kindly dis—' Here he stopped, for it was evident that neither of the persons before him was responsible for the disturbance, and after a moment's lull it swelled forth again more wildly than before. "'But what in the name of heaven does it mean?' broke out the lawyer. "'Where is it? Who is it? Am I going out of my mind?' "'Surely, Herr Jensen, it comes from your room next door. Isn't there a cat or something stuck in the chimney?' This was the best that occurred to Anderson to say, and he realised its futility as he spoke. But anything was better than to stand and listen to that horrible voice, and look at the broad white face of the landlord, all perspiring and quivering as he clutched the arms of his chair. "'Impossible,' said the lawyer. "'Impossible! There is no chimney. I came here because I was convinced the noise was going on here. 
It was certainly in the next room to mine. Was there no door between yours and mine? said Anderson eagerly. No, sir, said Herr Jensen, rather sharply. At least not this morning. Ah, said Anderson, nor to-night. I am not sure, said the lawyer, with some hesitation. Suddenly the crying or singing voice in the next room died away, and the singer was heard seemingly to laugh to himself in a crooning manner. The three men actually shivered at the sound. Then there was a silence. Come, said the lawyer. What have you to say here, Christensen? What does this mean? Good heaven, said Christensen. How should I tell? I know no more than you, gentlemen. I pray I may never hear such a noise again. So do I, said Herr Jensen, and he added something under his breath. Anderson thought it sounded like the last words of the Psalter. Omnis spiritus laudet dominum. But he could not be sure. But we must do something, said Anderson. The three of us. Shall we go and investigate in the next room? But that is Herr Jensen's room, wailed the landlord. It is no use. He has come from there himself. I am not so sure, said Jensen. I think this gentleman is right. We must go and see. The only weapons of defence that could be mustered on the spot were a stick and umbrella. The expedition went out into the passage, not without quakings. There was a deadly quiet outside, but a light shone from under the next door. Anderson and Jensen approached it. The latter turned to the handle and gave a sudden vigorous push. No use. The door stood fast. Here, Christensen, said Jensen. Will you go and fetch the strongest servant you have in the place? We must see this through. The landlord nodded and hurried off, glad to be away from the scene of action. Jensen and Anderson remained outside, looking at the door. It is number thirteen, you see, said the latter. Yes, there is your door and there is mine, said Jensen. My room has three windows in the daytime, said Anderson with difficulty, suppressing a nervous laugh. By George, so is mine, said the lawyer, turning and looking at Anderson. His back was now to the door. In that moment the door opened, and an arm came out and clawed at his shoulder. It was clad in ragged yellowish linen, and the bare skin, where it could be seen, had long grey hair upon it. Anderson was just in time to pull Jensen out of its reach, with a cry of disgust and fright, when the door shut again, and a low laugh was heard. Jensen had seen nothing, but when Anderson hurriedly told him what a risk he had run, he fell into a great state of agitation and suggested that they should retire from the enterprise and lock themselves up in one or other of their rooms. However, while he was developing this plan, the landlord and two able-bodied men arrived on the scene, all looking rather serious and alarmed. Jensen met them with a torrent of description and explanation, which did not at all tend to encourage them for the fray. The men dropped the crowbars they had brought and said flatly, that they were not going to risk their throats in that devil's den. The landlord was miserably nervous and undecided, conscious that if the danger were not faced, his hotel was ruined, and very loath to face it himself. Luckily, Anderson hit upon a way of rallying the demoralized force. "'Is this,' he said, "'the Danish courage I've heard so much of? It isn't a German in there, and if it was we are five to one.' The two servants and Jensen were stung into action by this, and made a dash at the door. Stop, said Anderson. Don't lose your heads. You stay out here with the light, landlord, and one of you two men break in the door, and don't go in when it gives way. The men nodded, and the younger stepped forward, raised his crowbar, and dealt a tremendous blow on the upper panel. The result was not in the least what any of them anticipated. There was no cracking or rending of wood, only a dull sound, as if the solid wall had been struck. The man dropped his tool with a shout, and began rubbing his elbow. His cry drew their eyes upon him for a moment, then Anderson looked at the door again. It was gone. The plaster wall of the passage stared him in the face, with a considerable gash in it where the crowbar had struck it. Number thirteen had passed out of existence. For a brief space they stood perfectly still, gazing at the blank wall. 
an early cock in the yard beneath was heard to crow, and as Anderson glanced in the direction of the sound, he saw through the window at the end of the long passage that the eastern sky was paling to the dawn. Perhaps, said the landlord with hesitation, you gentlemen would like another room for tonight, a double-bedded one? Neither Jensen nor Anderson was averse to the suggestion. They felt inclined to hunt in couples after their late experience. It was found convenient when each of them went to his room to collect the articles he wanted for the night, that the other should go with him and hold the candle. They noticed that both number twelve and number fourteen had three windows. Next morning the same party reassembled in number twelve. The landlord was naturally anxious to avoid engaging outside help, and yet it was imperative that the mystery attaching to that part of the house should be cleared up. Accordingly, the two servants had been induced to take upon them the function of carpenters. The furniture was cleared away, and at the cost of a good many irretrievably damaged planks, that portion of the floor was taken up which lay nearest to number fourteen. You will naturally suppose that a skeleton, say that of Mach Nicholas Franken, was discovered. That was not so. What they did find, lying between the beams which supported the flooring, was a small copper box. In it was a neatly folded vellum document, with about twenty lines of writing. Both Anderson and Jensen, who proved to be something of a paleographer, were much excited by this discovery, which promised to afford the key to these extraordinary phenomena. I possess a copy of an astrological work which I have never read. It has, by way of frontispiece, a woodcut by Hans Sibeld Beham, representing a number of sages seated round a table. This detail may enable connoisseurs to identify the book. I cannot myself recollect its title and it is not at this moment within reach. But the fly-leaves of it are covered with writing, and during the ten years in which I have owned the volume, I have not been able to determine which way up this writing ought to be read, much less in what language it is. Not dissimilar was the position of Anderson and Jensen after the protracted examination to which they submitted the document in the copper box. After two days' contemplation of it, Jensen, who was the bolder spirit of the two, hazarded the conjecture that the language was either Latin or Old Danish. Anderson ventured upon no surmises, and was very willing to surrender the box and the parchment to the historical society of Viborg to be placed in their museum. I had the whole story from him a few months later, as we sat in a wood near Uppsala, after a visit to the library there where we, or rather I, had laughed over the contract by which Daniel Salthenius, in later life professor of Hebrew at Königsberg, sold himself to Satan. Anderson was not really amused. Young idiot, he said, meaning Salthenius, who was only an undergraduate when he committed that indiscretion. How did he know what company he was courting? And when I suggested the usual considerations, he only grunted. That same afternoon he told me what you have read, but he refused to draw any inferences from it, and to assent to any that I drew for him. End of number 13 from Ghost Stories of an Antiquary by M. R. James This is a LibriVox recording. All the LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Yearsley. Ghost Stories of an Antiquary by M. R. James. Count Magnus. By what means the papers out of which I have made a connected story came into my hands, 
is the last point which the reader will learn from these pages, but it is necessary to prefix to my extracts from them a statement of the form in which I possess them. They consist, then, partly of a series of collections for a book of travels, such a volume as was a common product of the forties and fifties. Horace Marriott's Journal of a Residence in Jutland and the Danish Isles is a fair specimen of the class to which I allude. These books usually treated of some unknown district on the continent. They were illustrated with woodcuts or steel plates. They gave details of hotel accommodation and of means of communication, such as we now expect to find in any well-regulated guidebook, and they dealt largely in reported conversations with intelligent foreigners, racy innkeepers, and garrulous peasants. In a word, they were chatty. Begun with the idea of furnishing material for such a book, my papers, as they progressed, assumed the character of a record of one single personal experience, and this record was continued up to the very eve, almost, of its termination. The writer was a Mr. Raxall. For my knowledge of him, I have to depend entirely on the evidence his writings afford, and from these I deduce that he was a man past middle age, possessed of some private means, and very much alone in the world. He had, it seems, no settled abode in England, but was a denizen of hotels and boarding-houses. It is probable that he entertained the idea of settling down at some future time which never came, and I think it also likely that the Pantechnican fire in the early seventies must have destroyed a great deal that would have thrown light on his antecedents, for he refers once or twice to property of his that was warehoused at that establishment. It is further apparent that Mr. Raxall had published a book, and that it treated of a holiday he had once taken in Brittany. More than this I cannot say about his work, because a diligent search in bibliographical works has convinced me that it must have appeared either anonymously or under a pseudonym. As to his character, it is not difficult to form some superficial opinion. He must have been an intelligent and cultivated man. It seems that he was near being a fellow of his college at Oxford, brazen nose, as I judge from the calendar. His besetting fault was pretty clearly that of over-inquisitiveness, possibly a good fault in a traveller, certainly a fault for which this traveller paid dearly enough in the end. On what proved to be his last expedition, he was plotting another book, Scandinavia, a region not widely known to Englishmen forty years ago, had struck him as an interesting field. He must have alighted on some old books of Swedish history or memoirs, and the idea had struck him that there was room for a book descriptive of travel in Sweden, interspersed with episodes from the history of some of the great Swedish families. He procured letters of introduction, therefore, to some persons of quality in Sweden, and set out thither in the early summer of 1863. Of his travels in the north there is no need to speak, nor of his residence of some weeks in Stockholm. I need only mention that some savant resident there put him on the track of an important collection of family papers, belonging to the proprietors of an ancient manor-house in Vestergotland, and obtained for him permission to examine them. The manor-house, or Hergard, in question, is to be called R-A-B-A-E-C-K, pronounced something like Robeck, though that is not its name. It is one of the best buildings of its kind in all the country, and the picture of it in Dahlenberg's Suecia Antiqua et Moderna engraved in 1694, shows it very much as the tourist may see it today. It was built soon after 1600, and is, roughly speaking, very much like an English house of that period, in respect of material, red brick, with stone facings, and style. The man who built it was a scion of the great house of de la Gardie, and his descendants possess it still. 
de la Garde is the name by which I will designate them when mention of them becomes necessary. They received Mr. Raxall with great kindness and courtesy, and pressed him to stay in the house as long as his researches lasted. But preferring to be independent, and mistrusting his powers of conversing in Swedish, he settled himself at the village inn, which turned out quite sufficiently comfortable, at any rate during the summer months. This arrangement would entail a short walk daily to and from the manor-house of something under a mile. The house itself stood in a park, and was protected, we should say grown up, with large old timber. Near it you found the walled garden, and then entered a close wood fringing one of the small lakes with which the whole country is pitted. Then came the wall of the demesne, and you climbed a steep knoll, a knob of rock lightly covered with soil, and on the top of this stood the church, fenced in with tall, dark trees. It was a curious building to English eyes. The nave and aisles were low, and filled with pews and galleries. In the western gallery stood the handsome old organ, gaily painted and with silver pipes. The ceiling was flat, and and had been adorned by a seventeenth-century artist with a strange and hideous last judgment, full of lurid flames, falling cities, burning ships, crying souls, and brown and smiling demons. Handsome brass corone hung from the roof. The pulpit was like a doll's house, covered with little painted wooden cherubs and saints. A stand with three hourglasses was hinged to the preacher's desk. Such sights as these may be seen in many a church in Sweden now, but what distinguished this one was an addition to the original building. At the eastern end of the north aisle the builder of the manor-house had erected a mausoleum for himself and his family. It was a largish eight-sided building, lighted by a series of oval windows, and it had a domed roof topped by a kind of pumpkin-shaped object rising into a spire, a form in which Swedish architects greatly delighted. The roof was of copper externally, and was painted black, while the walls, in common with those of the church, were staringly white. To this mausoleum there was no access from the church. It had a portal and steps of its own on the northern side. Past the churchyard the path to the village goes, and not more than three or four minutes bring you to the inn door. On the first day of his stay at Rabeck, Mr. Raxall found the church door open, and made these notes of the interior which I have epitomized. Into the mausoleum, however, he could not make his way. He could, by looking through the keyhole, just descry that there were fine marble effigies and sarcophagi of copper, and a wealth of armorial ornament which made him very anxious to spend some time in investigation. The papers he had come to examine at the manor-house proved to be of just the kind he wanted for his book. There were family correspondence, journals, and account-books of the earliest owners of the estate, very carefully kept and clearly written, full of amusing and picturesque detail. The first de la Gardi appeared in them as a strong and capable man, Shortly after the building of the mansion, there had been a period of distress in the district, and the peasants had risen, and attacked several chateaux, and done some damage. The owner of Rabeck took a leading part in suppressing trouble, and there was reference to executions of ringleaders, and severe punishments inflicted with no sparing hand. The portrait of this Magnus de la Gardi was one of the best in the house and Mr. Raxall studied it with no little interest after his day's work. He gives no detailed description of it, but I gather that the face impressed him rather by its power than by its beauty or goodness. In fact, he writes that Count Magnus was an almost phenomenally ugly man. On this day Mr. Raxall took his supper with the family, and walked back in the late but still bright evening. I must remember, he writes, to ask the sexton if he can let me into the mausoleum at the church. 
He evidently has access to it himself, for I saw him to-night standing on the steps, and, as I thought, locking or unlocking the door. I find that early on the following day Mr. Raxall had some conversation with his landlord. His setting it down at such length as he does surprised me at first, but I soon realized that the papers I was reading were, at least in their beginning, the materials for the book he was meditating and that it was to have been one of those quasi-journalistic productions which admit of the introduction of an admixture of conversational matter. His object, he says, was to find out whether any traditions of Count Magnus de la Gardi lingered on in the scenes of that gentleman's activity, and whether the popular estimate of him were favourable or not. He found that the Count was decidedly not a favourite. If his tenants came late to their work on the days which they owed to him as lord of the manor, they were set on the wooden horse, or flogged and branded in the manor-house yard. One or two cases there were of men who had occupied lands which encroached on the lord's domain, and whose houses had been mysteriously burnt on a winter's night, with the whole family inside. But what seemed to dwell on the innkeeper's mind most, for he returned to the subject more than once, was that the Count had been on the black pilgrimage, and had brought something or someone back with him. You will naturally inquire, as Mr. Raxall did, what the black pilgrimage may have been. But your curiosity on the point must remain unsatisfied for the time being, just as his did. The landlord was evidently unwilling to give a full answer, or indeed any answer, on the point, and being called out for a moment, trotted out with obvious alacrity, only putting his head in at the door a few minutes afterwards, to say that he was called away to Skara, and should not be back till evening. So Mr. Raxall had to go unsatisfied to his day's work at the manor-house. The papers, on which he was just then engaged, soon put his thoughts into another channel, for he had to occupy himself with glancing over the correspondence between Sophia Albertina in Stockholm and her married cousin Ulrika Leonora at Rabeck in the years 1705 to 1710. The letters were of exceptional interest from the light they threw upon the culture of that period in Sweden, as any one can testify who has read the full edition of them in the publications of the Swedish Historical Manuscripts Commission. In the afternoon he had done with these, and after returning the boxes in which they were kept to their places on the shelf, he proceeded, very naturally, to take down some of the volumes nearest to them, in order to determine which of them had best be his principal subject of investigation next day. The shelf he had hit upon was occupied mostly by a collection of account books in the writing of the first Count Magnus. But one among them was not an account book, but a book of alchemical and other tracts in another sixteenth century hand. Not being very familiar with alchemical literature, Mr. Raxall spends much space, which he might have spared, in setting out the names and beginnings of the various treatises. The Book of the Phoenix Book of the Thirty Words, Book of the Toad, Book of Miriam, Turba Philosophorum, and so forth. And then he announces with a good deal of circumstance his delight at finding, on a leaf originally left blank near the middle of the book, some writing of Count Magnus himself, headed Liber Nigre Peregrinationis. It is true that only a few lines were written but there was quite enough to show that the landlord had that morning been referring to a belief at least as old as the time of Count Magnus, and probably shared by him. This is the English of what was written. If any man desires to obtain a long life, if he would obtain a faithful messenger and see the blood of his enemies, it is necessary that he should first go into the city of Chorazin, and there salute the prince. Here there was an erasure of one word, 
not very thoroughly done, so that Mr. Raxall felt pretty sure that he was right in reading it as Aeris, of the air, but there was no more of the text copied, only a line in Latin, Quaeri reliqua hujus materiae inter secretiora, that is, see the rest of this matter among the more private things. It could not be denied that this threw a rather lurid light upon the tastes and beliefs of the Count, but to Mr. Raxall, separated from him by nearly three centuries, the thought that he might have added to his general forcefulness alchemy, and to alchemy something like magic, only made him a more picturesque figure, and when, after a rather prolonged contemplation of his picture in the hall, Mr. Raxall set out on his homeward way, his mind was full of the thought of Count Magnus. He had no eyes for his surroundings, no perception of the evening scents of the woods, or the evening light on the lake, and when all of a sudden he pulled up short, he was astonished to find himself already at the gate of the churchyard, and within a few minutes of his dinner. His eyes fell on the mausoleum. Ah, he said, Count Magnus, there you are. I should dearly like to see you. Like many solitary men, he writes, I have a habit of talking to myself aloud, and, unlike some of the Greek and Latin particles, I do not expect an answer. Certainly, and perhaps fortunately in this case, there was neither voice nor any that regarded. Only the woman, who I suppose was cleaning up the church, dropped some metallic object on the floor, whose clang startled me. Count Magnus, I think, sleeps sound enough. That same evening, the landlord of the inn, who had heard Mr. Raxall say that he wished to see the clerk or deacon, as he would be called in Sweden, of the parish, introduced him to that official in the inn parlour. A visit to the de la Gardi tomb-house was soon arranged for the next day, and a little general conversation ensued. Mr. Raxall, remembering that one function of Scandinavian deacons is to teach candidates for confirmation, thought he would refresh his own memory on a biblical point. "'Can you tell me,' he said, "'anything about Chirazin?' The deacon seemed startled, but, but readily reminded him how that village had once been denounced. "'To be sure,' said Mr. Raxall, "'it is, I suppose, quite a ruin now.' "'So I expect.' replied the deacon. I have heard some of our old priests say that Antichrist is to be born there, and there are tales. Ah, what tales are those? Mr. Raxall put in. Tales, I was going to say, which I have forgotten, said the deacon, and soon after that he said good night. The landlord was now alone, and at Mr. Raxall's mercy, and that inquirer was not inclined to spare him. Herr Nielsen, he said, I have found out something about the black pilgrimage. You may as well tell me what you know. What did the Count bring back with him? Swedes are habitually slow, perhaps, in answering, or perhaps the landlord was an exception. I'm not sure, but Mr. Raxall notes that the landlord spent at least one minute in looking at him before he said anything at all. Then he came close up to his guest and with a good deal of effort he spoke. Mr. Raxall, I can tell you this one little tale, and no more, not any more. You must not ask anything when I have done. In my grandfather's time, that is, ninety-two years ago, there were two men who said, The Count is dead, we do not care for him. We will go tonight and have a free hunt in his wood the long wood on the hill that you have seen behind the Robeck. Well, those that heard them say this, they said, No, do not go. We are sure you will meet with persons walking who should not be walking. They should be resting, not walking. These men laughed. There were no forestmen to keep the wood, because no one wished to live there. The family were not here at the house. These men could do what they wished. Very well. They go to the wood that night. My grandfather was sitting here in this room. It was the summer, 
and a light night. With the window open, he could see out to the wood, and hear. So he sat there, and two or three men with him, and they listened. At first they hear nothing at all. Then they hear someone, you know how far away it is, they hear someone scream, just as if the most inside part of his soul was twisted out of him. All of them in the room caught hold of each other, and they sat so for three-quarters of an hour. Then they hear someone else, only about three hundred ells off. They hear him laugh out loud. It was not one of those two men that laughed, and indeed they have all of them said that it was not any man at all. After that they hear a great door shut. Then. When it was just light with the sun, they all went to the priest. They said to him, Father, put on your gown and your ruff, and come to bury these men, Anders Bjornsson and Hans Thorbjorn. You understand that they were sure that these men were dead. So they went to the wood. My grandfather never forgot this. He said they were all like so many dead men themselves. The priest, too, he was in a white fear. He said, when they came to him, I heard one cry in the night, and I heard one laugh afterwards. If I cannot forget that, I shall not be able to sleep again. So they went to the wood, and they found these men on the edge of the wood. Hans Thorbjorn was standing with his back against a tree and all the time he was pushing with his hands, pushing something away from him which was not there. So he was not dead, and they led him away, and took him to the house at Nikyoping, and he died before the winter, but he went on pushing with his hands. Also, Anders Bjornsson was there, but he was dead, and I tell you this about Anders Bjornsson that he was once a beautiful man, but now his face was not there, because the flesh of it was sucked away off the bones. You understand that? My grandfather did not forget that. And they laid him on the bier which they brought, and they put a cloth over his head, and the priest walked before, and they began to sing the psalm for the dead as well as they could. So as they were singing the end of the first verse, one fell down, who was carrying the head of the bier, and the others looked back, and they saw that the cloth had fallen off, and the eyes of Anders Bjornsson were looking up, because there was nothing to close over them, and this they could not bear. Therefore the priest laid the cloth upon him, and sent for a spade, and they buried him in that place. The next day Mr. Raxall records that the deacon called for him soon after his breakfast, and took him to the church and mausoleum. He noticed that the key of the latter was hung on a nail just by the pulpit, and it occurred to him that, as the church door seemed to be left unlocked as a rule, it would not be difficult for him to pay a second and more private visit to the monuments if there proved to be more of interest among them than could be digested at first. The building, when he entered it, he found not unimposing. The monuments, mostly large erections of the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries, were dignified if luxuriant, and the epitaphs and heraldry were copious. The central space of the domed room was occupied by three copper sarcophagi, covered with finely engraved ornament. Two of them had, as is commonly the case in Denmark and Sweden, a large metal crucifix on the lid. The third, that of Count Magnus, as it appeared, had instead of that a full-length effigy engraved upon it, and round the edge were several bands of similar ornament representing various scenes. One was a battle with cannon belching out smoke, and walled towns and troops of pikemen. Another showed an execution. In a third, among trees, 
was a man running at full speed with flying hair and outstretched hands. After him followed a strange form. It would be hard to say whether the artist had intended it for a man, and was unable to give the requisite similitude, or whether it was intentionally made as monstrous as it looked. In view of the skill with which the rest of the drawing was done, Mr. Raxall felt inclined to adopt the latter idea. The figure was unduly short, and was for the most part muffled in a hooded garment which swept the ground. The only part of the form which projected from that shelter was not shaped like any hand or arm. Mr. Raxall compares it to the tentacle of a devilfish, and continues, On seeing this I said to myself, this, then, which is evidently an allegorical representation of some kind, a fiend pursuing a hunted soul, may be the origin of the story of Count Magnus and his mysterious companion. Let us see how the huntsman is pictured. Doubtless it will be a demon blowing his horn. But, as it turned out, there was no such sensational figure, only the semblance of a cloaked man on a hillock, who stood leaning on a stick and watching the hunt with an interest which the engraver had tried to express in his attitude. Mr. Raxall noted the finely worked and massive steel padlocks, three in number, which secured the sarcophagus. One of them he saw was detached, and lay on the pavement, and then, unwilling to delay the deacon longer, or to waste his own working time, he made his way onward to the manor-house. It is curious, he notes, how on retracing a familiar path one's thoughts engross one to the absolute exclusion of surrounding objects. Tonight, for the second time, I had entirely failed to notice where I was going. I had planned a private visit to the tomb-house to copy the epitaphs. When I suddenly, as it were, awoke to consciousness, and found myself, as before, turning in at the churchyard gate and, I believe, singing or chanting some such words as, Are you awake, Count Magnus? Are you asleep, Count Magnus? And then something more which I have failed to recollect. It seemed to me that I must have been behaving in this nonsensical way for some time. He found the key of the mausoleum where he had expected to find it, and copied the greater part of what he wanted. In fact, he stayed until the light began to fail him. I must have been wrong, he writes, in saying that one of the padlocks of my Count's sarcophagus was unfastened. I see to-night that two are loose. I picked both up and laid them carefully on the window-ledge, after trying unsuccessfully to close them. The remaining one is still firm, and though I take it to be a spring-lock, I cannot guess how it is opened. Had I succeeded in undoing it, I am almost afraid I should have taken the liberty of opening the sarcophagus. It is strange the interest I feel in the personality of this, I fear, somewhat ferocious and grim old noble. The day following was, as it turned out, the last of Mr. Raxall's stay at Rarpeck. He received letters connected with certain investments which made it desirable that he should return to England. His work among the papers was practically done, and travelling was slow. He decided, therefore, to make his farewells put some finishing touches to his notes, and be off. These finishing touches and farewells, as it turned out, took more time than he had expected. The hospitable family insisted on his staying to dine with them. They dined at three, and it was verging on half-past six before he was outside the iron gates of Rabeck. He dwelt on every step of his walk by the lake, determined to saturate himself now that he trod it for the last time, in the sentiment of the place and hour. And when he reached the summit of the churchyard knoll, he lingered for many minutes, gazing at the limitless prospect of woods, near and distant, all dark beneath a sky of liquid green. When at last he turned to go, the thought struck him that surely he must bid farewell to Count Magnus, as well as the rest of the de la Gardis. The church was but twenty yards away, and he knew where the key of the mausoleum hung. It was not long before he was standing over the great copper coffin, and as usual talking to himself aloud, 
"'You may have been a bit of a rascal in your time, Magnus,' he was saying. "'But for all that I should like to see you, or rather—' "'Just at that instant,' he says, "'I felt a blow on my foot. "'Hastily enough I drew it back, "'and something fell on the pavement with a clash. "'It was the third, the last of the three padlocks, "'which had fastened the sarcophagus. "'I stooped to pick it up, and— "'Heaven is my witness that I am writing only the bare truth. "'Before I had raised myself, there was a sound of metal hinges creaking, "'and I distinctly saw the lid shifting upwards. "'I may have behaved like a coward, but I could not for my life stay for one moment. "'I was outside that dreadful building in less time than I can write, "'almost as quickly as I could have said, the words. "'And what frightens me yet more, I could not turn the key in the lock.' As I sit here in my room noting these facts, I ask myself, it was not twenty minutes ago, whether that noise of creaking metal continued, and I cannot tell whether it did or not. I only know that there was something more than I have written that alarmed me, but whether it was sound or sight, I am not able to remember. What is this that I have done? Poor Mr. Raxall. He set out on his journey to England on the next day, as he had planned, and he reached England in safety. And yet, as I gather from his changed hand, and inconsequent jottings, a broken man, one of the several small notebooks that have come to me with his papers, gives not a key to, but a kind of inkling of his experiences. Much of his journey was made by canal boat, and I find not less than six painful attempts to enumerate and describe his fellow passengers. The entries are of this kind. 24. Pastor of village in Skane, usual black coat and soft black hat. 25. Commercial traveller from Stockholm, going to Trollheiten. Black cloak, brown hat. 26. Man in long black cloak, broad-leafed hat, very old-fashioned. This entry is lined out, and a note adding, perhaps identical with number 13, have not yet seen his face. On referring to number 13, I find that he is a Roman priest in a cassock. The net result of the reckoning is always the same. Twenty-eight people appear in the enumeration, one being always a man in a long black cloak and broad hat, and another a short figure in dark cloak and hood. On the other hand, it is always noted that only twenty-six passengers appear at meals, and that the man in the cloak is perhaps absent, and the short figure is certainly absent. On reaching England, it appears that Mr. Raxall landed at Harwich, and that he resolved at once to put himself out of the reach of some person or persons whom he never specifies but whom he had evidently come to regard as his pursuers. Accordingly, he took a vehicle, it was a closed fly, not trusting the railway, and drove across country to the village of Belchamp St. Paul. It was about nine o'clock on a moonlit August night when he neared the place. He was sitting forward and looking out of the window at the fields and thickets, there was little else to be seen, racing past him. Suddenly he came to a crossroad, at the corner, two figures were standing motionless. Both were in dark cloaks. The taller one wore a hat, the shorter a hood. He had no time to see their faces, nor did they make any motion that he could discern. Yet the horse shied violently and broke into a gallop, and Mr. Raxall sank back into his seat in something like desperation. He had seen them before. Arrived at Belchamp St. Paul, he was fortunate enough to find a decent furnished lodging, and for the next twenty-four hours he lived, comparatively speaking, in peace. His last notes were written on this day. They are too disjointed and ejaculatory to be given here in full, but the substance of them is clear enough. He is expecting a visit from his pursuers. How or when he knows not, and his constant cry is, what has he done? And is there no hope? Doctors, he knows, would call him mad. Policemen would laugh at him. 
The parson is away. What can he do but lock his door and cry to God? People still remember, last year at Belchamp St. Paul, how a strange gentleman came one evening in August, years back, and how the next morning but one he was found dead, and there was an inquest, and the jury that viewed the body fainted, seven of them did, and none of them wouldn't speak to what they see, and the verdict was visitation of God, and how the people as kept the house moved out that same week, and went away from that part. But they do not, I think, know that any glimmer of light has ever been thrown, or could be thrown, on the mystery. It so happened that last year the little house came into my hands as part of a legacy. It had stood empty since 1863, and there seemed no prospect of letting it, so I had it pulled down, and the papers of which I have given you an abstract were found in a forgotten cupboard under the window in the best bedroom. The End of Count Magnus From Ghost Stories of an Antiquary by M. R. James This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. Recorded by Peter Yearsley. Ghost Stories of an Antiquary by M. R. James O oh, whistle, and I'll come to you, my lad. I suppose you'll be getting away pretty soon now full term is over, Professor," said a person, not in the story, to the Professor of Ontography, soon after they had sat down next to each other at a feast in the hospitable hall of St. James's College. The Professor was young, neat, and precise in speech. Yes, he said, my friends have been making me take up golf this term and I mean to go to the East Coast, in point of fact, to Burnstow, I dare say you know it, for a week or ten days to improve my game. I hope to get off to-morrow. Oh, Parkins, said his neighbour on the other side, if you're going to Burnstow, I wish you would look at the site of the Templar's Preceptory, and let me know if you think it would be any good to have a dig there in the summer. It was as you might suppose, a person of antiquarian pursuits who said this, but since he merely appears in this prologue there is no need to give his entitlements. "'Certainly,' said Parkins, the professor. "'If you'll describe to me whereabouts the site is, I will do my best to give you an idea of the lie of the land when I get back, or I could write to you about it if you would tell me where you are likely to be.' "'Don't trouble to do that, thanks. It's only that I'm thinking of taking my family in that direction in the long, and it occurred to me that, as very few of the English preceptories have ever been properly planned, I might have an opportunity of doing something useful on off days.' The professor rather sniffed at the idea that planning out a preceptory could be described as useful. His neighbour continued, "'A site I doubt if there's anything showing above ground. Must be down quite close to the beach now. The sea has encroached tremendously, as you know, all along that bit of coast. I should think, from the map, that it must be about three-quarters of a mile from the Globe Inn, at the north end of town. Where are you going to stay? Well, at the Globe Inn, as a matter of fact, said Parkins. I have engaged a room there. I couldn't get in anywhere else. Most of the lodging-houses are shut up in winter, it seems. And as it is, they tell me that the only room of any size I can have is really a double-bedded one, and that they haven't a corner in which to store the other bed, and so on. But I must have a fairly large room, for I am taking some books down, and mean to do a bit of work. And though I don't quite fancy having an empty bed, not to speak of two, in what I may call for the time being my study, I suppose I can manage to rough it for the short time I shall be there. Do you call having an extra bed in your room roughing it, Parkins? 
said a bluff person opposite. "'Look here. I shall come down and occupy it for a bit. It'll be company for you.' The professor quivered, but managed to laugh in a courteous manner. "'By all means, Rogers. There's nothing I should like better. But I'm afraid you would find it rather dull. You don't play golf, do you?' "'No, thank heaven,' said rude Mr. Rogers. "'Well, you see, when I'm not writing, I shall most likely be out on the links, and that, as I say, would be rather dull for you, I'm afraid.' "'Oh, I don't know. There's certainly somebody I know in the place. But, of course, if you don't want me, speak the word, Parkins. I shan't be offended. Truth, as you always tell us, is never offensive.' Parkins was indeed scrupulously polite and strictly truthful. It is to be feared that Mr. Rogers sometimes practised upon his knowledge of these characteristics. In Parkins's breast there was a conflict now raging, which for a moment or two did not allow him to answer. That interval being over, he said, "'Well, if you want the exact truth, Rogers, I was considering whether the room I speak of would really be large enough to accommodate us both comfortably, and also whether mind you, I shouldn't have said this if you hadn't pressed me, you would not constitute something in the nature of a hindrance to my work. Rogers laughed loudly. Well done, Parkins, he said. It's all right. I promise not to interrupt your work. Don't you disturb yourself about that. No, I won't come if you don't want me. But I thought I should do so nicely to keep the ghosts off. Here he might have been seen to wink and to nudge his next neighbour. Parkins might also have been seen to become pink. "'I beg pardon, Parkins,' Rogers continued. "'I oughtn't to have said that. I forgot you didn't like levity on these topics.' "'Well,' Parkins said, "'as you have mentioned the matter, I freely own that I do not like careless talk about what you call ghosts. A man in my position,' he went on, raising his voice a little, cannot, I find, be too careful about appearing to sanction the current beliefs on such subjects, as you know, Rogers, or as you ought to know, for I think I have never concealed my views. No, you certainly have not, old man, put in Rogers sotto voce. I hold that any semblance, any appearance of concession to the view that such things might exist, is equivalent to a renunciation of all that I hold most sacred, but I am afraid I have not succeeded in securing your attention. Your undivided attention was what Dr. Blimber actually said, Rogers interrupted with every appearance of an earnest desire for accuracy. Footnote. Mr. Rogers was wrong. Vide Dombey and Son, Chapter 12. Returned text. But I beg your pardon, Perkins. I'm stopping you. No, not at all, said Parkins. I don't remember Blimber. Perhaps he was before my time. "'But I needn't go on. I'm sure you know what I mean.' "'Yes, yes,' said Rogers, rather hastily. "'Just so. We'll go into it fully at Burnstow or, or somewhere.' In repeating the above dialogue, I have tried to give the impression which it made on me, that Parkins was something of an old woman, rather hen-like, perhaps, in his little ways, totally destitute, alas, of the sense of humour, but at the same time dauntless and sincere in his convictions, and a man deserving of the greatest respect. Whether or not the reader has gathered so much, that was the character which Parkins had. On the following day, Parkins did, as he had hoped, succeed in getting away from his college and in arriving at Burnstow. He was made welcome at the Globe Inn, was safely installed in the large, double-bedded room of which we have heard, and was able, before retiring, to rest, to arrange his materials for work, in apple-pie order upon a commodious table, which occupied the outer end of the room, and was surrounded on three sides by windows looking out seaward. That is to say, the central window looked straight out to sea, and those on the left and right commanded prospects along the coast to the north and south, respectively. On the south you saw the village of Burnstow. On the north no houses were to be seen, but only the beach and the low cliff backing it. Immediately in front was a strip, not considerable, of rough grass, dotted with old anchors, capstans, and so forth. 
then a broad path, then the beach. Whatever may have been the original distance between the globe in and the sea, not more than sixty yards now separated them. The rest of the population of the inn was, of course, a golfing one, and included few elements that call for a special description. The most conspicuous figure was perhaps that of an ancien militaire, secretary of a London club, and possessed of a voice of incredible strength, and of views of a pronouncedly Protestant type. These were apt to find utterance after his attendance upon the ministrations of the vicar, an estimable man with inclinations towards a picturesque ritual, which he gallantly kept down, as far as he could, out of deference to East Anglian tradition. Professor Parkins, one of whose principal characteristics was pluck, spent the greater part of the day following his arrival at Burnstow in what he had called improving his game, in company with this Colonel Wilson, and during the afternoon, whether the process of improvement were to blame or not, I am not sure, the Colonel's demeanour assumed a colouring so lurid that even Parkins jibbed at the thought of walking home with him from the links. He determined after a short and furtive look at that bristling moustache and those incarnadine features, that it would be wiser to allow the influences of tea and tobacco to do what they could with the Colonel before the dinner hour should render a meeting inevitable. I might walk home tonight along the beach, he reflected. Yes, and take a look, there will be light enough for that, at the ruins of which Disney was talking. I don't exactly know where they are, by the way, but I expect I can hardly help stumbling on them. This he accomplished, I may say, in the most literal sense, for in picking his way from the links to the shingle beach, his foot caught, partly in a gorse root, and partly in a biggish stone, and over he went. When he got up and surveyed his surroundings, he found himself in a patch of somewhat broken ground, covered with small depressions and mounds. These latter, when he came to examine them, proved to be simply masses of flints embedded in mortar, and grown over with turf. He must, he quite rightly concluded, be on the site of the preceptory he had promised to look at. It seemed not unlikely to reward the spade of the explorer. Enough of the foundations was probably left at no great depth to throw a good deal of light on the general plan. He remembered vaguely that the Templars, to whom this site had belonged, were in the habit of building round churches, and he thought a particular series of the humps or mounds near him did appear to be arranged in something of a circular form. Few people can resist the temptation to try a little amateur research in a department quite outside their own, if only for the satisfaction of showing how successful they would have been had they only taken it up seriously. Our professor, however, if he felt something of this mean desire, was also truly anxious to oblige Mr. Disney, so he paced with care the circular area he had noticed and wrote down its rough dimensions in his pocket-book. Then he proceeded to examine an oblong eminence which lay east of the centre of the circle, and seemed, to his thinking, likely to be the base of a platform or altar. At one end of it, the northern, a patch of the turf was gone, removed by some boy or other creature, ferre naturae. It might, he thought, be as well to probe the soil here for evidences of masonry, and he took out his knife and began scraping away the earth. And now followed another little discovery. A portion of soil fell inward as he scraped, and disclosed a small cavity. He lighted one match after another, to help him to see of what nature the hole was, but the wind was too strong for them all. By tapping and scratching the sides with his knife, however, he was able to make out that it must be an artificial hole in masonry. It was rectangular, and the sides, top and bottom, if not actually plastered, were smooth and regular. Of course it was empty. No, as he withdrew the knife he heard a metallic clink, and when he introduced his hand it met with a cylindrical object lying on the floor of the hole. 
Naturally enough, he picked it up, and when he brought it into the light, now fast fading, he could see that it too was of man's making. A metal tube, about four inches long, and evidently of some considerable age. By the time Parkins had made sure that there was nothing else in this odd receptacle, it was too late and too dark for him to think of undertaking any further search. What he had done had proved so unexpectedly interesting that he determined to sacrifice a little more of the daylight on the morrow to archaeology. The object which he now had safe in his pocket was bound to be of some slight value at least, he felt sure. Bleak and solemn was the view on which he took a last look before starting homeward. A faint yellow light in the west showed the links, on which a few figures moving towards the clubhouse were still visible, the squat Martello Tower, the lights of Alzi village, the pale ribbon of sands, intersected at intervals by black wooden groinings, the dim and murmuring sea. The wind was bitter from the north, but was at his back when he set out for the globe. He quickly rattled and clashed through the shingle, and gained the sand, upon which, but for the groinings which had to be got over every few yards, the going was both good and quiet. One last look behind, to measure the distance he had made since leaving the ruined Templar's church, showed him a prospect of company on his walk, in the shape of a rather indistinct personage who seemed to be making great efforts to catch up with him, but made little, if any, progress. I mean, that there was an appearance of running about his movements, but that the distance between him and Parkins did not seem materially to lessen. So at least Parkins thought, and decided that he almost certainly did not know him, and that it would be absurd to wait until he came up. For all that, company, he began to think, would really be very welcome on that lonely shore, if only you could choose your companion. In his unenlightened days, he had read of meetings in such places which even now would hardly bear thinking of. He went on thinking of them, however, until he reached home, and particularly of one which catches most people's fancy at some time of their childhood. Now I saw in my dream that Christian had gone but a very little way when he saw a foul fiend coming over the field to meet him. What should I do now? he thought if I looked back and caught sight of a black figure sharply defined against the yellow sky, and saw that it had horns and wings. I wonder whether I should stand or run for it. Luckily the gentleman behind is not of that kind, and he seems to be about as far off now as when I saw him first. Well, at this rate he won't get his dinner as soon as I shall. And, oh dear me, it's within a quarter of an hour of the time now. I must run." Parkins had, in fact, very little time for dressing. When he met the Colonel at dinner, peace, or as much of her as that gentleman could manage, reigned once more in the military bosom. Nor was she put to flight in the hours of bridge that followed dinner, for Parkins was a more than respectable player. When, therefore, he retired towards twelve o'clock, he felt that he had spent his evening in quite a satisfactory way and that, even for so long as a fortnight or three weeks, life at the globe would be supportable under similar conditions. Especially, thought he, if I go on improving my game. As he went along the passages, he met the boots of the globe, who stopped and said, Beg your pardon, sir, but as I was a-brushing your coat just now, there was something fell out of the pocket. I put it on your chest of drawers, sir, in your room, sir. A piece of a pipe or something of that, sir. Thank you, sir. You'll find it on your chest of drawers, sir. Yes, sir. Good night, sir. The speech served to remind Parkins of his little discovery of that afternoon. It was with some considerable curiosity that he turned it over by the light of his candles. It was of bronze, he now saw, and was shaped very much after the manner of the modern dog whistle. In fact, it was, yes, certainly it was, actually no more nor less than a whistle. He put it to his lips, but it was quite full of a fine caked-up sand or earth, which would not yield to knocking, but must be loosened with a knife. 
Tidy, as ever, in his habits, Parkins cleared out the earth onto a piece of paper, and took the latter to the window to empty it out. The night was clear and bright, as he saw when he had opened the casement, and he stopped for an instant to look at the sea, and note and note a belated wanderer stationed on the shore in front of the inn. Then he shut the window, a little surprised at the late hours people kept at Burnstow, and took his whistle to the light again. Why, surely there were marks on it, and not merely marks, but letters. A very little rubbing rendered the deeply cut inscription quite legible, but the professor had to confess, after some earnest thought, that the meaning of it was as obscure to him as the writing on the wall to Belshazzar. There were legends both on the front and on the back of the whistle. The one read thus. Reader's note. There were four groups of three letters in a diamond pattern. To the left, F-U-R, then one above the other, F-L-A and F-L-E, and to the right, B-I-S. End of reader's note. The other Quiz est iste qui venet. I ought to be able to make it out, he thought, but I suppose I am a little rusty in my Latin. When I come to think of it, I don't believe I even know the word for a whistle. The long one does seem simple enough. It ought to mean, who is this who is coming? Well, the best way to find out is evidently to whistle for him. He blew tentatively and stopped suddenly, startled and yet pleased at the note he had elicited. It had a quality of infinite distance in it, and soft as it was, he somehow felt it must be audible for miles round. It was a sound, too, that seemed to have the power, which many scents possess, of forming pictures in the brain. He saw quite clearly for a moment a vision of a wide, dark expanse at night, with a fresh wind blowing, and in the midst a lonely figure. How employed he could not tell, perhaps he would have seen more, had not the picture been broken by the sudden surge of a gust of wind against his casement, so sudden that it made him look up, just in time to see the white glint of a seabird's wing, somewhere outside the dark panes. The sound of the whistle had so fascinated him that he could not help trying it once more, this time more boldly. The note was little, if at all, louder than before, and repetition broke the illusion. No picture followed, as he had half hoped it might. But what is this? Goodness, what force the wind can get up in a few minutes! What a tremendous gust! There, I knew that window fastening was no use. Ah! I thought so. Both candles out. It is enough to tear the room to pieces. The first thing was to get the window shut. While you might count twenty, Perkins was struggling with the small casement, and felt almost as if he were pushing back a sturdy burglar, so strong was the pressure. It slackened all at once, and the window banged to and latched itself. Now to relight the candles and see what damage, if any, had been done. No. Nothing seemed amiss. No glass, even, was broken in the casement. But the noise had evidently roused at least one member of the household. The colonel was to be heard stumping in his stockinged feet on the floor above, and growling. Quickly as it had risen, the wind did not fall at once. On it went, moaning and rushing past the house, at times rising to a cry so desolate that as Parkins disinterestedly said, it might have made fanciful people feel quite uncomfortable. Even the unimaginative, he thought, after a quarter of an hour, might be happier without it. Whether it was the wind or the excitement of golf, or the researches in the preceptory that kept Parkins awake, he was not sure. Awake he remained, in any case, long enough to fancy as I am afraid I often do myself under such conditions, that he was the victim of all manner of fatal disorders. He would lie counting the beats of his heart, 
convinced that it was going to stop work every moment, and would entertain grave suspicions of his lungs, brain, liver, etc., suspicions which he was sure would be dispelled by the return of daylight, but which, until then, refused to be put aside. He found a little vicarious comfort in the idea that someone else was in the same boat. A near neighbour, in the darkness it was not easy to tell his direction, was tossing and rustling in his bed, too. The next stage was that Parkins shut his eyes, and determined to give sleep every chance. Here again, over-excitement asserted itself, in another form, that of making pictures. Experto crede. Pictures do come to the closed eyes of one trying to sleep, and are often so little to his taste that he must open his eyes and disperse them. Parkins's experience on this occasion was a very distressing one. He found that the picture which presented itself to him was continuous. When he opened his eyes, of course, it went, but when he shut them once more, it framed itself afresh and acted itself out again, neither quicker nor slower than before. What he saw was this. A long stretch of shore, shingle-edged by sand, and intersected at short intervals with black groins running down to the water. A scene, in fact, so like that of his afternoon's walk, that, in the absence of any landmark, it could not be distinguished therefrom. The light was obscure, conveying an impression of gathering storm, late winter evening, and slight cold rain. On this bleak stage, at first no actor was visible. Then, in the distance, a bobbing black object appeared. A moment more and it was a man, running, jumping, clambering over the groins, and every few seconds looking eagerly back. The nearer he came, the more obvious it was that he was not only anxious, but even terribly frightened, though his face was not to be distinguished. He was, moreover, almost at the end of his strength. On he came. Each successive obstacle seemed to cause him more difficulty than the last. "'Will he get over this next one?' thought Parkins. "'It seems a little higher than the others.' Yes, half climbing, half throwing himself, he did get over, and fell all in a heap on the other side, the side nearest to the spectator. There, as if really unable to get up again, he remained crouching under the groin, looking up in an attitude of painful anxiety. So far, no cause whatever for the fear of the runner had been shown, but now there began to be seen far up the shore a little flicker of something light-coloured, moving to and fro with great swiftness and irregularity. Rapidly growing larger, it too declared itself as a figure in pale, fluttering draperies, ill-defined. There was something about its motion which made Parkins very unwilling to see it at close quarters. It would stop, raise arms, bow itself towards the sand, then run, stooping across the beach to the water edge and back again, and then, rising upright, once more continue its course forward at a speed that was startling and terrifying. The moment came when the pursuer was hovering about from left to right only a few yards beyond the groin where the runner lay in hiding. After two or three ineffectual castings hither and thither, it came to a stop, stood upright, with arms raised high, and then darted straight forward towards the groin. It was at this point that Parkins always failed in his resolution to keep his eyes shut. With many misgivings as to incipient failure of eyesight, overworked brain, excessive smoking and so on, he finally resigned himself to light his candle, get out a book, and pass the night, waking rather than be tormented by this persistent panorama, which he saw clearly enough could only be a morbid reflection of his walk and his thoughts on that very day. The scraping of match on box and the glare of light must have startled some creatures of the night, rats or what not which he heard scurry across the floor from the side of his bed, with much rustling. Dear, dear, the match is out, fool that it is! But the second one burnt better, and a candle and book were duly procured, 
over which Parkins poured till sleep of a wholesome kind came upon him, and that in no long space. For about the first time in his orderly and prudent life he forgot to blow out the candle, and when he was called next morning at eight there was still a flicker in the socket and a sad mess of guttered grease on the top of the little table. After breakfast he was in his room putting on the finishing touches to his golfing costume. Fortune had again allotted the colonel to him for a partner. When one of the maids came in, "'Oh, if you please,' she said, "'would you like any extra blankets on your bed, sir?' "'Ah, thank you,' said Parkins. "'Yes, I think I should like one. It seems likely to turn rather colder.' In a very short time the maid was back with the blanket. "'Which bed should I put it on, sir?' she asked. "'What? Why, that one, the one I slept in last night,' he said, pointing to it. "'Oh, yes, I beg your pardon, sir, but you seem to have tried both of them. Leastways we had to make them both up this morning.' "'Really? How very absurd,' said Parkins. "'I certainly never touched the other, except to lay some things on it. Did it actually seem to have been slept in?' "'Oh, yes, sir,' said the maid. "'Why, all the things was crumpled and thrown about always, if you'll excuse me, sir, quite as if anyone hadn't passed but a very poor night, sir.' "'Dear me,' said Parkins. "'Well, I may have disordered it more than I thought when I unpacked my things. I'm very sorry to have given you the extra trouble, I'm sure. I expect a friend of mine soon, by the way, a gentleman from Cambridge, to come and occupy it for a night or two. That'll be all right, I suppose, won't it?' "'Oh, yes, to be sure, sir. Thank you, sir. It's no trouble, I'm sure,' said the maid, and departed to giggle with her colleagues. Parkins set forth with a stern determination to improve his game. I am glad to be able to report that he succeeded so far in this enterprise that the Colonel, who had been rather repining at the prospect of a second day's play in his company, became quite chatty as the morning advanced, and his voice boomed out over the flats, as certain also of our own minor poets have said, like some great bourdon in a minster tower. "'Extraordinary wind, that, we had last night,' he said. "'In my old home we should have said someone had been whistling for it.' "'Should you indeed?' said Perkins. "'Is there a superstition of that kind still current in your part of the country?' "'I don't know about superstition,' said the Colonel. "'They believe in it.' all over Denmark and Norway, as well as on the Yorkshire coast. And my experience is, mind you, that there's generally something at the bottom of what these country folk hold to, and have held to for generations. But it's your drive, or whatever it might have been. The golfing reader will have to imagine appropriate digressions at the proper intervals. When conversation was resumed, Parkins said with a slight hesitancy, "'Apropos of what you were saying just now, Colonel, I think I ought to tell you that my own views on such subjects are very strong. I am, in fact, a convinced disbeliever in what is called the supernatural." "'What?' said the Colonel. "'Do you mean to tell me you don't believe in second sight? Or ghosts? Or anything of that kind?' "'In nothing whatever of that kind,' returned Parkins firmly. "Well." said the Colonel, but it appears to me at that rate, sir, that you must be little better than a Sadducee. Parkins was on the point of answering that, in his opinion, the Sadducees were the most sensible persons he had ever read of in the Old Testament. But, feeling some doubt as to whether much mention of them was to be found in that work, he preferred to laugh the accusation off. Perhaps I am, he said, but here, give me my cleek, boy. Excuse me one moment, Colonel. A short interval. Now, as to whistling for the wind, let me give you my theory about it. The laws which govern winds are really not at all perfectly known. To fisher folk and such, of course, not known at all. A man or woman of eccentric habits, perhaps, or a stranger, is seen repeatedly on the beach at some unusual hour and is heard whistling. Soon afterwards a violent wind rises. A man who could read the sky perfectly, or who possessed a barometer, could have foretold that it would. The simple people of a fishing village have no barometers, and only a few rough rules for prophesying weather. What more natural than that the eccentric personage I postulated 
should be regarded as having raised the wind, or that he or she should clutch eagerly at the reputation of being able to do so. Now take last night's wind. As it happens, I myself was whistling. I blew a whistle twice, and the wind seemed to come absolutely in answer to my call. If anyone had seen me— The audience had been a little restive under this harangue, and Parkins had, I fear, fallen somewhat into the tone of a lecturer. But at the last sentence the Colonel stopped. "'Whistling, were you?' he said. "'And what sort of whistle did you use?' "'Play this stroke first. Interval. "'About that whistle you were asking, Colonel, it's rather a curious one. I have it in my—no, I, I see I've left it in my room. As a matter of fact, I found it yesterday.' And then Parkins narrated the manner of his discovery of the whistle. Upon hearing which the Colonel grunted, and opined that in Parkins's place he should himself be careful about using a thing that had belonged to a set of papists, of whom, speaking generally, it might be affirmed that you never knew what they might not have been up to. From this topic he diverged to the enormities of the vicar, who had given notice on the previous Sunday that Friday would be the feast of St. Thomas the Apostle, and that there would be service at eleven o'clock in the church. This and other similar proceedings constituted in the Colonel's view a strong presumption that the vicar was a concealed papist, if not a Jesuit. And Parkins, who could not very readily follow the Colonel in this region, did not disagree with him. In fact, they got on so well together in the morning that there was not talk on either side of their separating after lunch. Both continued to play well during the afternoon, or at least well enough to make them forget everything else, until the light began to fail them. Not until then did Parkins remember that he had meant to do some more investigating at the preceptory, but it was of no great importance, he reflected. One day was as good as another. He might as well go home with the Colonel. As they turned the corner of the house, the Colonel was almost knocked down by a boy who rushed into him at the very top of his speed, and then instead of running away, remained hanging on to him and panting. The first words of the warrior were naturally those of reproof and objurgation, but he very quickly discerned that the boy was almost speechless with fright. Inquiries were useless at first. When the boy got his breath, he began to howl, and still clung to the colonel's legs. He was at last detached, but continued to howl. "'What in the world is the matter with you? What have you been up to? What have you seen?' said the two men. "'Oh, I seen it wive at me at the window,' wailed the boy, "'and I don't like it.' "'What window?' said the irritated Colonel. "'Come pull yourself together, my boy.' "'The front window it was, at the hotel,' said the boy. At this point Parkins was in favour of sending the boy home, but the Colonel refused. He wanted to get to the bottom of it, he said. It was most dangerous to give a boy such a fright as this one had had, and if it turned out that people had been playing jokes, they should suffer for it in some way. And by a series of questions he made out this story. The boy had been playing about on the grass in front of the globe with some others. Then they had gone home to their teas, and he was just going, when he happened to look up at the front window and see it a-wiving at him. It seemed to be a figure of some sort, in white as far as he knew. Couldn't see its face, but it wived at him, and it wasn't a right thing. Not to say a right person. Was there a light in the room? No, he didn't think to look if there was a light. Which was the window? Was it the top one or the second one? The second one it was. The big window what got two little ends at the sides. Very well, my boy, said the Colonel, after a few more questions. You run away home now. I expect it was some person trying to give you a start. Another time, like a brave English boy, you just throw a stone. Well, no, not that exactly. But you go and speak to the waiter or to Mr. Simpson, the landlord. And yes, and say that I advised you to do so. The boy's face expressed some of the doubt he felt as to the likelihood of Mr. Simpson's lending a favourable ear to his complaint. But the Colonel did not appear to perceive this, and went on, "'And here's a sixpence—no, I see, it's a shilling—and you be off home, and don't think any more about it.' The youth hurried off with agitated thanks, 
and the Colonel and Parkins went round to the front of the globe and reconnoitred. There was only one window answering to the description they had been hearing. "'Well, that's curious,' said Parkins. "'It's evidently my window the lad was talking about. Will you come up for a moment, Colonel Wilson? We ought to be able to see if anyone has been taking liberties in my room.' They were soon in the passage, and Parkins made as if to open the door. Then he stopped and felt in his pockets. "'This is more serious than I thought,' was his next remark. "'I remember now that before I started this morning I locked the door. It is locked now. And what is more, here is the key.' And he held it up. "'Now,' he went on, "'if the servants are in the habit of going into one's room during the day when one is away, I can only say, well, well, that I don't approve of it at all.' Conscious of a somewhat weak climax, he busied himself in opening the door which was indeed locked, and in lighting candles. No, he said, nothing seems disturbed. Except your bed, put in the colonel. Excuse me, that isn't my bed, said Parkins. I don't use that one, but it does look as if someone had been playing tricks with it. It certainly did. The clothes were bundled up and twisted together in a most tortuous confusion. Parkins pondered. That must be it, he said at last. I disordered the clothes last night in unpacking, and they haven't made it since. Perhaps they came in to make it, and that boy saw them through the window, and then they were called away and locked the door after them. Yes, I think that must be it. Well, ring and ask, said the Colonel, and this appealed to Parkins as practical. The maid appeared, and, to make a long story short, deposed that she had made the bed in the morning when the gentleman was in the room and hadn't been there since. No, she hadn't no other key. Mr. Simpson, he kept the keys. He'd be able to tell the gentleman if anything had been up. This was a puzzle. Investigation showed that nothing of value had been taken, and Parkins remembered the disposition of the small objects on tables and so forth well enough to be pretty sure that no pranks had been played with them. Mr. and Mrs. Simpson furthermore agreed that neither of them had given the duplicate key of the room to any person whatever during the day. Nor could Parkins, fair-minded man as he was, detect anything in the demeanour of master, mistress, or maid that indicated guilt. He was much more inclined to think that the boy had been imposing on the colonel. The latter was unwontedly silent and pensive at dinner, and throughout the evening when he bade good night to Parkins, he murmured in a gruff undertone, "'You know where I am if you want me during the night?' "'Why, yes, thank you, Colonel Wilson. I think I do. But there isn't much prospect of my disturbing you, I hope. By the way,' he added, "'did I show you that old whistle I spoke of? I think not. Well, here it is.' The Colonel turned it over gingerly in the light of the candle. "'Can you make anything of the inscription?' asked Parkins, as he took it back. "'No, not in this light.' "'What do you mean to do with it?' "'Oh, well, when I get back to Cambridge I shall submit it to some of the archaeologists there, and see what they think of it, and very likely, if they consider it worth having, I may present it to one of the museums.' Hmm, said the Colonel. "'Well, you may be right. All I know is that if it were mine I should chuck it straight into the sea. It's no use talking, I am well aware. But I expect that with you it's a case of live and learn. I hope so, I'm sure.' and I wish you a good night. He turned away, leaving Parkins in act to speak, at the bottom of the stair, and soon each was in his own bedroom. By some unfortunate accident there were neither blinds nor curtains to the windows of the professor's room. The previous night he had thought little of this, but to-night there seemed every prospect of a bright moon rising to shine directly on his bed, and probably wake him later on. When he noticed this, he was a good deal annoyed, but, with an ingenuity which I can only envy, he succeeded in rigging up, with the help of a railway rug, some safety pins, and a stick and umbrella, a screen which, if it only held together, would completely keep the moonlight off his bed, and shortly afterwards he was comfortably in that bed. When he had read a somewhat solid work, long enough to produce a decided wish to sleep, he cast a drowsy glance round the room blew out the candle, and fell back upon the pillow. He must have slept soundly for an hour or more, when a sudden clatter shook him up in a most unwelcome manner, 
In a moment he realized what had happened. His carefully constructed screen had given way, and a very bright frosty moon was shining directly on his face. This was highly annoying. Could he possibly get up and reconstruct the screen? Or could he manage to sleep if he did not? For some minutes he lay and pondered over all the possibilities. Then he turned over sharply, and with his eyes open lay breathlessly listening. There had been a movement, he was sure, in the empty bed on the opposite side of the room. Tomorrow he would have it moved, for there must be rats or something playing about in it. It was quiet now. No. The commotion began again. There was a rustling and shaking, surely more than any rat could cause. I can figure to myself something of the professor's bewilderment and horror, for I have in a dream thirty years back seen the same thing happen but the reader will hardly perhaps imagine how dreadful it was to him to see a figure suddenly sit up in what he had known was an empty bed. He was out of his own bed in one bound, and made a dash towards the window where lay his only weapon, the stick with which he had propped his screen. This was, as it turned out, the worst thing he could have done, because the personage in the empty bed, with a sudden smooth motion, slipped from the bed and took up a position with outspread arms between the two beds, and in front of the door. Parkins watched it in a horrid perplexity. Somehow the idea of getting past it and escaping through the door was intolerable to him. He could not have borne, he didn't know why, to touch it. And as for its touching him, he would sooner dash himself through the window than have that happen. It stood for the moment in a band of dark shadow, and he had not seen what its face was like. Now it began to move in a stooping posture, and all at once the spectator realized with some horror and some relief that it must be blind, for it seemed to feel about it with its muffled arms in a groping and random fashion. Turning half away from him, it became suddenly conscious of the bed he had just left, and started towards it, and bent and felt over the pillows in a way which made Parkins shudder, as he had never in his life thought it possible. In a very few moments it seemed to know that the bed was empty, and then, moving forward into the area of light and facing the window, it showed for the first time what manner of thing it was. Parkins, who very much dislikes being questioned about it, did once describe something of it in my hearing, and I gathered that what he chiefly remembers about it is a horrible, an intensely horrible, face of crumpled linen. What expression he read upon it he could not or would not tell, but that the fear of it went nigh to maddening him is certain. But he was not at leisure to watch it for long. With formidable quickness it moved into the middle of the room, and as it groped and waved, one corner of its draperies swept across Parkins's face. He could not, though he knew how perilous the sound was, he could not keep back a cry of disgust, and this gave the searcher an instant clue. It leapt towards him upon the instant, and the next moment he was halfway through the window backwards, uttering cry upon cry at the utmost pitch of his voice, and the linen face was thrust close into his own. At this, almost the last possible second, deliverance came, as you will have guessed. The colonel burst the door open, and was just in time to see the dreadful group at the window. When he reached the figures, only one was left. Parkins sank forward into the room in a faint, and before him, on the floor, lay a tumbled heap of bedclothes. Colonel Wilson asked no questions, but busied himself in keeping everyone else out of the room, and in getting Parkins back to his bed, and himself, wrapped in a rug, occupied the other bed for the rest of the night. Early on the next day Rogers arrived, more welcome than he would have been a day before, and the three of them held a very long consultation in the professor's room. At the end of it the colonel left the hotel door, carrying a small object between his finger and thumb, which he cast as far into the sea as a very brawny arm could send it. Later on the smoke of a burning ascended from the back premises of the globe. Exactly what explanation was patched up for the staff and visitors at the hotel, I must confess I do not recollect. 
the professor was somehow cleared of the ready suspicion of delirium tremens, and the hotel of the reputation of a troubled house. There is not much question as to what would have happened to Parkins if the colonel had not intervened when he did. He would either have fallen out of the window, or else lost his wits. But it is not so evident what more the creature that came in answer to the whistle could have done than frighten. There seemed to be absolutely nothing material about it, save the bedclothes of which it had made itself a body. The colonel, who remembered a not very dissimilar occurrence in India, was of the opinion that if Parkins had closed with it, it could really have done very little, and that its one power was that of frightening. The whole thing, he said, served to confirm his opinion of the Church of Rome. There is really nothing more to tell, but as you may imagine, the professor's views on certain points are less clear-cut than they used to be. His nerves, too, have suffered. He cannot, even now, see a surplice hanging on a door quite unmoved, and the spectacle of a scarecrow in a field, late on a winter afternoon, has cost him more than one sleepless night. The End of O oh Whistle and I'll Come to You, My Lad From Ghost Stories of an Antiquary by M. R. James This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. Recorded by Peter Yearsley. Ghost Stories of an Antiquary by M. R. James. The Treasure of Abbot Thomas. Chapter 1. Verum usque in presentem diem, multa gariunt interesse canonici de abscondito quodam, istius abatis tome thesoro. Quem saepe, quanquam adhuc incassum, quae siverunt steinfeldenses. Ipsum enim, tomam adhuc florida in aete existentem, ingentum auri massam curca, Monasterium de Fodice perhibent. De quom el toties interrogatus ubi esset, cum risu respondere solitus erat, Job, Johannes et Zacharias, vel vobis vel posteris intagum, indicabunt. Idemque aliquando adie cere, se inventuris minime invisorum. Inter alia huius abatis opera, Hoc memoria praecipue dignum, indico quod fenestrum magnum in orientali partiale australis, in ecclesia sua imaginibus optime in vitro depictus impleverit, in quod et ipsius effigies et insignia ibidem posita demonstrant, domum quoque abatialem fere totem restauravit, puteo in atrio, Ipsius effosu et lepidibus mamorius pulcre caelatis exornato. Decesit autem, morte aliquantulum subitania peculsus, aetis sue anno septuaginta duo, incarnationis vero dominici, mille quinquigenti viginti novem. I suppose I shall have to translate this said the antiquary to himself, as he finished copying the above lines from that rather rare and exceedingly diffuse book, The Certum Steinfeldensi Norbertinum. Well, it may as well be done first as last. Footnote. The Certum Steinfeldensi Norbertinum is an account of the Premonstratensian Abbey of Steinfeld in the Eiffel, with lives of the abbots, published at Cologne in 1712, by Christian Albert Erhardt, a resident in the district. The epithet Norbertinum 
is due to the fact that St. Norbert was founder of the Premonstratensian order. Return to text. And accordingly, the following rendering was very quickly produced. Up to the present day, there is much gossip among the canons about a certain hidden treasure of this abbot Thomas, for which those of Steinfeld have often made search, though hitherto in vain. The story is that Thomas, while yet in the vigour of life, concealed a very large quantity of gold somewhere in the monastery. He was often asked where it was, and always answered with a laugh, Job, John, and Zechariah will tell either you or your successors. He sometimes added that he should feel no grudge against those who might find it. Among other works carried out by this abbot, I may specially mention his filling the great window at the east end of the south aisle of the church, with figures admirably painted on glass, as his effigy and arms in the window attest. He also restored almost the whole of the abbot's lodging, and dug a well in the court of it, which he adorned with beautiful carvings in marble. He died rather suddenly in the seventy-second year of his age, A.D. 1529. The object which the antiquary had before him at the moment was that of tracing the whereabouts of the painted windows of the abbey church at Steinfeld. Shortly after the revolution, a very large quantity of painted glass made its way from the dissolved abbeys of Germany and Belgium to this country, and may now be seen adorning various of our parish churches, cathedrals, and private chapels. Steinfeld Abbey was among the most considerable of these involuntary contributors to our artistic possession. I am quoting the somewhat ponderous preamble of the book which the antiquary wrote. And the greater part of the glass from that institution can be identified without much difficulty by the help either of the numerous inscriptions in which the place is mentioned, or of the subjects of the windows, in which several well-defined cycles or narratives were represented. The passage with which I began my story had set the antiquary on the track of another identification. In a private chapel, no matter where, he had seen three large figures, each occupying a whole light in a window, and evidently the work of one artist. Their style made it plain that that artist had been a German of the sixteenth century, but hitherto the more exact localizing of them had been a puzzle. They represented Will you be surprised to hear it? Job Patriarcha, Johannes Evangelista, Zacharias Propheta, and each of them held a book or scroll inscribed with a sentence from his writings. These, as a matter of course, the antiquary had noted, and had been struck by the curious way in which they differed from any text of the Vulgate that he had been able to examine. Thus the scroll in Job's hand was inscribed, Auro est locus in quo absconditur, for conflatur. Footnote. Translation. There is a place for gold where it is hidden. Return to text. On the book of John was, Habent in vestimentis suis scripturum quam nemo novit, for in vestimento scriptum, the following words being taken from another verse. Footnote. Translation. They have on their raiment a writing which no man knoweth. Return to text. And Zacharias had super lapidem unum septum oculi sunt, which alone of the three represents an unaltered text. Footnote. Translation. Upon one stone are seven eyes. Returned text. A sad perplexity it had been to our investigator to think why these three personages should have been placed together in one window. There was no bond of connection between them, either historic, symbolic, or doctrinal, and he could only suppose that they must have formed part of a very large series of prophets and apostles, which might have filled, say, all the clerestory windows of some capacious church. But the passage from the Certum had altered the situation 
by showing that the names of the actual personages represented in the glass now in Lord D.'s chapel had been constantly on the lips of Abbot Thomas von Eschenhausen of Steinfeld, and that this abbot had put up a painted window, probably about the year 1520, in the south aisle of his abbey church. It was no very wild conjecture that the three figures might have formed part of Abbot Thomas's offering. It was one which, moreover, could probably be confirmed or set aside by another careful examination of the glass. And, as Mr. Somerton was a man of leisure, he set out on pilgrimage to the private chapel with very little delay. His conjecture was confirmed to the full. Not only did the style and technique of the glass suit perfectly with the date and place required, but in another window of the chapel he found some glass known to have been brought along with the figures, which contained the arms of Abbot Thomas von Eschenhausen. At intervals during his researches, Mr. Somerton had been haunted by the recollection of the gossip about the hidden treasure, and, as he thought the matter over, it became more and more obvious to him that if the abbot meant anything by the enigmatical answer which he gave to his questioners, he must have meant that the secret was to be found somewhere in the window he had placed in the abbey church. It was undeniable, furthermore, that the first of the curiously selected texts on the scrolls in the window might be taken to have a reference to hidden treasure. Reader's Note the first text was, There is a place for gold where it is hidden. Returned text. Every feature, therefore, or mark which could possibly assist in elucidating the riddle, which he felt sure the abbot had set to posterity, he noted with scrupulous care, and returning to his Berkshire manor house, consumed many a pint of the midnight oil over his tracings and sketches. After two or three weeks, a day came when Mr. Somerton announced to his man that he must pack his own and his master's things for a short journey abroad, whither, for the moment, we will not follow him. CHAPTER Two. Mr. Gregory, the rector of Passbury, had strolled out before breakfast, it being a fine autumn morning as far as the gate of his carriage drive, with intent to meet the postman and sniff the cool air. Nor was he disappointed of either purpose. Before he had time to answer more than ten or eleven of the miscellaneous questions propounded to him in the lightness of their hearts by his young offspring, who had accompanied him, the postman was seen approaching, and among the morning's budget was one letter bearing a foreign postmark and stamp which became at once the object of an eager competition among the youthful Gregories, and addressed in an uneducated but plainly an English hand. When the rector opened it and turned to the signature, he realised that it came from the confidential valet of his friend and squire, Mr. Somerton. Thus it ran, Honoured Sir, as I am in a great anxiety about Master, I write at his wish to beg you, sir, if you could be so good as step over. Master has had a nasty shock, and keeps his bed. I never have known him like this, but no wonder, and nothing will serve but you, sir. Master says, would I mention the short way here is drive to Koblintz and take a trap, hoping I have made all plain, but am much confused in myself what with anxiety and weakfulness at night. If I might be so bold, sir, it will be a pleasure to see a honest British face amongst all these forig ones. I am, sir, your obedient servant, William Brown. P.S. The village, for town I will not term it, is named Steenfeld. The reader must be left to picture to himself in detail the surprise, confusion, and hurry of preparation into which the receipt of such letter would be likely to plunge a quiet Berkshire parsonage in the year of grace, 1859. It is enough for me to say that a train to town was caught in the course of the day, and that Mr. Gregory was able to secure a cabin in the Antwerp boat, and a place in the Koblenz train. 
nor was it difficult to manage the transit from that centre to Steinfeld. I labour under a grave disadvantage as narrator of this story, in that I have never visited Steinfeld myself, and that neither of the principal actors in the episode, from whom I derive my information, was able to give me anything but a vague and rather dismal idea of its appearance. I gather that it is a small place with a large church despoiled of its ancient fittings, a number of rather ruinous great buildings, mostly of the seventeenth century, surround this church, for the abbey, in common with most of those on the continent, was rebuilt in a luxurious fashion by its inhabitants at that period. It has not seemed to me worth while to lavish money on a visit to the place, for though it is probably far more attractive than either Mr. Somerton or Mr. Gregory thought it, there is evidently little, if anything, of first-rate interest to be seen, except, perhaps, one thing which I should not care to see. The inn where the English gentleman and his servant were lodged is, or was, the only possible one in the village. Mr. Gregory was taken to it at once by his driver, and found Mr. Brown waiting at the door. Mr. Brown, a model when in his Berkshire home, of the impassive, whiskered race who are known as confidential valets, was now egregiously out of his element, in a light tweed suit, anxious, almost irritable, and plainly anything but master of the situation. His relief at the sight of the honest British face of his rector was unmeasured, but words to describe it were denied him. He could only say, "'Well, I am pleased, I'm sure, sir, to see you, and so I'm sure, sir, will master.' "'How is your master, Brown?' Mr. Gregory eagerly put in. "'I think he's better, sir, thank you, but he's had a dreadful time of it. I hope he's getting some sleep now, but what has been the matter? I couldn't make out from your letter. Was it an accident of any kind? Well, sir, I hardly know whether I'd better speak about it. Master was very particular. He should be the one to tell you. But there's no bones broke. That's one thing I'm sure we ought to be thankful. What does the doctor say? asked Mr. Gregory. They were by this time outside Mr. Somerton's bedroom door, and speaking in low tones. Mr. Gregory, who happened to be in front, was feeling for the handle, and chanced to run his fingers over the panels. Before Brown could answer, there was a terrible cry from within the room. "'In God's name, who is that?' were the first words they heard. "'Brown, is it?' "'Yes, sir. Me, sir. And Mr. Gregory,' Brown hastened to answer, and there was an audible groan of relief in reply. They entered the room, which was darkened against the afternoon sun, and Mr. Gregory saw, with a shock of pity, how drawn, how damp with drops of fear was the usually calm face of his friend, who, sitting up in the curtained bed, stretched out a shaking hand to welcome him. "'Better for seeing you, my dear Gregory,' was the reply to the rector's first question, and it was palpably true. After five minutes of conversation, Mr. Somerton was more his own man, Brown afterwards reported, than he had been for days. He was able to eat a more than respectable dinner, and talked confidently of being fit to stand a journey to Coblentz within twenty-four hours. "'But there's one thing,' with a return of agitation which Mr. Gregory did not like to see, "'which I must beg you to do for me, my dear Gregory. Don't—' he went on, laying his hand on Gregory's to forestall any interruption. "'Don't ask me what it is, or why I want it done. I'm not, not up to explaining it yet. It it would throw me back, undo all the good you have done me by coming. The only word I will say about it is that you run no risk whatever by doing it, and that Brown can and will show you tomorrow what it is. It's merely to put back, to keep something. No, no, I can't speak of it yet. Do you mind calling Brown? Well, Somerton, said Mr. Gregory as he crossed the room to the door, I won't ask for any explanations till you see fit to give them. And if this bit of business is as easy as you represent it to be, I will very gladly undertake it for you, the first thing in the morning. Ah, oh, I was sure that you would, my dear Gregory. I was certain I could rely on you. I shall owe you more thanks than I can tell. Now, here is Brown. Brown, one word with you. 
"'Shall I go?' interjected Mr. Gregory. "'Not at all. Dear me, no. Brown, the first thing tomorrow morning, you don't mind early hours, I know, Gregory, you must take the rector to there, you know, a nod from Brown, who looked grave and anxious, and he and you will put that back. You needn't be in the least alarmed. It's perfectly safe in the daytime. You know what I mean. It lies on the step, you know, where, where we put it. Brown swallowed dryly once or twice, and failing to speak, bowed. And, yes, that's all. Only this one other word, my dear Gregory. If you can manage to keep from questioning Brown about this matter, I shall be still more bound to you. Tomorrow evening, at latest, if all goes well, I shall be able, I believe, to tell you the whole story from start to finish. And now I'll wish you good night. Brown will be with me. He sleeps here. And if I were you, I should lock my door. Yes, be particular to do that. They, they like it, the people here, and it's better. Good night, good night. They parted upon this, and if Mr. Gregory woke once or twice in the small hours, and fancied he heard a fumbling about the lower part of his locked door, it was perhaps no more than what a quiet man suddenly plunged into a strange bed, and the heart of a mystery, might reasonably expect. Certainly he thought to the end of his days that he had heard such a sound twice or three times between midnight and dawn. He was up with the sun, and out in company with Brown soon after. Perplexing as was the service he had been asked to perform for Mr. Somerton, it was not a difficult or an alarming one, and within half an hour from his leaving the inn it was over. What it was I shall not as yet divulge. Later in the morning Mr. Somerton, now almost himself again, was able to make a start from Steinfeld and that same evening, whether at Coblentz or at some intermediate stage on the journey I am not certain, he settled down to the promised explanation. Brown was present, but how much of the matter was ever really made plain to his comprehension, he would never say, and I am unable to conjecture. CHAPTER Three. This was Mr. Somerton's story. You know roughly, both of you, that this expedition of mine was undertaken with the object of tracing something in connection with some old painted glass in Lord D.'s private chapel. Well, the starting point of the whole matter lies in this passage from an old printed book, to which I will ask your attention. And at this point Mr. Somerton went carefully over some ground with which we are already familiar. On my second visit to the chapel, he went on, my purpose was to take every note I could of figures, lettering, diamond scratchings on the glass, and even apparently accidental markings. The first point which I tackled was that of the inscribed scrolls. I could not doubt that the first of these, that of Job, there is a place for the gold where it is hidden, with its intentional alteration, must refer to the treasure. So I applied myself with some confidence to the next, that of St. John. They have on their vestures a writing which no man knoweth. The natural question will have occurred to you. Was there an inscription on the robes of the figures? I could see none. Each of the three had a broad black border to his mantle, which made a conspicuous and rather ugly feature in the window. I was nonplussed, I will own, and, but for a curious bit of luck, I think I should have left the search where the canons of Steinfeld had left it before me. But it so happened that there was a good deal of dust on the surface of the glass, and Lord D., happening to come in, noticed my blackened hands, and kindly insisted on sending for a Turk's head broom to clean down the window. There must, I suppose, have been a rough piece in the broom. Anyhow, as it passed over the border of one of the mantles, I noticed that it left a long scratch, and that some yellow stain instantly showed up. I asked the man to stop his work for a moment and ran up the ladder to examine the place. The yellow stain was there, sure enough, and what had come away was a thick black pigment, which had evidently been laid on with the brush after the glass had been burnt, and could therefore be easily scraped off without doing any harm. I scraped accordingly, and you will hardly believe—no, I do you an injustice, you will have guessed already, 
that I found under this black pigment two or three clearly formed capital letters in yellow stain on a clear ground. Of course I could hardly contain my delight. I told Lord D. that I had detected an inscription which I thought might be very interesting, and begged to be allowed to uncover the whole of it. He made no difficulty about it whatever, told me to do exactly as I pleased, and then, having an engagement, was obliged, rather to my relief, I must say, to leave me. I set to work at once, and found the task a fairly easy one. The pigment, disintegrated of course by time, came off almost at a touch, and I don't think that it took me a couple of hours, all told, to clean the whole of the black borders in all three lights. Each of the figures had, as the inscription said, a writing on their vestures which nobody knew. This discovery, of course, made it absolutely certain to my mind that I was on the right track. And now, what was the inscription? While I was cleaning the glass, I almost took pains not to read the lettering, saving up the treat until I had got the whole thing clear. And when that was done, my dear Gregory, I assure you I could almost have cried from sheer disappointment. What I read was only the most hopeless jumble of letters that was ever shaken up in a hat. Here it is. Job, D-R-E-V-I-C-I-O-P-E-D, M-O-O-M, S-M-V, I-V-L, I-S-L, C-A-V, I-B-A, S-B-A, T-A-O-V-T. St. John. R-D-I-I-E-A-M-R-L-E-S-I-P-V-S-P-O-D-S-E-E-I-R-S-E-T-T-A-A-E-S-G-I-A-V-N-N-R. Zechariah. F-T-E-E-A-I-L-N. Q D P V A I V M T L E E A T T O H I O O N V M C A A T dot H dot Q dot E dot Blank as I felt, and must have looked for the first few minutes, my disappointment didn't last long. I realized almost at once that I was dealing with a cipher or cryptogram and I reflected that it was likely to be of a pretty simple kind, considering its early date, so I copied the letters with the most anxious care. Another little point, I may tell you, turned up in the process which confirmed my belief in the cipher. After copying the letters on Job's robe, I counted them to make sure that I had them right. There were thirty-eight, and just as I finished going through them, my eye fell on a scratching made with a sharp point on the edge of the border. It was simply the number thirty-eight in Roman numerals. To cut the matter short, there was a similar note, as I may call it, in each of the other lights, and that made it plain to me that the glass painter had had very strict orders from Abbot Thomas about the inscription, and had taken pains to get it correct. Well, after that discovery, you may imagine how minutely I went over the whole surface of the glass in search of further light. Of course, I did not neglect the inscription on the scroll of Zechariah, Upon one stone are seven eyes, but I very quickly concluded that this must refer to some mark on a stone which could only be found in situ, where the treasure was concealed. To be short, I made all possible notes and sketches and tracings, and then came back to Parsbury to work out the cipher at leisure. Oh, the agonies I went through! I thought myself very clever at first, for I made sure that the key would be found in some of the old books on secret writing. The steganographia of Joachim Trithemius, who was an earlier contemporary of Abbot Thomas, seemed particularly promising, so I got that and Selenius's cryptographia, and Bacon's De Augmentis Scientarum, and some more, but I could hit upon nothing. Then I tried the principle of the most frequent letter taking first Latin, and then German as a basis. That didn't help either. Whether it ought to have done so, I'm not clear. And then I came back to the window itself, and read over my notes, hoping, almost against hope, that the abbot might himself have somewhere supplied the key I wanted. 
I could make nothing out of the colour or pattern of the robes. There were no landscape backgrounds with subsidiary objects. There was nothing in the canopies. The only resource possible seemed to be in the attitudes of the figures. Job, I read, scroll in left hand, forefinger of right hand extended upwards. John holds inscribed book in left hand, with right hand blesses, with two fingers. Zechariah, scroll in left hand, right hand extended upwards, as Job, but with three fingers pointing up. In other words, I reflected, Job has one finger extended, John has two, Zechariah has three. May not there be a numerical key concealed in that? My dear Gregory, said Summerton, laying his hand on his friend's knee, that was the key. I didn't get it to fit at first, but after two or three trials I saw what was meant. After the first letter of the inscription, you skip one letter. After the next, you skip two. And after that, skip three. Now, look at the result I got. I've underlined the letters which form words. Reader's Note Letters are underlined in the inscriptions as described above and the resultant message is described in the following words from Somerton. End of reader's note. Do you see it? Decem, milia, auri, reposita, sunt imputeo, in at... Footnote. Translation. Ten thousand pieces of gold are laid up in a well in... Return to text followed by an incomplete word beginning A-T. So far, so good. I tried the same plan with the remaining letters, but it wouldn't work, and I fancied that perhaps the placing of dots after the last three letters might indicate some difference of procedure. Then I thought to myself, wasn't there some allusion to a well in the account of Abbot Thomas, in that book The Certum? Yes, there was. He built a Puteus in Atrio, a well in the court. There, of course, was my word Atrio. The next step was to copy out the remaining letters of the inscription, omitting those I had already used. That gave what you will see on this slip. R-V-I-I-O-P-D-O-O-S-M-V-V-I-S-C-A-V-B-S-B-T-A-O T D I E A M L S I V S P D E E R S E T A E G I A N R F E E A L Q D V A I M L E A T T H O O V M C A dot H dot Q dot E. Now, I knew what the first three letters I wanted were, namely R I O, to complete the word atrio. And as you will see, these are all to be found in the first five letters. I was a little confused at first by the occurrence of two eyes, but very soon I saw that every alternate letter must be taken in the remainder of the inscription. You can work it out for yourself. The result, continuing where the first round left off, thus Rio Domus Abatialis de Steinfeld a me toma qui posui custodem super ea gar a key, la touche. So the whole secret was out. Ten thousand pieces of gold are laid up in the well in the court of the abbot's house of Steinfeld by me, Thomas, who have set a guardian over them. Gar, a key, la touche. The last words I ought to say are a device which abbot Thomas had adopted. I found it with his arms in another piece of glass at Lord D's and he drafted it bodily into his cipher, though it doesn't quite fit in point of grammar. Well, what would any human being have been tempted to do, my dear Gregory, in my place? Could he have helped setting off, as I did, to Steinfeld, and tracing the secret literally to the fountainhead? I don't believe he could. Anyhow, I couldn't. And as I needn't tell you, I found myself at Steinfeld as soon as the resources of civilization could put me there, and installed myself in the inn you saw. I must tell you that I was not altogether free from forebodings. On one hand of disappointment, 
on the other hand, of danger. There was always the possibility that Abbot Thomas's well might have been wholly obliterated, or else that someone ignorant of cryptograms and guided only by luck might have stumbled on the treasure before me. And then, there was a very perceptible shaking of the voice here, I, I was not entirely easy, I need not mind confessing, as to the meaning of the words about the guardian of the treasure. But if you don't mind, I'll say no more about that unt until it becomes necessary. At the first possible opportunity, Brown and I began exploring the place. I had naturally represented myself as being interested in the remains of the abbey, and we could not avoid paying a visit to the church, impatient as I was to be elsewhere. Still, it did interest me to see the windows where the glass had been, and especially that at the east end of the south aisle. In the tracery lights of that, I was startled to see some fragments and coats of arms remaining. Abbot Thomas's shield was there, and a small figure with a scroll inscribed, Oculus habent et non videbunt. Footnote. Translation. They have eyes, and shall not see. Return to text which I take it was a hit of the abbot at his cannons. But, of course, the principal object was to find the abbot's house. There is no prescribed place for this, as far as I know, in the plan of a monastery. You can't predict of it, as you can of the chapter house, that it will be on the eastern side of the cloister, or, as of the dormitory, that it will communicate with the transept of the church. I felt that, if I asked many questions, I might awaken lingering memories of the treasure and I thought it best to try first to discover it for myself. It was not a very long or difficult search. That three-sided court southeast of the church, with deserted piles of building round it, and grass-grown pavement, which you saw this morning, was the place, and glad enough I was to see that it was put to no use, and was neither very far from our inn, nor overlooked by any inhabited building. There were only orchards and paddocks on the slopes east of the church, I can tell you that fine stone glowed wonderfully in the rather watery yellow sunset that we had on the Tuesday afternoon. Next, what about the well? There was not much doubt about that, as you can testify. It is really a very remarkable thing. That curb is, I think, of Italian marble, and the carving, I thought, must be Italian also. There were reliefs, you will perhaps remember, of Eliza and Rebecca, and of Jacob opening the well for Rachel and similar subjects, but by way of disarming suspicion, I suppose, the abbot had carefully abstained from any of his cynical and elusive inscriptions. I examined the whole structure with the keenest interest, of course, a square well-head with an opening in one side, an arch over it with a wheel for the rope to pass over, evidently in very good condition still, for it had been used within sixty years, or perhaps even later, though not quite recently. Then there was the question of depth and access to the interior. I suppose the depth was about sixty to seventy feet, and as to the other point, it really seemed as if the abbot had wished to lead searchers up to the very door of his treasure-house, for as you tested for yourself, there were big blocks of stone bonded into the masonry, and leading down in a regular staircase, round and round the inside of the well. It seemed almost too good to be true. I wondered if there was a trap, if the stones were so contrived as to tip over when a weight was placed on them, but I tried a good many with my own weight and with my stick, and all seemed, and actually were, perfectly firm. Of course, I resolved that Brown and I would make an experiment that very night. I was well prepared. Knowing the sort of place I should have to explore, I had brought a sufficiency of good rope and bands of webbing to surround my body, and crossbars to hold to as well as lanterns and candles and crowbars, all of which would go into a single carpet-bag and excite no suspicion. I satisfied myself that my rope would be long enough, and that the wheel for the bucket was in good working order, and then we went home to dinner. I had a little cautious conversation with the landlord, and made out that he would not be over much surprised if I went out for a stroll with my man about nine o'clock, to make heaven forgive me, a sketch of the abbey by moonlight. I asked no questions about the well, and am not likely to do so now. I fancy I know as much about it as anyone in Steinfeld, at least 
with a strong shudder. I don't want to know any more. Now we come to the crisis, and though I hate to think of it, I feel sure, Gregory, that it will be better for me in all ways to recall it just as it happened. We started, Brown and I, at about nine with our bag, and attracted no attention, for we managed to slip out at the hinder end of the inn-yard, which brought us quite to the edge of the village. In five minutes we were at the well, and for some little time we sat on the edge of the well-head to make sure that no one was stirring or spying on us. All we heard was some horses cropping grass out of sight further down the eastern slope. We were perfectly unobserved, and had plenty of light from the gorgeous full moon to allow us to get the rope properly fitted over the wheel. Then I secured the band round my body beneath the arms. We attached the end of the rope very securely to a ring in the stonework. Brown took the lighted lantern and followed me. I had a crowbar. And so we began to descend cautiously, feeling every step before we set foot on it, and scanning the walls in search of any marked stone. Half aloud I counted the steps as we went down, and we got as far as the thirty-eighth before I noticed anything at all irregular in the surface of the masonry. Even here there was no mark, and I began to feel very blank and to wonder if the abbot's cryptogram could possibly be an elaborate hoax. At the forty-ninth step the staircase ceased. It was with a very sinking heart that I began retracing my steps, and when I was back on the thirty-eighth, brown with the lantern being a step or two above me, I scrutinized the little bit of irregularity in the stonework with all of my might, but there was no vestige of a mark. Then it struck me that the texture of the surface looked just a little smoother than the rest, or at least in some way different. It might possibly be cement, and not stone. I gave it a good blow with my iron bar. There was a decidedly hollow sound, though that might be the result of our being in a well. But there was more. A great flake of cement dropped onto my feet, and I saw marks on the stone underneath. I had tracked the abbot down, my dear Gregory. Even now I think of it with a certain pride. It took but a very few more taps to clear the whole of the cement away, and I saw a slab of stone about two feet square, upon which was engraven a cross. Disappointment again, but only for a moment. It was you, Brown, who reassured me by a casual remark. You said, if I remember right, it's a funny cross, looks like a lot of eyes. I snatched the lantern out of your hand and saw with inexpressible pleasure that the cross was composed of seven eyes, four in a vertical line, three horizontal. The last of the scrolls in the window was explained in the way I had anticipated. Here was my stone with the seven eyes. So far the abbot's data had been exact, and as I thought of this, the anxiety about the guardian returned upon me with increased force. Still, I wasn't going to retreat now. Without giving myself time to think, I knocked away the cement all round the marked stone, and then gave it a prize on the right side with my crowbar. It moved at once, and I saw that it was but a thin light slab, such as I could easily lift out myself, and that it stopped the entrance to a cavity. I did lift it out unbroken and set it on the step, for it might be very important to us to be able to replace it. Then I waited for several minutes on the step just above. I don't know why, but I think to see if any dreadful thing would rush out. Nothing happened. Next, I lit a candle, and very cautiously I placed it inside the cavity, with some idea of seeing whether there were foul air, and of getting a glimpse of what was inside. There was some foulness of air which very nearly extinguished the flame, but in no long time it burned quite steadily. The hole went some little way back, and also on the right and left of the entrance, and I could see some rounded light-coloured objects within, which might be bags. There was no use in waiting. I faced the cavity and looked in. There was nothing immediately in the front of the hole. I put my arm and felt to the right very gingerly. Just give me a glass of cognac, Brown. I'll go on in a moment, Gregory. Well, I felt to the right, and my fingers touched something curved that felt, yes, more or less like leather, dampish it was, and evidently part of a heavy, full thing. 
There was nothing, I must say, to alarm one. I grew bolder, and putting both hands in as well as I could, I pulled it to me, and it came. It was heavy, but moved more easily than I had expected. As I pulled it towards the entrance, my left elbow knocked over and extinguished the candle. I got the thing fairly in front of the mouth and began drawing it out. Just then, Brown gave a sharp ejaculation and ran quickly up the steps with the lantern. He'll tell you why in a moment. Startled as I was, I looked round after him and saw him stand for a minute at the top and then walk away a few yards. Then I heard him call softly, All right, sir, and went on pulling out the great bag in complete darkness. It hung for an instant on the edge of the hole, then slipped forward onto my chest and put its arms round my neck. My dear Gregory, I'm telling you the exact truth. I believe I am now acquainted with the extremity of terror and repulsion which a man can endure without losing his mind. I can only just manage to tell you now the bare outline of the experience. I was conscious of a most horrible smell of mould, and of a cold kind of face pressed against my own, and moving slowly over it, and of several I don't know how many legs or arms or tentacles or something clinging to my body. I screamed out, Brown says, like a beast, and fell away backwards from the step on which I stood, and the creature slipped downwards, I suppose, onto that same step. Providentially the band round me held firm. Brown did not lose his head and was strong enough to pull me up to the top and get me over the edge quite promptly. How he managed it exactly I don't know, and I think he would find it hard to tell you. I believe he contrived to hide our implements in the deserted building nearby, and with very great difficulty he got me back to the inn. I was in no state to make explanations, and Brown knows no German. But next morning I told the people some tale of having had a bad fall in the abbey ruins, which I suppose they believed. And now before I go further I should just like you to hear what Brown's experiences during those few minutes were. Tell the rector, Brown, what you told me. Well, sir, said Brown, speaking low and nervously, it was just this way. Master was busy down in front of the hole, and I was holding the lantern and looking on, when I heard something drop in the water from the top, as I thought. So I looked up, and I see someone's head looking over at us. I suppose I must have said something, and I held the light up and ran up the steps, and my light shone right on the face. That was a bad one, sir, if ever I see one a holdish man, and the face very much fell in and laughing as I thought. And I got up the steps as quick pretty nigh as I'm telling you, when I was out on the ground there weren't a sign of any person. There hadn't been the time for anyone to get away, let alone a hold chap, and I made sure he weren't crouching down by the well nor nothing. Next thing I hear Master cry out something horrible, and all I see was him hanging out by the rope, and as Master says, however I got him up I couldn't tell you. "'You hear that, Gregory?' said Mr. Summerton. "'Now, does any explanation of that incident strike you?' "'The whole thing is so ghastly and abnormal "'that I must own it puts me quite off my balance. "'But the thought did occur to me that possibly the— "'well, the person who set the trap "'might have come to see the success of his plan.' "'Just so, Gregory, just so. "'I can think of nothing else, so—' likely, I should say, if such a word had a place anywhere in my story. I think it must have been the abbot. Well, I haven't got much more to tell you. I spent a miserable night, Brown sitting up with me. Next day I was no better, unable to get up, no doctor to be had, and if one had been available I doubt if he could have done much for me. I made Brown write off to you, and spent a second terrible night, and Gregory, of this I am sure, and I think it affected me more than the first shock, for it lasted longer. There was someone or something on the watch outside my door the whole night. I almost fancy there were two. It wasn't only the faint noises I heard from time to time all through the dark hours, but there was the smell, the hideous smell of mould. Every rag I had on me on that first evening I had stripped off and made Brown take it away. I believe he stuffed the things into the stove in his room. And yet the smell was there, as intense as it had been in the well, and what is more, it came from outside the door. But 
With the first glimmer of dawn it faded out, and the sounds ceased too, and that convinced me that the thing or things were creatures of darkness, and could not stand the daylight, and so I was sure that if anyone could put back the stone, it or they would be powerless until someone else took it away again. I had to wait until you came to get that done. Of course I couldn't send Brown to do it by himself, and still less could I tell anyone who belonged to the place. Well, there is my story, and if you don't believe it, I can't help it, but I think you do. Indeed, said Mr. Gregory, I can find no alternative. I must believe it. I saw the well and the stone myself, and had a glimpse, I thought, of the bags or something else in the hole. And to be plain with you, Summerton, I believe my door was watched last night, too. I dare say it was, Gregory, but thank goodness that is over. Have you, by the way, anything to tell about your visit to that dreadful place? Very little, was the answer. Brown and I managed easily enough to get the slab into its place, and he fixed it very firmly with the irons and wedges you had desired him to get, and we contrived to smear the surface with mud, so that it looks just like the rest of the wall. One thing I did notice in the carving on the wellhead, which I think must have escaped you, it was a horrid, grotesque shape, perhaps more like a toad than anything else, and there was a label by it inscribed with the two words, Depositum Custodi. Footnote. Translation. Keep that which is committed to thee. Return to text. End of The Treasure of Abbot Thomas The Last Story in Volume 1 of Ghost Stories of an Antiquary by M. R. James This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. Recorded by Peter Yearsley. Ghost Stories of an Antiquary, Part 2, by M. R. James. Author's Preface to Volume 2. The first six of the seven tales were Christmas productions, the very first, a school story, having been made up for the benefit of King's College Choir School. The stalls of Barchester Cathedral was printed in Contemporary Review. Mr. Humphreys and His Inheritance was written to fill up the volume. In a school story, I had Temple Grove East Sheen in mind. In the Tractate Midoth, Cambridge University Library. In Martin's Close, Sampford Courtney in Devon, the Cathedral of Barchester, is a blend of Canterbury, Salisbury, and Hereford. End of preface. A school story. Two men in a smoking room were talking of their private school days. At our school, said A, we had a ghost's footmark on the staircase. What was it like? Oh, very unconvincing. Just the shape of a shoe with a square toe, if I remember right. The staircase was a stone one. I never heard any story about the thing. That seems odd when you come to think of it. Why didn't someone invent one, I wonder? You never can tell with little boys. They have a mythology of their own. There's a subject for you, by the way, the folklore of private schools. Yes, yeah, the crop is rather scanty, though. I imagine, if you were to investigate the cycle of ghost stories, for instance, which the boys at private schools tell each other, they would all turn out to be highly compressed versions of stories out of books. Nowadays the Strand and Pearsons and so on would be extensively drawn upon. No doubt. They weren't born or thought of in my time. Let's see. I wonder if I can remember the staple ones that I was told. First, there was the house with a room in which a series of people insisted on passing a night, and 
each of them in the morning was found kneeling in a corner and had just time to say, I've seen it, and died. Wasn't that the house in Berkeley Square? I dare say it was. Then it was the man who heard a noise in the passage at night, opened his door, and saw someone crawling towards him on all fours with his eye hanging out on his cheek. Um, there was besides, let me think, yes, the room where a man was found dead in bed with a horseshoe mark on his forehead, and the floor under the bed was covered with marks of horseshoes also. I don't know why. Also, there was, uh, the lady who, on locking her bedroom door in a strange house, heard a thin voice among the bed curtains say, Now we're shut in for the night. None of those had any explanations or sequel. I wonder if they uh, go on still, those stories. Oh, likely enough, with additions from the magazines, as I said. You never heard, did you, of a real ghost at a private school? I thought not. Nobody has that I ever came across. From the way in which you said that, I gather that you have. I really don't know. But this is what was in my mind. It happened at my private school thirty-odd years ago, and I haven't any explanation of it. The school, I mean, was near London. It was established in a large and fairly old house, a great white building with very fine grounds about it. There were large cedars in the garden as there are in so many of the older gardens in the Thames Valley, and ancient elms in the three or four fields which we used for our games. I think probably it was quite an attractive place, but boys seldom allow that their schools possess any tolerable features. I came to the school in a September soon after the year 1870, and among the boys who arrived on the same day was one whom I took to, a Highland boy, whom I'll call MacLeod. I needn't spend time in describing him. The main thing is that I got to know him very well. He was not an exceptional boy in any way, not particularly good at books or games, but he suited me. The school was a large one. There must have been from 120 to 130 boys there, as a rule, and so a considerable staff of masters was required, and there were rather frequent changes among them. One term, perhaps it was my third or fourth, a new master made his appearance. His name was Sampson. He was a tallish, stoutish, pale, black-bearded man. I think we liked him. He had travelled a good deal, and had stories which amused us on our school walks, so that there was some competition among us to get within earshot of him. I remember too, oh dear me, I have hardly thought of it since then that he had a charm on his watch-chain that attracted my attention one day, and he let me examine it. It was, I now suppose, a gold Byzantine coin. There was an effigy of some absurd emperor on one side. The other side had been worn practically smooth, and he had had cut on it, rather barbarously, his own initials, GWS, and a date, 24th of July, 1865. Yes, I can see it now. He told me he had picked it up in Constantinople. It was about the size of a florin, perhaps rather smaller. Well, the first odd thing that happened was this. Samson was doing Latin grammar with us. One of his favourite methods, perhaps it is rather a good one, was to make us construct sentences out of our own heads to illustrate the rules he was trying to make us learn. Of course, that is a thing which gives a silly boy a chance of being impertinent. There are lots of school stories in which that happens, or anyhow there might be. But Samson was too good a disciplinarian for us to think of trying that on with him. Now, on this occasion, he was telling us how to express remembering in Latin, and he ordered us each to make a sentence beginning in the verb memini, I remember. Well, most of us made up some ordinary sentence, such as, I remember my father, or he remembers his book, or something equally uninteresting. And I dare say a good many put down, Memino librum meum, and so forth. But the boy I mentioned, MacLeod, was evidently thinking of something more elaborate than that. The rest of us wanted to have our sentences passed, and get on to something else, so some kicked him under the desk 
and I, who was next to him, poked him and whispered to him to look sharp. But he didn't seem to attend. I looked at his paper and saw that he had put down nothing at all. So I jogged him again harder than before and upbraided him sharply for keeping us all waiting. That did have some effect. He started and seemed to wake up, and then very quickly he scribbled about a couple of lines on his paper and showed it up with the rest. As it was the last, or nearly the last, to come in, and as Samson had a good deal to say to the boys who had written Memeniscimus Patri Mayo and the rest of it, it turned out that the clock struck twelve before he had got to MacLeod, and MacLeod had to wait afterwards to have his sentence corrected. There was nothing much going on outside when I got out, so I waited for him to come. He came very slowly when he did arrive, and I guessed there had been some sort of trouble. Well, I said, what did you get? Oh, I don't know, said MacLeod. Nothing much, but I think Samson's rather sick with me. Why? Did you show him up some rot? No fear, he said. It was all right as far as I could see. It was like this. Memento? That's right enough for remember, and it takes a genitive. Memento putei interquatuor taxos. What silly rot, I said. What made you shove that down? What does it mean? That's the funny part, said MacLeod. I'm not quite sure what it does mean. All I know is it just came into my head and I corked it down. I know what I think it means, because just before I wrote it down I had a sort of picture of it in my head. I believe it means, remember the well among the four, what are those dark sort of trees that have red berries on them? Mountain ashes, I suppose you mean. I never heard of them, said MacLeod. No, I'll tell you. Yews. Well, and what did Samson say? Why, he was jolly odd about it. When he read it, he got up and went to the mantelpiece and stopped quite a long time without saying anything, with his back to me. And then he said, without turning round and rather quiet, What do you suppose that means? I told him what I thought, only I couldn't remember the name of the silly tree. And then he wanted to know why I put it down, and I had to say something or other. And after that, he left off talking about it and asked me how long I'd been here, and where my people lived, and things like that. And then I came away, but he wasn't looking a bit well. I don't remember any more that was said by either of us about this. Next day, MacLeod took to his bed with a chill or something of the kind, and it was a week or more before he was in school again. And as much as a month went by, without anything happening that was noticeable, whether or not Mr. Sampson was really startled, as MacLeod had thought, he didn't show it. I'm pretty sure, of course, now, that there was something very curious in his past history, but I'm not going to pretend that we boys were sharp enough to guess any such thing. There was one other incident of the same kind as the last which I told you. Several times since that day we had had to make up examples in school to illustrate different rules but there had never been any row except when we did them wrong. At last there came a day when we were going through those dismal things which people call conditional sentences, and we were told to make a conditional sentence expressing a future consequence. We did it, right or wrong, and showed up our bits of paper, and Samson began looking through them. All at once he got up, made some odd sort of noise in his throat, and rushed out by a door that was just by his desk. We sat there for a minute or two, and then, I suppose it was incorrect, but we went up, I and one or two others, to look at the papers on his desk. Of course, I thought someone must have put down some nonsense or other, and Samson had gone off to report him. All the same, I noticed that he hadn't taken any of the papers with him when he ran out. Well, the top paper on the desk was written in red ink, which no one used, and it wasn't in anyone's hand who was in the class. They all looked at it, MacLeod and all, and took their dying oaths that it wasn't theirs. Then I thought of counting the bits of paper, and of this I made quite certain that there were seventeen bits of paper on the desk, and sixteen boys in the form. Well, I bagged the extra paper and kept it, and I believe I have it now. And now you will want to know what was written on it. 
It was simple enough and harmless enough, I should have said. Si tu non veneris ad me, ego veniam ad te. Which means, I suppose, if you don't come to me, I'll come to you. Could you show me the paper? interrupted the listener. Yes, I could. But there's another odd thing about it. That same afternoon, I took it out of my locker. I know for certain it was the same bit, for I made a finger mark on it. And no single trace of writing of any kind was there on it. I kept it, as I said, and since that time I've tried various experiments to see whether sympathetic ink had been used, but absolutely without result. So much for that. After about half an hour, Samson looked in again, said that he had felt very unwell, and told us we might go. He came rather gingerly to his desk and gave just one look at the uppermost paper, and I suppose he thought he must have been dreaming. Anyhow, he asked no questions. That day was a half-holiday, and next day Samson was in school again, much as usual. That night the third and last incident in my story happened. We, MacLeod and I, slept in a dormitory at right angles to the main building. Samson slept in the main building, on the first floor. There was a very bright full moon. At an hour, which I can't tell exactly, but some time between one and two, I was woken up by somebody shaking me. It was MacLeod, and the nice state of mind he seemed to be in. Come, he said. Come, there's a burglar getting in through Samson's window. As soon as I could speak, I said, "'Well, why not call out and wake everyone up?' "'No, no,' he said. "'I'm not sure who it is. Don't make a row. Come and look.' Naturally I came and looked, and naturally there was no one there. I was cross enough, and should have called MacLeod plenty of names. Only, I couldn't tell why, it seemed to me that there was something wrong, something that made me very glad I wasn't alone to face it. We were still at the window, looking out and as soon as I could, I asked him what he had heard or seen. "'I didn't hear anything at all,' he said. "'But about five minutes before I woke you, I found myself looking out of this window here, and there was a man sitting or kneeling on Samson's window-sill, and looking in, and I thought he was beckoning. "'What sort of man?' MacLeod wriggled. "'I don't know,' he said. "'But I can tell you one thing. He was beastly thin, and he looked as if he was wet all over.' And, he said, looking round and whispering, as if he hardly liked to hear himself, I'm not at all sure that he was alive. We went on talking in whispers some time longer, and eventually crept back to bed. No one else in the room woke or stirred the whole time. I believe we did sleep a bit afterwards, but we were very cheap next day. And next day Mr. Sampson was gone, not to be found and I believe no trace of him has ever come to light since. In thinking it over, one of the oddest things about it all has seemed to me to be the fact that neither MacLeod nor I ever mentioned what we had seen to any third person whatever. Of course, no questions were asked on the subject, and if they had been, I'm inclined to believe that we could not have made any answer. We seemed unable to speak about it. That is my story, said the narrator. The only approach to a ghost story connected with a school that I know, but still I think an approach to such a thing. The sequel to this may perhaps be reckoned highly conventional, but a sequel there is, and so it must be produced. There had been more than one listener to the story, and in the latter part of that same year, or of the next, one such listener was staying at a country house in Ireland. One evening his host was turning over a drawer full of odds and ends in the smoking room. Suddenly he put his hand upon a little box. Now, he said, you know about old things. Tell me what that is. My friend opened the little box and found in it a thin gold chain with an object attached to it. He glanced at the object and then took off his spectacles to examine it more narrowly. What's the history of this? he asked. Odd enough, was the answer. You know the yew thicket in the shrubbery? Well, a year or two back we were cleaning out the old well that used to be in the clearing here, 
and what do you suppose we found? Is it possible that you found a body? said the visitor with an odd feeling of nervousness. We did that, but what's more, in every sense of the word, we found two. Good heavens, two? Was there anything to show how they got there? Was this thing found with them? It was, among the rags of the clothes that were on one of the bodies. A bad business, whatever the story of it may have been. One body had the arms tight round the other. They must have been there thirty years or more. Long enough before we came to this place. You may judge we filled the well up fast enough. Do you make anything of what's cut on that gold coin you have there? I think I can, said my friend, holding it to the light. But he read it without much difficulty. It seems to be G.W.S., 24th of July, 1865. The End of A School Story From Ghost Stories of an Antiquary, Part 2, by M. R. James This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Yearsley. Ghost Stories of an Antiquary by M. R. James. The Rose Garden. Mr. and Mrs. Anstruther were at breakfast in the parlour of Westfield Hall in the county of Essex. They were arranging plans for the day. "'George,' said Mrs. Anstruther, "'I think you had better take the car to Malden, and see if you can get any of those knitted things I was speaking about which would do for my stall at the bazaar.' "'Oh, well, if you wish it, Mary, of course I can do that. But I had half arranged to play around with Geoffrey Williamson this morning. The bazaar isn't till Thursday of next week, is it?' "'What has that to do with it, George? "'I should have thought you would have guessed "'that if I can't get to the things I want in Malden, "'I shall have to write to all manner of shops in town, "'and they are certain to send something "'quite unsuitable in price or quality the first time. "'If you have actually made an appointment with Mr. Williamson, "'you had better keep it. "'But I must say I think you might have let me know.' "'Oh, no, no, it wasn't really an appointment. "'I quite see what you mean. "'I'll go. "'And what shall you do yourself?' "'Why, when the work of the house is arranged for, "'I must see about laying out my new rose garden. "'By the way, before you start for Malden, "'I wish you would just take Collins "'to look at the place I fixed upon. "'You know it, of course.' "'Well, I'm not quite sure that I do, Mary. "'Is it at the upper end, towards the village?' "'Good gracious, no, my dear George. "'I thought I had made that quite clear. "'No, it's that small clearing just off the shrubbery path "'that goes towards the church.' "'Oh, yes. "'Where we were saying there must have been a summer-house once, "'the place with the old seat and the posts. "'But do you think there's enough sun there?' "'My dear George, do allow me some common sense, "'and don't credit me with all your ideas about summer-houses.' "'Yes, there will be plenty of sun "'when we have got rid of some of those box-bushes. "'I know what you're going to say, "'and I have as little wish as you to strip the place bare. "'All I want Collins to do "'is to clear away the old seats "'and the posts and things "'before I come out in an hour's time, "'and I hope you will manage to get off fairly soon. "'After luncheon, "'I think I shall go on with my sketch of the church, "'and if you please, you can go over to the links, or... "'Ah, a good idea.' "'Very good. Yes, you finish that sketch, Mary, and I shall be glad of a round. "'I was going to say you might call on the bishop, "'but I suppose it is no use my making any suggestion. "'And now do be getting ready, or half the morning will be gone.' "'Mr. Anstruther's face, which had shown symptoms of lengthening, "'shortened itself again, and he hurried from the room, "'and was soon heard giving orders in the passage. "'Mrs. Anstruther, a stately dame of some fifty summers, proceeded, after a second consideration of the morning's letters, to her housekeeping. Within a few minutes, 
Mr. Anstruther had discovered Collins in the greenhouse, and they were on their way to the site of the projected rose garden. I do not know much about the conditions most suitable to these nurseries, but I am inclined to believe that Mrs. Anstruther, though in the habit of describing herself as a great gardener, had not been well advised in the selection of a spot for the purpose. It was a small, dank clearing, bounded on one side by a path, and on the other by thick box bushes, laurels, and other evergreens. The ground was almost bare of grass, and dark of aspect. Remains of rustic seats and an old and corrugated oak post somewhere near the middle of the clearing had given rise to Mr. Anstruther's conjecture that a summer-house had once stood there. Clearly Collins had not been put in possession of his mistress's intentions with regard to this plot of ground, and when he learnt them from Mr. Anstruther he displayed no enthusiasm. "'Of course I could clear them seats away soon enough,' he said. "'They aren't no ornament to the place, Mr. Anstruther, and rotten too. Look here, sir,' and he broke off a large piece. "'Rotten right through.' "'Yes, clear them away, to be sure we can do that.' "'And the post,' said Mr. Anstruther. "'That's got to go, too.' Collins advanced and shook the post with both hands. Then he rubbed his chin. "'That's firm in the ground, that post is,' he said. "'That's been there a number of years, Mr. Anstruther. "'I doubt I shan't get that up, "'not quite so soon as what I can do with them seats.' "'But your mistress specially wishes it to be got out of the way in an hour's time,' said Mr. Anstruther. Collins smiled, and shook his head slowly. "'You'll excuse me, sir, but you feel of it for yourself.' "'No, sir. No one can't do what's impossible to em, can they, sir? I could get that post up by after tea-time, sir. But that'll want a lot of digging. What you require, you see, sir, if you'll excuse me naming of it, you want the soil loosening round this post here, and me and the boy, we should take a little time doing of that. But now, these here seats, said Collins, appearing to appropriate this portion of the scheme as due to his own resourcefulness. Why, I can get the barrow round, and have them cleared away in, why, less than an hour's time from now, if you'll permit of it, only... Only what, Collins? Well, now, ain't for me to go against orders no more than what it is for you yourself, or, or anyone else. This was added somewhat hurriedly. But if you'll pardon me, sir, this ain't the place I should have picked out for no rose garden myself. Why, look at them box and Laurestinus. How they regular preclude the light from... Ah, yes, but we've got to get rid of some of them, of course. Oh, indeed, get rid of them. Yes, to be sure, but... I beg your pardon, Mr. Anstruther. I'm sorry, Collins, but I must be getting on now. I hear the car at the door. Your mistress will explain exactly what she wishes. I'll tell her, then, that you can see your way to clearing away the seats at once, and the post this afternoon. Good morning. Collins was left rubbing his chin. Mrs. Anstruther received the report with some discontent, but did not insist upon any change of plan. By four o'clock that afternoon she had dismissed her husband to his golf, had dealt faithfully with Collins and with the other duties of the day, and having sent a campstool and umbrella to the proper spot, had just settled down to her sketch of the church, as seen from the shrubbery, when a maid came hurrying down the path to report that Miss Wilkins had called. Miss Wilkins was one of the few remaining members of the family from whom the Anstruthers had brought the Westfield estate some few years back. She had been staying in the neighbourhood, and this was probably a farewell visit. "'Perhaps you could ask Miss Wilkins to join me here,' said Mrs. Anstruther, and soon Miss Wilkins, a person of mature years, approached. "'Yes, I'm leaving the ashes to-morrow, and I shall be able to tell my brother how tremendously you have improved the place. Of course, he can't help regretting the old house just a little, as I do myself, but the garden is really delightful now. I am so glad you can say so. But you mustn't think we've finished our improvements. Let me show you where I mean to put a rose garden. It's close by here. The details of the project were laid before Miss Wilkins at some length, but her thoughts were evidently elsewhere. Yes, delightful, she said at last, rather absently. 
But do you know, Mrs. Anstruther, I'm afraid I was thinking of old times. I'm very glad to have seen just this spot again before you altered it. Frank and I had quite a romance about this place. Yes, said Mrs. Anstruther, smilingly. Do tell me what it was. Something quaint and charming, I'm sure. Not so very charming, but it has always seemed to me curious. Neither of us would ever be here alone when we were children, and I'm not sure that I should care about it now in certain moods. It is one of those things that can hardly be put into words, by me at least, and that sound rather foolish if they are not properly expressed. I can tell you, after a fashion, what it was that gave us, well, almost a horror of the place when we were alone. It was towards the evening of one very hot autumn day, when Frank had disappeared mysteriously about the grounds, and I was looking for him to fetch him to tea, and going down this path I suddenly saw him not hiding in the bushes as I rather expected, but sitting on the bench in the old summer-house. There was a wooden summer-house here, you know, up in the corner, asleep, but with such a dreadful look on his face that I really thought he must be ill, or even dead. I rushed at him and shook him, and told him to wake up. And wake up he did, with a scream. I assure you, the poor boy seemed almost beside himself with fright. He hurried me away to the house, and was in a terrible state all that night, hardly sleeping. Someone had to sit up with him, as far as I remember. He was better very soon, but for days I couldn't get him to say why he had been in such a condition. It came out at last that he had really been asleep, and had had a very odd, disjointed sort of dream. He never saw much of what was around him, but he felt the scenes, most vividly. First he made out that he was standing in a large room, with a number of people in it, and that someone was opposite to him, who was very powerful, and he was being asked questions which he felt to be very important, and whenever he answered them, someone, either the person opposite to him or someone else in the room, seemed to be, as he said, making something up against him. All the voices sounded to him very distant, but he remembered bits of the things that were said. Where were you on the 19th of October? And is this your handwriting? And so on. I can see now, of course, that he was dreaming of some trial, but we were never allowed to see the papers, and it was odd that a boy of eight should have such a vivid idea of what went on in a court. All the time he felt, he said, the most intense anxiety and oppression and hopelessness, though I don't suppose he used such words as that to me. Then after that there was an interval in which he remembered being dreadfully restless and miserable. And then there came another sort of picture when he was aware that he had come out of doors on a dark, raw morning with a little snow about. It was in a street, or at any rate among houses, and he felt that there were numbers and numbers of people there too, and that he was taken up some creaking wooden steps and stood on a sort of platform, but the only thing he could actually see was a small fire burning somewhere near him. Someone who had been holding his arm left hold of it and went towards this fire, and then he said the fright he was in was worse than at any other part of his dream, and if I had not wakened him he didn't know what would have become of him. A curious dream for a child to have, wasn't it? Well, so much for that. It must have been later in the year that Frank and I were here, and I was sitting in the arbour just about sunset. I noticed the sun was going down, and told Frank to run in and see if tea was ready while I finished a chapter in the book I was reading. Frank was away longer than I expected, and the light was going so fast that I had to bend over my book to make it out. All at once 
I became conscious that someone was whispering to me inside the arbor. The only words I could distinguish, or thought I could, were something like, Pull, pull. I'll push, you pull. I started up in something of a fright. The voice, it was little more than a whisper, sounded so hoarse and angry, and yet as if it came from a long, long way off, just as it had done in Frank's dream. But though I was startled, I had enough courage to look round and try to make out where the sound came from. And this sounds very foolish, I know, but still it is the fact. I made sure that it was strongest when I put my ear to an old post, which was part of the end of the seat. I was so certain of this that I remembered making some marks on the post, as deep as I could with the scissors out of my work-basket. I don't know why. I wonder, by the way, whether that isn't the very post itself. Well, yes, it might be. There are marks and scratches on it. But one can't be sure. Anyhow, it was just like the post you have there. My father got to know that both of us had had a fright in the arbour, and he went down there himself one evening after dinner, and the arbour was pulled down at very short notice. I recollect hearing my father talking about it to an old man who used to do odd jobs in the place, and the old man saying, Don't you fear for that, sir. He's fast enough in there, without no one don't take and let him out. But when I asked who it was, I could get no satisfactory answer. Possibly my father or mother might have told me more about it when I grew up. But, as you know, they both died when we were still quite children. I must say, it has always seemed very odd to me, and I've often asked the older people in the village whether they knew of anything strange. But either they knew nothing, or they wouldn't tell me. Dear, dear, how I have been boring you with my childish remembrances. But indeed that arbour did absorb our thoughts quite remarkably for a time. You can fancy, can't you, the kind of stories that we made up for ourselves. Well, dear Miss Anstruther, I must be leaving you now. We shall meet in town this winter, I hope, shan't we? Etc., etc. The seats and the post were cleared away and uprooted, respectively, by that evening. Late summer weather is proverbially treacherous, and during dinner-time Mrs. Collins sent up to ask for a little brandy because her husband had took a nasty chill, and she was afraid he would not be able to do much the next day. Mrs. Anstruther's morning reflections were not wholly placid. She was sure some roughs had got into the plantation during the night. And another thing, George. The moment that Collins is about again, you must tell him to do something about the owls. I never heard anything like them, and I'm positive one came and perched somewhere just outside our window. If it had come in, I should have been out of my wits. It must have been a very large bird from its voice. Didn't you hear it? No, of course not. You were sound asleep as usual. Still, I must say, George, you don't look as if your night had done you much good. My dear, I feel as if another of the same would turn me silly. You have no idea of the dreams I had. I couldn't speak of them when I woke up, and if this room wasn't so bright and sunny, I shouldn't care to think of them even now. Well, really, George, that isn't very common with you, I must say. You must have... No, you only had what I had yesterday, unless you had tea at that wretched clubhouse, did you? No, no, nothing but a cup of tea and some bread and butter. I should really like to know how I came to put my dream together, as I suppose one does put one's dream together from a lot of little things one has been seeing or reading. Look here, Mary, it was like this, if I shan't be boring you. I wish to hear what it was, George. I will tell you when I have had enough. All right. I must tell you that it wasn't like other nightmares in one way, because I didn't really see anyone who spoke to me or touched me. And yet I was most fearfully impressed with the reality of it all. First, I was sitting, no, no, moving about, in an old-fashioned sort of panelled room. I remember there was a fireplace, and a lot of burnt papers in it, and I was in a great state of anxiety about something. There was someone else, a servant, I suppose, because I remember saying to him, Horses, as quick as you can, and then waiting a bit, 
and next I heard several people coming upstairs, and a noise like spurs on a boarded floor, and then the door opened, and whatever it was that I was expecting happened. Yes, but what was that? You see, I couldn't tell. It was the sort of shock that upsets you in a dream. You either wake up, or else everything goes black. That was what happened to me. Then I was in a big, dark-walled room, panelled, I think, like the other, and a number of people, and I was evidently standing your trial, I suppose, George? Goodness, yes, Mary, I was. But did you dream that, too? How very odd. No, no, I didn't get enough sleep for that. Go on, George, and I will tell you afterwards. Yes, well, I was being tried, for my life I've no doubt, from the state I was in. I had no one speaking for me, and somewhere there was a most fearful fellow, on the bench, I should have said, only that he seemed to be pitching into me most unfairly, and twisting everything I said, and asking most abominable questions. What about? Why, dates when I was at particular places, and letters I was supposed to have written, and why I had destroyed some papers, and I recollect his laughing at answers I made, in a way that quite daunted me. It doesn't sound much, but I can tell you, Mary, it was really appalling at the time. I'm quite certain there was such a man once, and a most horrible villain he must have been. The things he said! Thank you. I have no wish to hear them. I can go to the links any day myself. How did it end? Oh, against me. He saw to that. I do wish, Mary, I could give you a notion of the strain that came after that, and seemed to me to last for days, waiting and waiting, and sometimes writing things I knew to be enormously important to me, and waiting for answers, and none coming. And after that, I came out, ah, what makes you say that? Do you know what sort of thing I saw? Was it a dark, cold day, and snow in the streets, and a fire burning somewhere near you? By George, it was. You have had the same nightmare. Really not? Well, it is the oddest thing. Yes, I've no doubt it was an execution for high treason. I know I was laid on straw, and jolted along most wretchedly, and then had to go up some steps, and someone was holding my arm, and I remember seeing a bit of a ladder, and hearing a sound of a lot of people. I really don't think I could bear now to go into a crowd of people, and hear the noise they make talking. However, mercifully, I didn't get to the real business. The dream passed off with a sort of thunder inside my head. But, Mary, I know what you're going to ask. I suppose this is an instance of a kind of thought-reading. Miss Wilkins called yesterday, and told me of a dream her brother had as a child when they lived here. And something did, no doubt, make me think of that when I was awake last night, listening to those horrible owls, and those men talking and laughing in the shrubbery. By the way, I wish you would see if they have done any damage, and speak to the police about it. And so, I suppose, from my brain it must have got into yours while you were asleep. Curious, no doubt, and I am sorry it gave you such a bad night. You had better be as much in the fresh air as you can today. Oh, it's all right now, but I think I will go over to the lodge and see if I can get a game with any of them. And you? I have enough to do for this morning, and this afternoon, if I am not interrupted, there is my drawing. To be sure, I want to see that finished very much. No damage was discoverable in the shrubbery. Mr. Anstruther surveyed with faint interest the site of the rose garden, where the uprooted post still lay, and the hole it had occupied remained unfilled. Collins, upon inquiry made, proved to be better, but quite unable to come to his work. He expressed, by the mouth of his wife, a hope that he hadn't done nothing wrong clearing away them things. Mrs. Collins added that there was a lot of talking people in Westfield, and the whole ones was the worst. Seemed to think everything of them having been in the parish longer than what other people had. But as to what they said, 
no more could then be ascertained than that it had quite upset Collins, and was a lot of nonsense. Recruited by lunch and a brief period of slumber, Mrs. Anstruther settled herself comfortably upon her sketching chair in the path leading through the shrubbery to the side gate of the churchyard. Trees and buildings were among her favourite subjects, and here she had good studies of both. She worked hard, and the drawing was becoming a really pleasant thing to look upon by the time that the wooded hills to the west had shut off the sun. Still she would have persevered, but the light changed rapidly, and it became obvious that the last touches must be added on the morrow. She rose and turned towards the house, pausing for a time to take delight in the limpid green western sky. Then she passed on between the dark box bushes, and at a point just before the path debouched on the lawn, she stopped once again and considered the quiet evening landscape, and made a mental note that that must be the tower of one of the roothing churches that one caught on the skyline. Then a bird, perhaps, rustled in the box-bush on her left, and she turned, and started at seeing what at first she took to be a fifth of November mask, peeping out among the branches. She looked closer. It was not a mask. It was a face, large, smooth, and pink. She remembers the minute drops of perspiration which were starting from its forehead. She remembers how the jaws were clean-shaven and the eyes shut. She remembers also, and with an accuracy which makes the thought intolerable to her, how the mouth was open and a single tooth appeared below the upper lip. As she looked, the face receded into the darkness of the bush. The shelter of the house was gained, and the door shut, before she collapsed. Mr. and Mrs. Anstruther had been for a week or more recruiting at Brighton, before they received a circular from the Essex Archaeological Society, and a query as to whether they possessed certain historical portraits, which it was desired to include in the forthcoming work on Essex portraits to be published under the Society's auspices. There was an accompanying letter from the Secretary, which contained the following passage. We are specially anxious to know whether you possess the original of the engraving of which I enclose a photograph. It represents Sir blank, blank, Lord Chief Justice under Charles II, who, as you doubtless know, retired after his disgrace to Westfield, and is supposed to have died there of remorse. It may interest you to hear that a curious entry has recently been found in the registers, not of Westfield, but of Prior's Ruthing, to the effect that the parish was so much troubled after his death, that the rector of Westfield summoned the parsons of all the Ruthings to come and lay him, which they did. The entry ends by saying, The stake is in a field adjoining to the churchyard of Westfield, on the west side. Perhaps you can let us know if any tradition to this effect is current in your parish. The incidents which the enclosed photograph recalled were productive of a severe shock to Mrs. Anstruther. It was decided that she must spend the winter abroad. Mr. Anstruther, when he went down to Westfield to make the necessary arrangements, not unnaturally told his story to the rector, an old gentleman, who showed little surprise. Really, I had managed to piece out for myself very much what must have happened, partly from old people's talk, and partly from what I saw in your grounds. Of course, we have suffered to some extent also. Yes, it was bad at first, like owls, as you say, and men talking sometimes. One night it was in this garden, and at other times about several of the cottages. But lately there has been very little. I think it will die out. There is nothing in our registers except the entry of the burial, and what I, for a long time, took to be the family motto. But last time I looked at it, I noticed that it was added in a later hand, and had the initials of one of our rectors quite late in the seventeenth century, A. C. Augustine Crompton. Here it is, you see, Quieta non movere. I suppose, well, it is rather hard to say exactly what I do suppose. 
The End of The Rose Garden From Ghost Stories of an Antiquary By M. R. James This is a LibriVox recording. All the LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. Recorded by Peter Yearsley. Ghost Stories of an Antiquary by M. R. James. The Tractate Midos. Towards the end of an autumn afternoon, an elderly man with a thin face and grey Piccadilly weepers pushed open the swing door leading into the vestibule of a certain famous library, and, addressing himself to an attendant, stated that he believed he was entitled to use the library, and inquired if he might take a book out. Yes, if he were on the list of those to whom that privilege was given. He produced his card, Mr. John Eldred and, the register being consulted, a favourable answer was given. "'Now, another point,' said he. "'It is a long time since I was here, and I do not know my way about your building. Besides, it is near closing time, and it is bad for me to hurry up and downstairs. I have here the title of the book I want. Is there anyone at liberty who could go and find it for me?' After a moment's thought, the doorkeeper beckoned to a young man who was passing. "'Mr. Garrett,' he said, "'have you a minute to assist this gentleman?' "'With pleasure,' was Mr. Garrett's answer. The slip with the title was handed to him. "'I think I can put my hand on this. It happens to be in the class I inspected last quarter, but I'll just look it up in the catalogue to make sure. I suppose it is that particular edition that you require, sir?' "'Yes, if you please. That and no other,' said Mr. Eldred. "'I'm exceedingly obliged to you.' "'Don't mention it, I beg, sir,' said Mr. Garrett, and hurried off. "'I thought so,' he said to himself, when his finger, travelling down the pages of the catalogue, stopped at a particular entry. "'Talmud, Tractate Midoth, with the commentary of Nachmanides, Amsterdam, 1707. Eleven, three, thirty-four. Hebrew class, of course. Not a very difficult job, this.' Mr. Eldred, accommodated with a chair in the vestibule, awaited anxiously the return of his messenger, and his disappointment at seeing an empty-handed Mr. Garrett running down the staircase was very evident. "'I'm sorry to disappoint you, sir,' said the young man, "'but the book is out.' "'Oh, dear,' said Mr. Eldred, "'is that so? You are sure there can be no mistake?' "'I don't think there is much chance of it, sir, but it's possible if you like to wait a minute that you might meet the very gentleman that's got it. He must be leaving the library soon, and I think I saw him take that particular book out of the shelf. Indeed. You didn't recognize him, I suppose. Would it be one of the professors or one of the students? I don't think so. Certainly not a professor. I should have known him. But the light isn't very good in that part of the library at this time of day, and I didn't see his face. I should have said he was a shortish old gentleman, perhaps a clergyman, in a cloak. If you could wait, I can easily find out whether he wants the book very particularly. No, no, said Mr. Eldred. I won't. Uh, I can't wait now, thank you. No. I must be off, but I'll call again tomorrow if I may, and perhaps you could find out who has it. Certainly, sir. And I'll have the book ready for you if we. Uh... But Mr. Eldred was already off, and hurrying more than one would have thought wholesome for him. Garrett had a few moments to spare, and, thought he, I'll go back to that case and see if I can find the old man. Most likely he could put off using the book for a few days. I dare say the other one doesn't want to keep it for long. So off with him to the Hebrew class. But when he got there it was unoccupied, and the volume, marked 11334, was in its place on the shelf. It was vexatious to Garrett's self-respect to have disappointed an inquirer with so little reason, and he would have liked had it not been against library rules, to take the book down to the vestibule then and there, so that it might be ready for Mr. Eldred when he called. 
However, next morning he would be on the lookout for him, and he begged the doorkeeper to send and let him know when the moment came. As a matter of fact, he was himself in the vestibule when Mr. Eldred arrived, very soon after the library opened, and when hardly anyone beside the staff were in the building. "'I'm very sorry,' he said. "'It's not often that I make such a stupid mistake, but I did feel sure that the old gentleman I saw took out that very book, and kept it in his hand without opening it, just as people do, you know, sir, when they mean to take a book out of the library and not merely refer to it. But, however, I'll run up now at once and get it for you this time. And here intervened a pause. Mr. Eldred paced the entry, read all the notices, consulted his watch, sat and gazed up the staircase, did all that a very impatient man could, until some twenty minutes had run out. At last he addressed himself to the doorkeeper, and inquired if it was a very long way to that part of the library to which Mr. Garrett had gone. Well, I was thinking it was funny, sir. He's a quick man as a rule, but to be sure he might have been sent for by the librarian. But even so, I think he'd have mentioned it to him, that you was waiting. I'll just speak him up on the tube and see. And to the tube he addressed himself. As he absorbed the reply to his question, his face changed, and he made one or two supplementary inquiries which were shortly answered. Then he came forward to his counter, and spoke in a lower tone, "'I'm sorry to hear, sir, that something seems to have happened a little awkward. Mr. Garrett has been took poorly, it appears, and the librarian sent him home in a cab the other way. Something of an attack, by what I can hear.' "'What, really? Do you mean that someone has injured him?' "'No, sir, not violence here, but—' as I should judge, attacked, with an attack, what you might term it, of illness. Not a strong constitution, Mr. Garrett. But as to your book, sir, perhaps you might be able to find it for yourself. It's too bad you should be disappointed this way twice over. Ah, uh, well, but I'm so sorry that Mr. Garrett should have been taken ill in this way while he was obliging me. I think I must leave the book, and call and inquire after him. You can give me his address, I suppose. That was easily done. Mr. Garrett, it appeared, lodged in rooms not far from the station. And uh, one other question. Did you happen to notice if an old gentleman, perhaps a clergyman, in the, uh, yes, in a black cloak, left the library after I did, yesterday? I think he may have been, uh, I think, that is, that he may be staying, or, or rather, that I may have known him. Not in a black cloak, sir, no. There were only two gentlemen left later than what you'd done, sir. Both of them youngish men. There was Mr. Carter took out a music book, and one of the professors, with a couple of novels. That's the lot, sir. And then I went off to me tea, and glad to get it. Thank you, sir. Much obliged. Mr. Eldred, still a prey to anxiety, betook himself in a cab to Mr. Garrett's address. But... The young man was not yet in a condition to receive visitors. He was better, but his landlady considered that he must have had a severe shock. She thought, most likely, from what the doctor said, that he would be able to see Mr. Eldred tomorrow. Mr. Eldred returned to his hotel at dusk, and spent, I fear, but a dull evening. On the next day he was able to see Mr. Garrett. When in health, Mr. Garrett was a cheerful and pleasant-looking young man. Now he was a very white and shaky being, propped up in an armchair by the fire, and inclined to shiver and keep an eye on the door. If, however, there were visitors whom he was not prepared to welcome, Mr. Eldred was not among them. It really is I who owe you an apology, and I was despairing of being able to pay it, for I didn't know your address, but I am very glad you have called. I do dislike and regret giving all this trouble, but, you know, I could not have foreseen this, this attack which I had. Of course not, but now I am something of a doctor. You'll excuse my asking. You have had, I'm sure, good advice. Was it a fall you had? No, I did fall on the floor, but not from any height. It was really a shock. You mean something startled you? Was it anything you thought you saw? Not much thinking in the case, I'm afraid. Yes, it was something I saw. 
"'You remember when you called the first time at the library?' "'Yes, of course. Let me beg you not to try to describe it. It will not be good for you to recall it, I'm sure.' but indeed it would be a relief to me to tell anyone like yourself. You might be able to explain it away. It was just when I was going into the class where your book is. Indeed, Mr. Garrett, I insist. Beside, my watch tells me I have but very little time left in which to get my things together and to take the train. No, not another word. It would be more distressing to you than you imagine, perhaps. Now, there is just one thing I want to say. I feel that I am really indirectly responsible for this illness of yours. And I think I ought to defray the expense which it has, uh... But this offer was quite distinctly declined. Mr. Eldred, not pressing it, left almost at once. Not, however, before Mr. Garrett had insisted upon his taking a note of the class mark of the Tractate Midoth, which, as he said, Mr. Eldred could at leisure get for himself. But Mr. Eldred did not reappear at the library. William Garrett had another visitor that day in the person of a contemporary and colleague from the library, one George Earle. Earle had been one of those who found Garrett lying insensible on the floor, just inside the class or cubicle, opening upon the central alley of a spacious gallery, in which the Hebrew books were placed, and Earle had naturally been very anxious about his friend's condition. So, as soon as library hours were over, he appeared at the lodgings. Well, he said, after some conversation, I've no notion what it was that put you wrong, but I've got the idea that there's something wrong in the atmosphere of the library. I know this, that just before we found you, I was coming along the gallery with Davis, and I said to him, Did you ever know such a musty smell anywhere as there is about here? It can't be wholesome. Well, now, if one goes on living a long time with a smell of that kind, I tell you it was worse than I ever knew it. It must get into the system and break out sometime, don't you think? Garrett shook his head. That's all very well about the smell, but it isn't always there, though I've noticed it the last day or two. A sort of unnaturally strong smell of dust. But no, that's not what it did for me. It was something I saw, and I wanted to tell you about it. I went into that Hebrew class to get a book for a man that was inquiring for it down below. Now. That same book I'd made a mistake about the day before. I'd been for it for the same man, and made sure that I saw an old parson in a cloak taking it out. I told my man it was out. Off he went to call again next day. I went back to see if I could get it out of the parson. No parson there, and the book on the shelf. Well, yesterday, as I say, I went again. This time, if you please, ten o'clock in the morning, you remember, and as much light as ever you get in those classes. And there was my parson again, back to me, looking at the books on the shelf I wanted. His hat was on the table, and he had a bald head. I waited a second or two, looking at him rather particularly. I tell you, he had a very nasty bald head. It looked to me dry, and it looked dusty and the streaks of hair across it were much less like hair than cobwebs. Well, I made a bit of a noise on purpose, coughed and moved my feet. He turned round and let me see his face, which I hadn't seen before. I tell you again, I'm not mistaken, though for one reason or another I didn't take in the lower part of his face. I did see the upper part, and it was perfectly dry, and the eyes were very deep sunk and over them, from the eyebrows to the cheekbone, there were cobwebs, thick. Now that closed me up, as they say, and I can't tell you anything more. What explanations were furnished by Earl of this phenomenon, it does not very much concern us to inquire. At all events, they did not convince Garrett that he had not seen what he had seen. Before William Garrett returned to work at the library, the librarian insisted upon his taking a week's rest and change of air. Within a few days' time, therefore, he was at the station with his bag, looking for a desirable smoking compartment in which to travel to Burnstow-on-Sea, which he had not previously visited. One compartment, 
and one only, seemed to be suitable. But just as he approached it, he saw, standing in front of the door, a figure so like one bound up with recent unpleasant associations, that with a sickening qualm and hardly knowing what he did, he tore open the door of the next compartment and pulled himself into it as quickly as if death were at his heels. The train moved off, and he must have turned quite faint, for he was next conscious of a smelling bottle being put to his nose. His physician was a nice-looking old lady, who with her daughter was the only passenger in the carriage. But for this incident it is not very likely that he would have made any overtures to his fellow travellers. As it was, thanks and inquiries and general conversation supervened inevitably, and Garrett found himself provided before the journey's end not only with a physician, but with a landlady, for Mrs. Simpson had apartments to let at Burnstow, which seemed in all ways suitable. The place was empty at that season, so that Garrett was thrown a good deal into the society of the mother and daughter. He found them very acceptable company. On the third evening of his stay, he was on such terms with them as to be asked to spend the evening in their private sitting-room. During their talk, it transpired that Garrett's work lay in a library. "'Ah, libraries are fine places,' said Mrs. Simpson, putting down her work with a sigh. "'But for all that, books have played me a sad turn, or rather, a book has.' "'Well, books give me my living, Mrs. Simpson, and I should be sorry to say a word against them. I don't like to hear that they've been bad for you.' "'Perhaps Mr. Garrett could help us to solve our puzzle, mother.' said Miss Simpson. "'I don't want to set Mr. Garrett off on a hunt that might waste a lifetime, my dear, nor yet to trouble him with our private affairs. But if you think it in the least likely that I could be of use, I do beg you to tell me what the puzzle is, Mrs. Simpson. If it is finding out anything about a book, you see, I'm in rather a good position to do it. Yes, I do see that, but the worst of it is that we don't know the name of the book, nor what it is about. "'No, nor that either. "'Except that we don't think it's in English, mother, "'and that is not much of a clue.' "'Well, Mr. Garrett,' said Mrs. Simpson, "'who had not yet resumed her work "'and was looking at the fire thoughtfully, "'I shall tell you the story. "'You will please keep it to yourself, if you don't mind. "'Thank you. "'Now, it is just this. "'I had an old uncle, a Dr. Rant. "'Perhaps you may have heard of him.' Not that he was a distinguished man, but from the odd way he chose to be buried. I rather think I have seen the name in some guide-book. That would be it, said Miss Simpson. He left directions, horrid old man, that he was to be put sitting at a table in his ordinary clothes, in a brick room that he'd had made underground in a field near his house. Of course, the country people say he's been seen about there in his old black cloak. "'Well, dear, I don't know much about such things,' Mrs. Simpson went on. "'But, anyhow, he is dead these twenty years and more. "'He was a clergyman, though I'm sure I can't imagine how he got to be one. "'But he did no duty for the last part of his life, which I think was a good thing. "'And he lived on his own property, a very nice estate, not a great way from here. "'He had no wife or family, only one niece, who was myself.' and one nephew, and he had no particular liking for either of us, nor for anyone else as far as that goes. If anything, he liked my cousin better than he did me, for John was much more like him in his temper, and I'm afraid I must say his very mean, sharp ways. It might have been different if I had not married, but I did, and that he very much resented. Very well, here he was, with this estate and a good deal of money, as it turned out, of which he had the absolute disposal, and it was understood that we, my cousin and I, would share it equally at his death. In a certain winter, over twenty years back, as I said, he was taken ill, and I was sent for to nurse him. My husband was alive then, but the old man would not hear of his coming. As I drove up to the house I saw my cousin John driving away from it, in an open fly, and looking, I noticed, in very good spirits. 
I went up, and did what I could for my uncle, but I was very soon sure that this would be his last illness, and he was convinced of it, too. During the day before he died, he got me to sit by him all the time, and I could see that there was something, and probably something unpleasant, that he was saving up to tell me, and putting it off as long as he felt he could afford the strength. I'm afraid, purposely, in order to keep me on the stretch, but at last out it came. Mary, he said, Mary, I've made my will in John's favour. He has everything, Mary. Well, of course, that came as a bitter shock to me, for we, my husband and I, were not rich people, and if he could have managed to live a little easier than he was obliged to do, I felt it might be the prolonging of his life. But I said little or nothing to my uncle except that he had a right to do what he pleased, partly because I couldn't think of anything to say, and partly because I was sure there was more to come, and so there was. But Mary? he said. I'm not very fond of John, and I've made another will in your favour. You can have everything. Only you've got to find the will, you see, and I don't mean to tell you where it is. Then he chuckled to himself, and I waited, for again I was sure he hadn't finished. That's a good girl, he said after a time. You wait, and I'll tell you as much as I told John. But just let me remind you, you can't go into court with what I'm saying to you, for you won't be able to produce any collateral evidence beyond your own word, and John's a man that can do a little hard swearing if necessary. Very well, then, that's understood. Now I had the fancy that I wouldn't write this will quite in the common way, so I wrote it in a book, Mary, a printed book, and there's several thousand books in this house. But there, you needn't trouble yourself with them, for it isn't one of them. It's in safekeeping elsewhere, in a place where John can go and find it any day, if he only knew. And you can't. A good will it is, properly signed and witnessed, but I don't think you'll find the witnesses in a hurry. Still I said nothing, if I had moved at all. I must have taken hold of the old wretch and shaken him. He lay there laughing to himself, and at last he said, Well, well, you've taken it very quietly, and as I want to start you both on equal terms, and John has a bit of a purchase in being able to go where the book is, I'll tell you just two other things which I didn't tell him. The will's in English, but you won't know that if you ever see it. That's one thing. And another is that when I'm gone, you'll find an envelope in my desk directed to you, and inside it something that would help you to find it, if only you have the wits to use it. In a few hours from that he was gone, and though I made an appeal to John Eldred about it, John Eldred? I beg your pardon, Mrs. Simpson. I think I've seen a Mr. John Eldred. What is he like to look at? It must be ten years since I saw him. He would be a thin elderly man now, and unless he's shaved them off, he has that sort of whiskers which people used to call Dundreary or Piccadilly something. Weepers! Yes, that is the man. Where did you come across him, Mr. Garrett? I don't know if I could tell you, said Garrett mendaciously, in some public place. But you hadn't finished. Really, I had nothing much to add, only that John Eldred, of course, paid no attention whatever to my letters, and has enjoyed the estate ever since, while my daughter and I have had to take to the lodging-house business here, which I must say has not turned out by any means so unpleasant as I feared it might. But about the envelope? Oh, to be sure. Why, the puzzle turns on that. Give Mr. Garrett the paper out of my desk. It was a small slip, with nothing whatever on it but five numerals, not divided or punctuated in any way. One, one, three, three, four. Mr. Garrett pondered, but there was a light in his eye. Suddenly he made a face and then asked, Do you suppose that Mr. Eldred can have any more clue than you have to the title of the book? I have sometimes thought he must, said Mrs. Simpson, and in this way 
that my uncle must have made the will not very long before he died, that I think he said himself, and got rid of the book immediately afterwards. But all his books were very carefully catalogued, and John has the catalogue, and John was most particular that no books whatever should be sold out of the house, and I'm told that he is always journeying about to booksellers and libraries, so I fancy that he must have found out just which books are missing from my uncle's library of those which are entered in the catalogue, and must be hunting for them. Just so, just so, said Mr. Garrett, and relapsed into thought. No later than next day he received a letter which, as he told Mrs. Simpson with great regret, made it absolutely necessary for him to cut short his stay at Burnstow. Sorry as he was to leave them, and they were at least as sorry to part with him, he had begun to feel that a crisis, all important to Mrs., and shall we add, Miss, Simpson, was very possibly supervening. In the train Garrett was uneasy and excited. He racked his brains to think whether the press-mark of the book which Mr. Eldred had been inquiring after was one in any way corresponding to the numbers on Mrs. Simpson's little bit of paper. But he found, to his dismay, that the shock of the previous week had really so upset him that he could neither remember any vestige of the title or nature of the book, or even of the locality to which he had gone to seek it. And yet all other parts of the library topography and work were clear as ever in his mind. And another thing, he stamped with annoyance as he thought of it, he had at first hesitated and then had forgotten to ask Mrs. Simpson for the name of the place where Eldred lived. That, however, he could write about. At least he had his clue in the figures on the paper. If they referred to a press mark in his library, they were only susceptible of a limited number of interpretations. They might be divided into 1, 13, 34, 11, 33, 4, or 11, 3, 34. He could try all these in the space of a few minutes, and if any one were missing, he had every means of tracing it. He got very quickly to work, though a few minutes had to be spent in explaining his early return to his landlady and his colleagues. One thirteen thirty four was in place, and contained no extraneous writing. As he drew near to class eleven in the same gallery, its association struck him like a chill. But he must go on. After a cursory glance at eleven thirty three four, which first confronted him, and was a perfectly new book, he ran his eye along the line of quartos which fills eleven three. The gap, he feared, was there. Thirty-four was out. A moment was spent in making sure that it had not been misplaced, and then he was off to the vestibule. Has eleven three thirty-four gone out? Do you recollect noticing that number? Notice the number? What do you take me for, Mr. Garrett? There, take and look over the ticket for yourself, if you've got a free day before you. Well, then, has a Mr. Eldred called again? The old gentleman who came the day I was taken ill. Come, you'd remember him. What do you suppose? Of course I recollect of him. He haven't been in again, not since you went off for your holiday. And yet I seem to... There now, Roberts will know. Roberts, do you recollect of the name of Heldred? Not half, said Roberts. You mean the man that sent a bob over the price for the parcel? And I wish they all did. Do you mean to say you've been sending books to Mr. Eldred? Come, do speak up. Have you? Well now, Mr. Garrett, if a gentleman sends the ticket all wrote correct, and the secretary says this book may go, and the box ready addressed sent with the note, and a sum of money sufficient to defray the railway charges, what would be your action in the matter, Mr. Garrett, if I may take the liberty to ask such a question? Would you, or would you not, have taken the trouble to oblige? Or would you have chucked the old thing under the counter, and... You are perfectly right, of course, Hodgson, perfectly right. Only, would you kindly oblige me by showing me the ticket Mr. Eldred sent, and letting me know his address? To be sure, Mr. Garrett, so long as I'm not acted about and informed that I don't know me duty, I'm willing to oblige in every way feasible to my power. There is the ticket on the file. 
J. Eldred, 11, 3, 34. Title of work, T-A-L-M. Well, there you can make out what you like of it. Not a novel, I should hazard the guess. And here is Mr. Eldred's note, applying for the book in question, which I see he terms it a track. Thanks, thanks. But the address? There's none on the note. Ah, indeed. Well, now, stay now, Mr. Garrett. I have it. Why, that note came inside of the parcel, which was directed very thoughtful to save all the trouble, ready to be sent back with the book inside. And if I have made any mistake in this whole transaction, it lays just in the one point that I neglected to enter the address in my little book here, what I keep. Not but what I dare say there was good reasons for me not entering of it. But there are. I haven't the time, neither have you, I dare say, to go into em just now. And, no, Mr. Garrett, I do not carry it in my head. Else, what will be the use of me keeping this little book here? Just ordinary, common notebook, you see, which I make a practice of entering all such names and addresses in it as I see fit to do. Admirable arrangement, to be sure. But, all right, thank you. When did the parcel go off? Half past ten this morning. Oh, good, and it's just one now. Garrett went upstairs in deep thought. How was he to get the address? A telegram to Mrs. Simpson. He might miss a train by waiting for the answer. Yes, there was one other way. She had said that Eldred lived on his uncle's estate. If this were so, he might find that place entered in the donation book. That he could run through quickly, now that he knew the title of the book. The register was soon before him, and knowing that the old man had died, more than twenty years ago, he gave him a good margin, and turned back to 1870. There was but one entry possible. 1875, August 14th, Talmud, Tractatus Midoth Cum Com A Nachmanidi, Amstelud, 1707, given by J. Rant, D.D., of Bretfield Manor. A gazetteer showed Bretfield to be three miles from a small station on the main line. Now to ask the doorkeeper whether he recollected if the name on the parcel had been anything like Bretfield. No, nothing like. It was, now you mention it, Mr. Garrett, either Breadfield or Britfield, but nothing like that other name what you quoted. So far, well. Next, a timetable. A train could be got in twenty minutes, taking two hours over the journey. The only chance, but not one to be missed, and the train was taken. If he had been fidgety on the journey up, he was almost distracted on the journey down. If he found Eldred, what could he say? That it had been discovered that the book was a rarity, and must be recalled, an obvious untruth, or that it was believed to contain important manuscript notes. Eldred would of course show him the book, from which the leaf would already have been removed. He might perhaps find traces of the removal, a torn edge of a fly-leaf, probably. And who could disprove what Eldred was certain to say, that he too had noticed and regretted the mutilation? Altogether the chase seemed very hopeless. The one chance was this. The book had left the library at 10.30. It might not have been put into the first possible train at 11.20. Granted that, then he might be lucky enough to arrive simultaneously with it, and patch up some story which would induce Eldred to give it up. It was drawing towards evening, when he got out upon the platform of his station, and like most country stations, this one seemed unnaturally quiet. He waited about till the one or two passengers who got out with him had drifted off, and then inquired of the stationmaster whether Mr. Eldred was in the neighbourhood. Yes, and pretty near to, I believe. I fancy he means calling here for a parcel he expects. Called for it once today already, didn't he, Bob? To the porter. Yes, sir, he did, and appeared to think that it was all along of me that it didn't come by the two o'clock. Anyhow, I've got it for him now. And the porter flourished a square parcel, which, a glance assured Garrett, contained all that was of any importance to him at that particular moment. Brettfield, sir? Yes, three miles just about. Short cut across these three fields brings it down by half a mile. There, there's Mr. Eldred's trap. A dog-cart, 
drove up with two men in it, of whom Garrett, gazing back as he crossed the little station yard, easily recognized one. The fact that Eldred was driving was slightly in his favor, for most likely he would not open the parcel in the presence of his servant. On the other hand, he would get home quickly, and unless Garrett were there within a very few minutes of his arrival, all would be over. He must hurry, and that he did. His shortcuts took him along one side of a triangle, while the cart had two sides to traverse, and it was delayed a little at the station, so that Garrett was in the third of the three fields when he heard the wheels fairly near. He had made the best progress possible, but the pace at which the cart was coming made him despair. At this rate, it must reach home ten minutes before him, and ten minutes would more than suffice for the fulfilment of Mr. Eldred's project. It was just at this time that the luck fairly turned. The evening was still, and sounds came clearly. Seldom has any sound given greater relief than that which he now heard, that of the cart pulling up. A few words were exchanged, and it drove on. Garrett, halting in the utmost anxiety, was able to see, as it drove past the stile near which he now stood, that it contained only the servant, and not Eldred. Further, he made out that Eldred was following on foot. From behind the tall hedge by the stile leading into the road, he watched the thin, wiry figure pass quickly by with the parcel beneath its arm, and feeling in its pockets. Just as he passed the stile, something fell out of a pocket upon the grass, but with so little sound that Eldred was not conscious of it. In a moment more it was safe for Garrett to cross the stile into the road, and pick up a box of matches. Eldred went on, and as he went his arms made hasty movements, difficult to interpret in the shadow of the trees that overhung the road. But as Garrett followed cautiously, he found at various points the key to them, a piece of string, and then the wrapper of the parcel, meant to be thrown over the hedge but sticking in it. Now Eldred was walking slower, and it could just be made out that he had opened the book and was turning over the leaves. He stopped, evidently troubled by the failing light. Garrett slipped into a gate opening, but still watched. Eldred, hastily looking round, sat down on a felled tree trunk by the roadside, and held the open book up close to his eyes. Suddenly he laid it still open on his knee, and felt in all his pockets, clearly in vain, and clearly to his annoyance. You would be glad of your matches now, thought Garrett. Then he took hold of a leaf, and was carefully tearing it out, when two things happened. First, something black seemed to drop upon the white leaf and run down it. And then, as Eldred started, and was turning to look behind him, a little dark form appeared to rise out of the shadow behind the tree trunk, and from it two arms enclosing a mass of blackness came before Eldred's face and covered his head and neck. His legs and arms were wildly flourished, but no sound came. Then there was no more movement. Eldred was alone. He had fallen back into the grass behind the tree trunk. The book was cast into the roadway. Garrett, his anger and suspicion gone for the moment at the sight of this horrid struggle, rushed up with loud cries of, Help! And so too, to his enormous relief, did a labourer, who had just emerged from a field opposite. Together they bent over and supported Eldred, but to no purpose. The conclusion that he was dead was inevitable. "'Poor gentleman,' said Garrett to the labourer, when they had laid him down. "'What happened to him, do you think?' "'I wasn't two hundred yards away,' said the man, "'when I seen Squire Eldred sitting, reading in his book, "'and to my thinking he was took with one of these fits. "'Face seemed to go all over black.' "'Just so,' said Garrett. "'You didn't see anyone near him. "'It couldn't have been an assault.' "'Not possible.' No one couldn't have got away without you or me seeing him. So I thought, well, we must get some help and the doctor and the policeman, and perhaps I had better give them this book. It was obviously a case for an inquest, and obvious also, that Garrett must stay at Bretfield and give his evidence. 
the medical inspection showed that, though some black dust were found on the face and in the mouth of the deceased, the cause of death was a shock to a weak heart, and not asphyxiation. The fateful book was produced, a respectable quarto printed wholly in Hebrew, and not of an aspect likely to excite even the most sensitive. You say, Mr. Garrett, that the deceased gentleman appeared at the moment before his attack to be tearing a leaf out of this book. Yes, I think one of the fly-leaves. There is here a fly-leaf partially torn through. It has Hebrew writing on it. Will you kindly inspect it? There are three names in English, sir, also, and a date, but I am sorry to say that I cannot read Hebrew writing. Thank you. The names have the appearance of being signatures. They are John Rant, Walter Gibson, and James Frost, and the date is 20th of July, 1875. Does anyone here know of any of these names? The rector, who was present, volunteered a statement that the uncle of the deceased, from whom he inherited, had been named Rant. The book being handed to him, he shook a puzzled head. This is not like any Hebrew I ever learnt. You are sure that it is Hebrew? What? Yes, I suppose. No, my dear sir, you are perfectly right. That is, your suggestion is exactly to the point. Of course, it is not Hebrew at all. It is English. And it is a will. It did not take many minutes to show that here, indeed, was a will of Dr. John Rant, bequeathing the whole of the property lately held by John Eldred to Mrs. Mary Simpson. Clearly the discovery of such a document would amply justify Mr. Eldred's agitation. As to the partial tearing of the leaf, the coroner pointed out that no useful purpose could be attained by speculations whose correctness it would never be possible to establish. The tractate Midoth was naturally taken in charge by the coroner for further investigation, and Mr. Garrett explained privately to him the history of it and the position of events so far as he knew or guessed them. He returned to his work next day, and on his walk to the station passed the scene of Mr. Eldred's catastrophe. He could hardly leave it without another look, though the recollection of what he had seen there made him shiver, even on that bright morning. He walked round with some misgivings behind the felled tree. Something dark that still lay there made him start back for a moment, but it hardly stirred. Looking closer, he saw that it was a thick black mass of cobwebs, and, as he stirred it gingerly with his stick, several large spiders ran out of it into the grass. There is no great difficulty in imagining the steps by which William Garrett, from being an assistant in a great library, attained to his present position of prospective owner of Bretfield Manor, now in the occupation of his mother-in-law, Mrs. Mary Simpson. The End of the Tractate Midoth From Ghost Stories of an Antiquary by M. R. James This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Yearsley. Ghost Stories of an Antiquary by M. R. James. Reader's Note In the following text, a number of dates and names are missing. These are represented in the reading by the word blank. End of reader's note. Casting the Runes April 15th, 190 blank. Dear Sir, I am requested by the Council of the blank Association to return to you the draft of a paper on the truth of alchemy, which you have been good enough to offer to read at our forthcoming meeting and to inform you that the Council do not see their way to including it in the programme. I am, yours faithfully, blank, Secretary. 
April the 18th. Dear Sir, I am sorry to say that my engagements do not permit of my affording you an interview on the subject of your proposed paper, nor do our laws allow of your discussing the matter with a committee of our council, as you suggest. Please allow me to assure you that the fullest consideration was given to the draft which you submitted, and that it was not declined without having been referred to the judgment of a most competent authority. No personal question, it can hardly be necessary for me to add, can have had the slightest influence on the decision of the Council. Believe me, but supra. April the 20th. The Secretary of the blank Association begs respectfully to inform Mr. Carswell that it is impossible for him to communicate the name of any person or persons to whom the draft of Mr. Carswell's paper may have been submitted, and further desires to intimate that he cannot undertake to reply to any further letters on this subject. "'And who is Mr. Carswell?' inquired the secretary's wife. She had called at his office, and, perhaps unwarrantably, had picked up the last of these three letters, which the typist had just brought in. "'Why, my dear, just at present Mr. Carswell is a very angry man. But I don't know much about him otherwise, except that he is a person of wealth, his address is Lufford Abbey, Warwickshire, and he's an alchemist, apparently, and wants to tell us all about it. And that's about all, except that I don't want to meet him for the next week or two. Now, if you're ready to leave this place, I am. What have you been doing to make him angry? asked Mrs. Secretary. The usual thing, my dear, the usual thing. He sent in a draft of a paper he wanted to read at the next meeting, and we referred it to Edward Dunning, almost the only man in England who knows about these things, and he said it was perfectly hopeless. So we declined it. So Carswell has been pelting me with letters ever since. The last thing he wanted was the name of the man we referred his nonsense to, you saw my answer to that. But don't you say anything about it, for goodness sake. I should think not, indeed. Did I ever do such a thing? I do hope, though, he won't get to know that it was poor Mr. Dunning. Poor Mr. Dunning. I don't know why you call him that. He's a very happy man, is Dunning. Lots of hobbies, and a comfortable home, and all his time to himself. I only meant that I should be sorry for him if this man got hold of his name and came and bothered him. Oh, ah, yes, I dare say he would be poor Mr. Dunning then. The secretary and his wife were lunching out, and the friends to whose house they were bound were Warwickshire people, so Mrs. Secretary had already settled it in her own mind that she would question them judiciously about Mr. Carswell. But she was saved the trouble of leading up to the subject, for the hostess said to the host, before many minutes had passed, I saw the abbot of Lufford this morning. The host whistled. Did you? What in the world brings him up to town? Goodness knows. He was coming out of the British Museum gate as I drove past. It was not unnatural that Mrs. Secretary should inquire whether this was a real abbot who was being spoken of. Oh, no, my dear. Only a neighbour of ours in the country who bought Lufford Abbey a few years ago. His real name is Carswell. Is he a friend of yours? asked Mr. Secretary, with a private wink to his wife. The question let loose a torrent of declamation. There was really nothing to be said for Mr. Carswell. Nobody knew what he did with himself. His servants were a horrible set of people. He had invented a new religion for himself, and practised, no one could tell what, appalling rites. He was very easily offended, and never forgave anybody. He had a dreadful face, so the lady insisted, her husband somewhat demurring. He never did a kind action, and whatever influence he did exert was mischievous. Do the poor man justice, dear, the husband interrupted. You forget the treat he gave the school children. Forget it, indeed. But I'm glad you mentioned it, because it gives an idea of the man. Now, Florence, listen to this. The first winter he was at Lufford, this delightful neighbour of ours, wrote to the clergyman of his parish, he's not ours, but we know him very well, 
and offered to show the school children some magic lantern slides. He said he had some new kinds which he thought would interest them. Well, the clergyman was rather surprised because Mr. Carswell had shown himself inclined to be unpleasant to the children, complaining of their trespassing or something of the sort. But of course he accepted, and the evening was fixed, and our friend went himself to see that everything went right. He said he never had been so thankful for anything as that his own children were all prevented from being there. They were at a children's party at our house, as a matter of fact. Because this Mr. Carswell had evidently set out with the intention of frightening these poor village children out of their wits, and I do believe if he had been allowed to go on he would actually have done so. He began with some comparatively mild things. Red Riding Hood was one, and even then Mr. Farrow said the wolf was so dreadful that several of the smaller children had to be taken out. And he said Mr. Carswell began the story by producing a noise like a wolf howling in the distance, which was the most gruesome thing he had ever heard. All the slides he showed, Mr. Farrow said, were most clever. They were absolutely realistic, and where he had got them, or how he worked them, he could not imagine. Well, the show went on, and the stories kept on becoming a little more terrifying each time, and the children were mesmerized into complete silence. At last he produced a series which represented a little boy passing through his own park, Lufford, I mean, in the evening. Every child in the room could recognize the place from the pictures, and this poor boy was followed, and at last pursued and overtaken, and either torn to pieces or somehow made away with, by a horrible hopping creature in white, which you saw first dodging about among the trees, and gradually it appeared more and more plainly. Mr. Farrow said it gave him one of the worst nightmares he ever remembered, and what it must have meant to the children doesn't bear thinking of. Of course, this was too much, and he spoke very sharply indeed to Mr. Carswell, and said it couldn't go on. All he said was, Oh, you think it's time to bring our little show to an end and send them home to their beds? Very well. And then, if you please, he switched on another slide which showed a great mass of snakes and centipedes and disgusting creatures with wings, and somehow or other he made it seem as if they were climbing out of the picture and getting in amongst the audience, and this was accompanied by a sort of dry rustling noise which sent the children nearly mad, and of course they stampeded. A good many of them were rather hurt in getting out of the room, and I don't suppose one of them closed an eye that night. There was the most dreadful trouble in the village afterwards. Of course the mothers threw a good part of the blame on poor Mr. Farrer, and if they could have got past the gates, I believe the fathers would have broken every window in the abbey. Well now, that's Mr. Carswell, that's the Abbot of Lufford, my dear, and you can imagine how we covet his society. Yes, I think he has all the possibilities of a distinguished criminal, has Carswell, said the host. I should be sorry for anyone who got into his bad books. Is he the man, or am I mixing him up with someone else? asked the secretary, who for some minutes had been wearing the frown of the man who is trying to recollect something. Is he the man who brought out a history of witchcraft some time back, ten years or more? That's the man. Do you remember the reviews of it? Certainly I do, and what's equally to the point, I knew the author of the most incisive of the lot. So did you. You must remember John Harrington. He was at John's in our time. Oh, very well indeed, though I don't think I saw or heard anything of him between the time I went down and the day I read the account of the inquest on him. Inquest? said one of the ladies. What has happened to him? Why, what happened was that he fell out of a tree and broke his neck. But the puzzle was, what could have induced him to get up there? It was a mysterious business, I must say. He was this man, not an athletic fellow, was he? And with no eccentric twist about him that was ever noticed, walking home along a country road late in the evening, no tramps about, well known and liked in the place, and he suddenly begins to run like mad, loses his hat and stick, and finally shins up a tree, quite a difficult tree, growing in the hedgerow. A dead branch gives way, and he comes down with it, and breaks his neck, and there he's found next morning with the most dreadful face of fear on him that could be imagined. 
It was pretty evident, of course, that he had been chased by something, and people talked of savage dogs and beasts escaped out of menageries, but there was nothing to be made of that. That was in eighty-nine, and I believe his brother Henry, whom I remember as well at Cambridge, but you probably don't, has been trying to get on the track of an explanation ever since. He, of course, insists there was malice in it, but I don't know. It's difficult to see how it could have come in. After a time the talk reverted to the history of witchcraft. "'Did you ever look into it?' asked the host. "'Yes, I did,' said the secretary. "'I went so far as to read it. "'Was it as bad as it was made out to be?' "'Oh, in point of style and form, quite hopeless. "'It deserved all the pulverizing it got. "'But besides that, it was an evil book. "'The man believed every word of what he was saying, "'and I'm very much mistaken if he hadn't tried the greater part of his recipes.' Well, I only remember Harrington's review of it, and I must say, if I'd been the author, it would have quenched my literary ambition for good. I should never have held up my head again. It hasn't had that effect in the present case. But come, it's half past three. I must be off. On the way home, the secretary's wife said, I do hope that horrible man won't find out that Mr. Dunning had anything to do with the rejection of his paper. I don't think there's much chance of that, said the secretary. Dunning won't mention it himself, for these matters are confidential, and none of us will for the same reason. Carswell won't know his name, for Dunning hasn't published anything on the same subject yet. The only danger is that Carswell might find out, if he was to ask the British Museum people who was in the habit of consulting alchemical manuscripts. I can't very well tell them not to mention Dunning, can I? It would set them talking at once. Let's hope it won't occur to him. However, Mr. Carswell was an astute man. This much is in the way of prologue. On an evening rather later in the same week, Mr. Edward Dunning was returning from the British Museum, where he had been engaged in research, to the comfortable house in a suburb where he lived alone, tended by two excellent women who had been long with him. There is nothing to be added by way of description of him to what we have heard already. Let us follow him as he takes his sober course homewards. A train took him to within a mile or two of his house, and an electric tram a stage farther. The line ended at a point some three hundred yards from his front door. He had had enough of reading when he got into the car, and indeed the light was not such as to allow him to do more than study the advertisements on the panes of glass that faced him as he sat. As was not unnatural, the advertisements in this particular line of cars were objects of his frequent contemplation, and with the possible exception of the brilliant and convincing dialogue between Mr. Lamplew and an eminent K.C. on the subject of pyretic saline, none of them afforded much scope to his imagination. I'm wrong. There was one at the corner of the car farthest from him, which did not seem familiar. It was in blue letters on a yellow ground, and all that he could read of it was a name, John Harrington, and something like a date. It could be of no interest to him to know more, but for all that, as the car emptied, he was just curious enough to move along the seat until he could read it well. He felt to a slight extent repaid for his trouble. The advertisement was not of the usual type. It ran thus, In memory of John Harrington, F.S.A., of the Laurels, Ashbrook, died September 18th, 1889. Three months were allowed. The car stopped. Mr. Dunning, still contemplating the blue letters on the yellow ground, had to be stimulated to rise by a word from the conductor. I beg your pardon he said. I was looking at that advertisement. It's a very odd one, isn't it? The conductor read it slowly. Well, my word, he said. I've never seen that one before. Well, that is a cure, ain't it? Someone been up to their jokes here, I should think. He got out a duster and applied it, not without saliva, to the pane, and then to the outside. No, he said, returning. That ain't no transfer. Seems to me as if it was regular in the glass. What I mean in the substance, as you might say. Don't you think so, sir? 
Mr. Dunning examined it and rubbed it with his glove, and agreed. Who looks after these advertisements, and gives leave for them to be put up? I wish you would inquire. I will just take a note of the words. At this moment there came a call from the driver. Look alive, George. Time's up. All right, all right. There's something else what's up at this end. You come and look at this here glass. What's gone with the glass? said the driver, approaching. Well, and who's Arrington? What's it all about? I was just asking who was responsible for putting the advertisements up in your cars, and saying it would be as well to make some inquiry about this one. Well, sir, that's all done at the company's office, that work is. It's our Mr. Timms, I believe, looks into that. When we put up tonight, I'll leave word, and perhaps I'll be able to tell you tomorrow if you happen to be coming this way. This was all that passed that evening. Mr. Dunning did just go to the trouble of looking up Ashbrook, and found that it was in Warwickshire. Next day he went to town again. The car, it was the same car, was too full in the morning to allow of his getting a word with the conductor. He could only be sure that the curious advertisement had been made away with. The close of the day brought a further element of mystery into the transaction. He had missed the tram, or else preferred walking home, but at a rather late hour, while he was at work in his study, one of the maids came to say that two men from the tramways was very anxious to speak to him. This was a reminder of the advertisement, which he had, he says, nearly forgotten. He had the men in, they were the conductor and driver of the car, and when the matter of refreshment had been attended to, asked what Mr. Timms had had to say about the advertisement. Well, sir, that's what we took the liberty to step round about, said the conductor. Mr. Timms, he give William here the rough side of his tongue about that. According to him, there weren't no advertisement of that description sent in, nor ordered, nor paid for, nor put up, nor nothing, let alone not being there, and we was playing the fool taking up his time. Well, I says, if that's the case, all I ask of you, Mr. Timms, I says, is to take and look at it for yourself, I says. Of course, if it ain't there, I says, you may take and call me what you like. Right, he says, I will. And we went straight off. Now, I'll leave it to you, sir. If that ad, as we term em, with Arrington on it, weren't as plain as ever you see anything, blue letters on yellow glass, and as I says at the time, and you borne me out, regular in the glass, because, if you remember, you recollect of me swapping it with my duster. To be sure, I do, quite clearly. Well, you may say, well, I don't think. Mr. Timms, he gets in that car with a light, no, he told William to hold the light outside. Now, he says, where's your precious ad, what we've heard so much about? Here it is, I says, Mr. Timms, and I laid my hand on it. The conductor paused. Well, said Mr. Dunning, it was gone, I suppose. Broken? Broke? Not it. There weren't, if you'll believe me, no more trace of them letters, blue letters they was, on that piece of glass than, well, it's no good me talking. I never seed such a thing. I leave it to William here if uh, but there, as I says, where's the benefit in me going on about it? And what did Mr. Timms say? Why, he did what I give him leave to. Called us pretty much anything he liked. And I don't know as I blame him so much neither. But what we thought William and me did was, as we seen you take down a bit of a note about that, well, that lettering. I certainly did that, and I have it now. Did you wish me to speak to Mr. Timms myself? and show it to him. Was that what you came in about? There, didn't I say as much? said William. Deal with a gent if you can get on the track of one. That's my word. Now perhaps, George, you'll allow as I ain't took you very far wrong tonight. Very well, William, very well. No need for you to go on as if you'd had to frogs march me here. I come quiet, didn't I? All the same for that. We hadn't ought to take up your time this way, sir. But if it so happened, you could find time to step round to the company office in the morning and tell Mr. Timms what you've seen for yourself. We should lay on for a very high obligation to you for the trouble. You see, it ain't being called, well, one thing or another, as we mind, but if they got it into their head at the office, as we seen things as want there, well, one thing leads to another, and where we should be a twelve months hence, well, you can understand what I mean. Amid further elucidation of the proposition, George, conducted by William, left the room. The incredulity of Mr. Timms, who had a nodding acquaintance with Mr. Dunning, 
was greatly modified on the following day by what the latter could tell and show him, and any bad mark that might have been attached to the names of William and George was not suffered to remain on the company's books, but explanation there was none. Mr. Dunning's interest in the matter was kept alive by an incident of the following afternoon. He was walking from his club to the train, and he noticed, some way ahead, a man with a handful of leaflets, such as are distributed to passers-by by agents of enterprising firms. This agent had not chosen a very crowded street for his operations. In fact, Mr. Dunning did not see him get rid of a single leaflet before he himself reached the spot. One was thrust into his hand as he passed. The hand that gave it touched his, and he experienced a sort of little shock as it did so. It seemed unnaturally rough and hot. He looked in passing at the giver, but the impression he got was so unclear that, however much he tried to reckon it up subsequently, nothing would come. He was walking quickly, and as he went on glanced at the paper. It was a blue one. The name of Harrington, in large capitals, caught his eye. He stopped, startled, and felt for his glasses. The next instant the leaflet was twitched out of his hand by a man who hurried past, and was irrecoverably gone. He ran back a few paces, but where was the passer-by, and where the distributor? It was in a somewhat pensive frame of mind that Mr. Dunning passed on the following day into the select manuscript room of the British Museum and filled up tickets for Harley 3586 and some other volumes. After a few minutes they were brought to him, and he was settling the one he wanted first upon the desk, when he thought he heard his own name whispered behind him. He turned round hastily, and in doing so brushed his little portfolio of loose papers onto the floor. He saw no one he recognised, except one of the staff in charge of the room, who nodded to him and he proceeded to pick up his papers. He thought he had them all, and was turning to begin work, when a stout gentleman at the table behind him, who was just rising to leave, and had collected his own belongings, touched him on the shoulder, saying, May I give you this? I think it should be yours, and handed him a missing choir. It is mine, thank you, said Mr. Dunning. In another moment the man had left the room, Upon finishing his work for the afternoon, Mr. Dunning had some conversation with the assistant in charge, and took occasion to ask who the stout gentleman was. "'Oh, he's a man named Carswell,' said the assistant. "'He was asking me a week ago who were the great authorities on alchemy, and of course I told him you were the only one in the country. I'll see if I can catch him. He'd like to meet you, I'm sure.' "'For heaven's sake, don't dream of it,' said Mr. Dunning. "'I'm particularly anxious to avoid him.' "'Oh, very well,' said the assistant. "'He doesn't come here often. "'I dare say you won't meet him.' More than once on the way home that day, Mr. Dunning confessed to himself that he did not look forward with his usual cheerfulness to a solitary evening. It seemed to him that something ill-defined and impalpable had stepped in between him and his fellow men, had taken him in charge, as it were, he wanted to sit close up to his neighbours in the train and in the tram, but as luck would have it, both train and car were markedly empty. The conductor, George, was thoughtful, and appeared to be absorbed in calculations as to the number of passengers. On arriving at his house, he found Dr. Watson, his medical man, on his doorstep. "'I've had to upset your household arrangements, I'm sorry to say, Dunning. Both your servants ordered a combat. In fact, I've had to send them to the nursing home. Good heavens! What's the matter? It's uh, something like ptomaine poisoning, I should think. You've not suffered yourself, I can see, or you wouldn't be walking him out. I think they'll pull through all right. Dear, dear, have you any idea what brought it on? Well, they tell me they brought some shellfish from a hawker at their dinner time. It's odd. I've made some inquiries, but I can't find that any hawker has been to other houses in the street. I couldn't send word to you. They won't be back for a bit yet. You come and dine with me tonight, anyhow, and we can make arrangements for going on. Eight o'clock. Don't be too anxious. The solitary evening was thus obviated, at the expense of some distress and inconvenience, it is true. 
Mr. Dunning spent the time pleasantly enough with the doctor, a rather recent settler, and returned to his lonely home at about eleven-thirty. The night he passed is not one on which he looks back with any satisfaction. He was in bed, and the light was out. He was wondering if the charwoman would come early enough to get him hot water next morning, when he heard the unmistakable sound of his study door opening. No step followed it on the passage floor, but the sound must mean mischief, for he knew that he had shut the door that evening after putting his papers away in his desk. It was rather shame than courage that induced him to slip out into the passage and lean over the banister in his nightgown, listening. No light was visible, no further sound came, only a gust of warm or even hot air played for an instant round his shins. He went back and decided to lock himself into his room. There was more unpleasantness, however. either. An economical suburban company had decided that their light would not be required in the small hours, and had stopped working, or else something was wrong with the meter. The effect was in any case that the electric light was off. The obvious course was to find a match, and also to consult his watch. He might as well know how many hours of discomfort awaited him. So he put his hand into the well-known nook under the pillow only it did not get so far. What he touched was, according to his account, a mouth with teeth and with hair about it, and he declares not the mouth of a human being. I do not think it is any use to guess what he said or did, but he was in a spare room with the door locked and his ear to it before he was clearly conscious again, and there he spent the rest of a most miserable night, looking every moment for some fumbling at the door. But nothing came. The venturing back to his own room in the morning was attended with many listenings and quiverings. The door stood open, fortunately, and the blinds were up. The servants had been out of the house before the hour of drawing them down. There was, to be short, no trace of an inhabitant. The watch, too, was in its usual place. Nothing was disturbed. Only the wardrobe door had swung open, in accordance with its confirmed habit. A ring at the back door now announced the charwoman, who had been ordered the night before, and nerved Mr. Dunning, after letting her in, to continue his search in other parts of the house. It was equally fruitless. The day, thus begun, went on dismally enough. He dared not go to the museum. In spite of what the assistant had said, Carswell might turn up there and Dunning felt that he could not cope with a probably hostile stranger. His own house was odious. He hated sponging on the doctor. He spent some little time in a call at the nursing home, where he was slightly cheered by a good report of his housekeeper and maid. Towards lunchtime he betook himself to his club, again experiencing a gleam of satisfaction at seeing the secretary of the association. At luncheon Dunning told his friend the more material of his woes, but could not bring himself to speak of those that weighed most heavily on his spirits. "'My poor dear man,' said the secretary, "'what an upset! Look here, we're alone at home, absolutely. You must put up with us. Yes, no excuse. Send your things in this afternoon.' Dunning was unable to stand out. He was, in truth, becoming acutely anxious as the hours went on, as to what that night might have waiting for him. He was almost happy as he hurried home to pack up. His friends, when they had time to take stock of him, were rather shocked at his lawn appearance, and did their best to keep him up to the mark. Not altogether without success, but when the two men were smoking alone later, Dunning became dull again. Suddenly he said, Gayton, I believe that alchemist man knows it was I who got his paper rejected. Gayton whistled. What makes you think that? he said. Dunning told of his conversation with the museum assistant, and Gayton could only agree that the guess seemed likely to be correct. Not that I care much, Dunning went on, only it might be a nuisance if we were to meet. He's a bad-tempered party, I imagine. 
conversation dropped again. Gayton became more and more strongly impressed with the desolateness that came over Dunning's face and bearing, and finally, though with a considerable effort, he asked him point-blank whether something serious was not bothering him. Dunning gave an exclamation of relief. "'I was perishing to get it off my mind,' he said. "'Do you know anything about a man named John Harrington?' Gayton was thoroughly startled and at the moment could only ask why. Then the complete story of Dunning's experiences came out. What had happened in the tram-car, in his own house, and in the street, the troubling of spirit that had crept over him, and still held him, and he ended with the question he had begun with. Gayton was at a loss how to answer him. To tell the story of Harrington's end would perhaps be right, only Dunning was in a nervous state. The story was a grim one, and he could not help asking himself whether there were not a connecting link between these two cases in the person of Carswell. It was a difficult concession for a scientific man, but it could be eased by the phrase hypnotic suggestion. In the end he decided that his answer tonight should be guarded. He would talk the situation over with his wife. So he said that he had known Harrington at Cambridge and believed he had died suddenly in 1889, adding a few details about the man and his published work. He did talk over the matter with Mrs. Gayton, and, as he had anticipated, she leapt at once to the conclusion which had been hovering before him. It was she who reminded him of the surviving brother, Henry Harrington, and she also who suggested that he might be got hold of by means of their hosts of the day before. He might be a hopeless crank objected Gayton. "'That could be ascertained from the Bennets, who knew him,' Mrs. Gayton retorted, and she undertook to see the Bennets the very next day. It is not necessary to tell in further detail the steps by which Henry Harrington and Dunning were brought together. The next scene that does require to be narrated is a conversation that took place between the two. Dunning had told Harrington of the strange ways in which the dead man's name had been brought before him, and had said something besides of his own subsequent experiences. Then he had asked if Harrington was disposed, in return, to recall any of the circumstances connected with his brother's death. Harrington's surprise at what he heard can be imagined, but his reply was readily given. John, he said, was in a very odd state, undeniably, from time to time, during some weeks before, though not immediately before, the catastrophe. There were several things. The principal notion he had was that he thought he was being followed. No doubt he was an impressionable man, but uh, he never had had such fancies as this before. I cannot get it out of my mind that there was ill will at work and what you tell me about yourself reminds me very much of my brother. Can you think of any possible connecting link? There is just one that has been taking shape vaguely in my mind. I've been told that your brother reviewed a book very severely, not long before he died, and just lately I have happened to cross the path of the man who wrote that book in a way he would resent. Don't tell me the man was called Carswell. Why not? That is exactly his name. Henry Harrington leant back. That is final to my mind. Now, I must explain further. From something he said, I feel sure that my brother John was beginning to believe, very much against his will, that Carswell was at the bottom of his trouble. I want to tell you what seems to me to have a bearing on the situation. My brother was a great musician, and used to run up to concerts in town. He came back, three months before he died, from one of these, and gave me his program to look at, an analytical program. He always kept them. I nearly missed this one, he said. I suppose I must have dropped it. Anyhow, I was looking for it under my seat and in my pockets and so on, and my neighbour offered me his, said, might he give it me? He had no further use for it. And he went away just afterwards. I don't know who he was, a stout, clean-shaven man. I should have been sorry to miss it. Of course I could have brought another, but this cost me nothing. At another time he told me that he had been very uncomfortable 
both on the way to his hotel and during the night. I piece things together now in thinking it over. Then, not very long after, he was going over these programs, putting them in order to have them bound up, and in this particular one, which, by the way, I had hardly glanced at, he found quite near the beginning a strip of paper with some very odd writing on it in red and black, most carefully done. It looked to me more like runic letters than anything else. Why, he said, this must belong to my fat neighbour. It looks as if it might be worth returning to him. It may be a copy of something. Evidently someone has taken trouble over it. How can I find his address? We talked it over for a little, and agreed as it wasn't worth advertising about, and that my brother had better look out for the man at the next concert, to which he was going very soon. The paper was lying on the book, and we were both by the fire. It was a cold, windy summer evening. I suppose the door blew open, though I didn't notice it. At any rate, a gust, a warm gust it was, came quite suddenly between us, took the paper and blew it straight into the fire. It was light, thin paper, and flared and went up the chimney in a single ash. Well, I said, you can't give it back now. He said nothing for a minute, then rather crossly. No, I can't. But why you should keep on saying so, I don't know. I remarked that I didn't say it more than once. Not more than four times, you mean, was all he said. I remember all that very clearly, without any good reason. And now, come to the point, I don't know if you looked at that book of Carswell's which my unfortunate brother reviewed. It's not likely that you should, but I did, both before his death and after it. The first time we made game of it together. It was written in no style at all, split infinitives, and every sort of thing that makes an Oxford gorge rise. Then there was nothing that the man didn't swallow, mixing up classical myths and stories out of the golden legend, with reports of savage customs of today, all very proper, no doubt, if you know how to use them, but he didn't. He seemed to put the golden legend and the golden bough exactly on a par, and to believe both. A pitiable exhibition, in short. Well, after the misfortune I looked over the book again. It was no better than before, but the impression which it left this time on my mind was different. I suspected, as I told you, that Carswell had borne ill-will to my brother, even that he was in some way responsible for what had happened. And now his book seemed to me to be a very sinister performance indeed. One chapter in particular struck me in which he spoke of casting the runes on people, either for the purpose of gaining their affection or for getting them out of the way. Perhaps more especially the latter. He spoke of all this in a way that really seemed to me to imply actual knowledge. I've not time to go into the details, but the upshot is that I am pretty sure from information received that the civil man at the concert was Carswell. I suspect, I more than suspect, that the paper was of importance, and I do believe that if my brother had been able to give it back, he might have been alive now. Therefore it occurs to me to ask you whether you have anything to put beside what I have told you. By way of answer, Dunning had the episode in the manuscript room at the British Museum to relate. Then he did actually hand you some papers. Have you examined them? No? Because we must, if you'll allow it, look at them at once, and very carefully. They went to the still empty house. Empty, for the two servants were not yet able to return to work. Dunning's portfolio of papers was gathering dust on the writing table. In it were the quires of small-sized scribbling paper, which he used for his transcripts. And from one of these, as he took it up, there slipped and fluttered out into the room with uncanny quickness a strip of thin, light paper. The window was open, but Harrington slammed it too, just in time to intercept the paper which he caught. I thought so, he said. It might be the identical thing that was given to my brother. You'll have to look out, Dunning. This may mean something quite serious for you. A long consultation took place. The paper was narrowly examined. As Harrington had said, the characters on it were more like runes than anything else, but not decipherable by either man, and both hesitated to copy them, 
for fear, as they confessed, of perpetuating whatever evil purpose they might conceal. So it has remained impossible, if I may anticipate a little, to ascertain what was conveyed in this curious message or commission. Both Dunning and Harrington are firmly convinced that it had the effect of bringing its possessors into very undesirable company, that it must be returned to the source whence it came, they were agreed, and further, that the only safe and certain way was that of personal service, and here contrivance would be necessary, for Dunning was known by sight to Carswell. He must, for one thing, alter his appearance by shaving his beard, but then might not the blow fall first? Harrington thought they could time it. He knew the date of the concert at which the black spot had been put on his brother. It was June the 18th. The death had followed on September the 18th. Dunning reminded him that three months had been mentioned on the inscription on the car window. Perhaps, he added with a cheerless laugh, mine may be a bill at three months too. I believe I can fix it by my diary. Yes, April the 23rd was the day at the museum. That brings us to July the 23rd. Now, you know, it becomes extremely important to me to know anything you will tell me about the progress of your brother's trouble, if it is possible for you to speak of it. Of course. Well, the sense of being watched whenever he was alone was the most distressing thing to him. After a time I took to sleeping in his room, and he was the better for that. Still, he talked a great deal in his sleep. What about? Is it wise to dwell on that, at least, before things are straightened out? I think not. But I can tell you this. Two things came for him by post during those weeks, both with a London postmark, and addressed in a commercial hand. One was a woodcut of Buick's, roughly torn out of the page, one which shows a moonlit road and a man walking along it, followed by an awful demon creature. Under it were written the lines out of the ancient mariner, which I suppose the cut illustrates, about one who, having once looked round, walks on and turns no more his head, because he knows a frightful fiend doth close behind him tread. The other was a calendar, such as tradesmen often send. My brother paid no attention to this, but I looked at it after his death, and found that everything after September the 18th had been torn out. You may be surprised at his having gone out alone the evening he was killed, but the fact is that during the last ten days or so of his life he had been quite free from the sense of being followed or watched. The end of the consultation was this. Harrington, who knew a neighbour of Carswell's, thought he saw a way of keeping a watch on his movements. It would be Dunning's part to be in readiness to try to cross Carswell's path at any moment to keep the paper safe and in a place of ready access. They parted. The next weeks were no doubt a severe strain upon Dunning's nerves. The intangible barrier which had seemed to rise about him on the day when he received the paper gradually developed into a brooding blackness that cut him off from the means of escape to which one might have thought he might resort. No one was at hand who was likely to suggest them to him, and he seemed robbed of all initiative. He waited with inexpressible anxiety as May, June, and early July passed on for a mandate from Harrington. But all this time Carswell remained immovable at Lufford. At last, in less than a week before the date he had come to look upon as the end of his earthly activities, came a telegram. Leaves Victoria by boat train Thursday night. Do not miss. I come to you tonight. Harrington. He arrived accordingly, and they concocted plans. The train left Victoria at nine, and its last stop before Dover was Croydon West. Harrington would mark down Carswell at Victoria, and look out for Dunning at Croydon, calling to him if need were by a name agreed upon. Dunning, disguised as far as might be, was to have no label or initials on any hand luggage, and must at all costs have the paper with him. Dunning's suspense as he waited on the Croydon platform I need not attempt to describe. His sense of danger during the last days had only been sharpened by the fact 
that the cloud about him had perceptibly been lighter. But relief was an ominous symptom, and if Carswell eluded him now, hope was gone, and there were so many chances of that. The rumour of the journey might be itself a device. The twenty minutes in which he paced the platform and persecuted every porter with inquiries as to the boat train were as bitter as any he had spent. Still the train came, and Harrington was at the window. It was important, of course, that there should be no recognition, so Dunning got in at the farther end of the corridor carriage, and only gradually made his way to the compartment where Harrington and Carswell were. He was pleased on the whole to see that the train was far from full. Carswell was on the alert, but gave no sign of recognition. Dunning took the seat not immediately facing him, and attempted vainly at first, then with increasing command of his faculties, to reckon the possibilities of making the desired transfer. Opposite to Carswell, and next to Dunning, was a heap of Carswell's coats on the seat. It would be of no use to slip the paper into these. He would not be safe, or would not feel so, unless in some way it could be proffered by him and accepted by the other. There was a handbag, open, and with papers in it. Could he manage to conceal this, so that perhaps Carswell might leave the carriage without it, and then find and give it to him? This was the plan that suggested itself. If he could only have counselled with Harrington, but that could not be. The minutes went on. More than once Carswell rose and went out into the corridor. The second time Dunning was on the point of attempting to make the bag fall off the seat, but he caught Harrington's eye and read in it a warning. Carswell, from the corridor, was watching, probably to see if the two men recognised each other. He returned, but was evidently restless, and when he rose the third time, hope dawned, for something did slip off his seat and fall, with hardly a sound, to the floor. Carswell went out once more, and passed out of range of the corridor window. Dunning picked up what had fallen, and saw that the key was in his hands, in the form of one of Cook's ticket-cases, with tickets in it. These cases have a pocket in the cover, and within very few seconds the paper of which we have heard was in the pocket of this one. To make the operation more secure, Harrington stood in the doorway of the compartment, and fiddled with the blind. It was done, and done at the right time for the train was now slowing down towards Dover. In a moment more Carswell re-entered the compartment. As he did so, Dunning, managing, he knew not how, to suppress the tremble in his voice, handed him the ticket-case, saying, May I give you this, sir? I believe it is yours. After a brief glance at the ticket inside, Carswell uttered the hoped-for response. Yes, it is. Much obliged to you, sir. And he placed it in his breast-pocket. Even in the few moments that remained, moments of tense anxiety, for they knew not to what a premature finding of the paper might lead, both men noticed that the carriage seemed to darken about them, and to grow warmer, that Carswell was fidgety and oppressed, that he drew the heap of loose coats near to him, and cast it back as if it repelled him, and that he then sat upright and glanced anxiously at both. They, with sickening anxiety, busied themselves in collecting their belongings, but they both thought that Carswell was on the point of speaking when the train stopped at Dover Town. It was natural that in the short space between town and pier they should both go into the corridor. At the pier they got out, but so empty was the train that they were forced to linger on the platform until Carswell should have passed ahead of them with his porter on the way to the boat and only then was it safe for them to exchange a pressure of the hand, and a word of concentrated congratulation. The effect upon Dunning was to make him almost faint. Harrington made him lean up against the wall, while he himself went forward a few yards within sight of the gangway to the boat, at which Carswell had now arrived. The man at the head of it examined his ticket, and laden with coats he passed down into the boat. Suddenly the official called after him, "'You, sir, beg pardon, did the other gentleman show his ticket?' "'What the devil do you mean by the other gentleman?' Carswell's snarling voice called back from the deck. The man bent over and looked at him. "'The devil? 
Well, I don't know, I'm sure, Harrington heard him say to himself, and then aloud, My mistake, sir, must have been your rugs. Ask your pardon. And then to a subordinate near him, Had he got a dog with him, or what? Funny thing, I could have swore he wasn't alone. Well, whatever it was, they'll have to see to it aboard. She's off now. Another week, we shall be getting the holiday customers. In five minutes more, there was nothing but the lessening lights of the boat, the long line of the Dover lamps, the night breeze, and the moon. Long and long the two sat in their room at the Lord Warden. In spite of the removal of their greatest anxiety, they were oppressed with a doubt, not of the lightest. Had they been justified in sending a man to his death as they believed they had? Ought they not to warn him at least? No, said Harrington. If he is the murderer, I thank him, we have done no more than is just. Still, if you think it better, but how and where can you warn him? He was booked to Abbeville only, said Dunning. I saw that. If I wired to the hotels there in Joanne's guide, examine your ticket case, Dunning, I should feel happier. This is the twenty-first. He will have a day, but I am afraid that he has gone into the dark. So telegrams were left at the hotel office. It is not clear whether these reached their destination, or whether, if they did, they were understood. All that is known is that on the afternoon of the 23rd, an English traveller examining the front of St. Wolfram's Church at Abbeville, then under extensive repair, was struck on the head and instantly killed by a stone falling from the scaffold erected round the northwestern tower there being, as was clearly proved, no workman on the scaffold at that moment, and the traveller's papers identified him as Mr. Carswell. Only one detail shall be added. At Carswell's sale, a set of Buick, sold with all faults, was acquired by Harrington. The page with the woodcut of the traveller and the demon was, as he had expected, mutilated. Also, after a judicious interval, Harrington repeated to Dunning something of what he had heard his brother say in his sleep, but it was not long before Dunning stopped him. End of Casting the Runes From Ghost Stories of an Antiquary by M. R. James This is a LibriVox recording. All the LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Yearsley. Ghost Stories of an Antiquary by M. R. James. The Stalls of Barchester Cathedral. Reader's Note. In the following story, some words have been left out by the author. These are represented in the reading by the word blank. End of reader's note. This matter began, as far as I am concerned, with the reading of a notice in the obituary section of the Gentleman's Magazine for an early year in the nineteenth century. On February the 26th, at his residence, in the cathedral close of Barchester, the venerable John Benwell Haynes, D.D., aged fifty-seven, archdeacon of Sowerbridge and rector of Pickhill and Candley. He was of blank college, Cambridge, and where, by talent and assiduity, he commanded the esteem of his seniors. When, at the usual time, he took his first degree, his name stood high in the list of wranglers. These academical honours procured for him within a short time a fellowship of his college. In the year 1783 he received holy orders, and was shortly afterwards presented to the perpetual curacy of Rankston sub Ash, by his friend and patron, the late truly venerable Bishop of Lichfield. 
His speedy preferments, first to a prebend, and subsequently to the dignity of precentor in the Cathedral of Barchester, form an eloquent testimony to the respect in which he was held, and to his eminent qualifications. He succeeded to the archdeaconry upon the sudden decease of Archdeacon Pulteney in 1810. His sermons, ever conformable to the principles of the religion and church which he adorned, displayed in no ordinary degree, without the least trace of enthusiasm, the refinement of the scholar united with the graces of the Christian. Free from sectarian violence, and informed by the spirit of the truest charity, they will long dwell in the memories of his hearers. Here a further omission. The productions of his pen include an able defence of episcopacy, which, though often perused by the author of this tribute to his memory, affords but one additional instance of the want of liberality and enterprise which is a too common characteristic of the publishers of our generation. His published works are indeed confined to a spirited and elegant version of the Argonautica of Valerius Flacus, a volume of discourses upon the several events in the life of Joshua, delivered in his cathedral, and a number of the charges which he pronounced at various visitations to the clergy of his archdeaconry. These are distinguished by etc., etc., the urbanity and hospitality of the subject of these lines will not readily be forgotten by those who enjoyed his acquaintance. His interest in the venerable and awful pile under whose hoary vault he was so punctual an attendant, and particularly in the musical portion of its rites, might be termed filial, and formed a strong and delightful contrast to the polite indifference displayed by too many of our cathedral dignitaries at the present time. The final paragraph, after informing us that Dr. Haynes died a bachelor, says, It might have been augured that an existence so placid and benevolent would have been terminated in a ripe old age by a dissolution equally gradual and calm. But how unsearchable are the workings of providence! The peaceful and retired seclusion amid which the honoured evening of Dr. Haynes's life was mellowing to its close, was destined to be disturbed, nay, shattered, by a tragedy as appalling as it was unexpected. The morning of the 26th of February. But perhaps I shall do better to keep back the remainder of the narrative until I have told the circumstances which led up to it. These as far as they are now accessible, I have derived from another source. I had read the obituary notice which I have been quoting, quite by chance, along with a great many others of the same period. It had excited some little speculation in my mind, but beyond thinking that, if I ever had an opportunity of examining the local records of the period indicated, I would try to remember Dr. Haynes, I made no effort to pursue his case. Quite lately, I was cataloguing the manuscripts in the library of the college to which he belonged. I had reached the end of the numbered volumes on the shelves, and I proceeded to ask the librarian whether there were any more books which he thought I ought to include in my description. I don't think there are, he said, but we had better come and look at the manuscript class and make sure. Have you time to do that now? I had time. We went to the library, checked off the manuscripts and at the end of our survey arrived at a shelf of which I had seen nothing. Its contents consisted, for the most part, of sermons, bundles of fragmentary papers, college exercises, Kairos, an epic poem in several cantos, the product of a country clergyman's leisure, mathematical tracts by a deceased professor, and other similar material, of a kind with which I am only too familiar. I took brief notes of these. Lastly, there was a tin box, which was pulled out and dusted. Its label, much faded, was thus inscribed, Papers of the Venerable Archdeacon Haynes, bequeathed in 1834 by his sister, Miss Letitia Haynes. I knew at once that the name was one which I had somewhere encountered, and could very soon locate it. That must be the Archdeacon Haynes, who came to a very odd end at Barchester 
I've read his obituary in the Gentleman's Magazine. May I take the box home? Do you know if there is anything interesting in it? The librarian was very willing that I should take the box and examine it at leisure. I never looked inside it myself, he said, but I've always been meaning to. I am pretty sure that is the box which our old master once said ought never to have been accepted by the college. He said that to Martin years ago, and he said also that as long as he had control over the library it should never be opened. Martin told me about it, and said that he wanted terribly to know what was in it, but the master was librarian, and always kept the box in the lodge, so there was no getting at it in his time, and when he died it was taken away by mistake by his heirs, and only returned a few years ago. I can't think why I haven't opened it, but as I have to go away from Cambridge this afternoon, you had better have first go at it. I think I can trust you not to publish anything undesirable in our catalogue. I took the box home and examined its contents, and thereafter consulted the librarian as to what should be done about publication, and since I have his leave to make a story out of it, provided I disguise the identity of the people concerned, I will try what can be done. The materials are, of course, mainly journals and letters. How much I shall quote and how much epitomize must be determined by considerations of space. The proper understanding of the situation has necessitated a little, not very arduous, research, which has been greatly facilitated by the excellent illustrations and text of the Barchester volume in Bell's Cathedral series. When you enter the choir of Barchester Cathedral now, you pass through a screen of metal and coloured marbles, designed by Sir Gilbert Scott, and find yourself in what I must call a very bare and odiously furnished place. The stalls are modern, without canopies. The places of the dignitaries and the names of the prebends have fortunately been allowed to survive, and are inscribed on small brass plates affixed to the stalls. The organ is in the Triforium, and what is seen of the case is Gothic. The Reredos and its surroundings are like every other. Careful engravings of a hundred years ago show a very different state of things. The organ is on a massive classical screen. The stalls are also classical and very massive. There is a baldacchino of wood over the altar, with urns upon its corners. Farther east is a solid altar screen, classical in design, of wood, with a pediment, in which is a triangle surrounded by rays, enclosing certain Hebrew letters in gold. Cherubs contemplate these. There is a pulpit with a great sounding board at the eastern end of the stalls on the north side, and there is a black and white marble pavement. Two ladies and a gentleman are admiring the general effect. From other sources I gather that the archdeacon's stall then, as now, was next to the bishop's throne at the southeastern end of the stalls. His house almost faces the west front of the church, and is a fine red brick building of William the Third's time. Here Dr. Haynes, already a mature man, took up his abode with his sister in the year 1810. The dignity had long been the object of his wishes, but his predecessor refused to depart until he had attained the age of ninety-two. About a week after he had held a modest festival in celebration of that ninety-second birthday, there came a morning, late in the year, when Dr. Haynes, hurrying cheerfully into his breakfast room, rubbing his hands and humming a tune, was greeted, and checked in his genial flow of spirits, by the sight of his sister, seated indeed in her usual place behind the tea-urn, but bowed forward, and sobbing unrestrainedly into her handkerchief. "'What, what is the matter? What bad news?' he began. "'Oh, Johnny, you've not heard? The poor dear Archdeacon!' "'The Archdeacon, yes?' What is it? Ill, is he? No, no, they found him on the staircase this morning. It is so shocking. Is it possible? Dear, dear, poor Pulteney. Had there been any seizure? They don't think so, and that is almost the worst thing about it. It seems to have been all the fault of that stupid maid of theirs, Jane. Dr. Haynes paused. I don't quite understand, Letitia. How was the maid at fault? Why, as far as I can make out, 
there was a stair-rod missing, and she never mentioned it, and the poor archdeacon set his foot quite on the edge of the step. You know how slippery that oak is, and it seems he must have fallen almost the whole flight and broken his neck. It is so sad for poor Miss Pulteney. Of course, they will get rid of the girl at once. I never liked her. Miss Haynes' grief resumed its sway, but eventually relaxed so far as to permit of her taking some breakfast. Not so her brother, who, after standing in silence before the window for some minutes, left the room and did not appear again that morning. I need only add that the careless maid-servant was dismissed forthwith, but that the missing stair-rod was very shortly afterwards found under the stair-carpet, an additional proof, if any were needed, of extreme stupidity and carelessness on her part. For a good many years Dr. Haynes had been marked out by his ability, which seems to have been really considerable, as the likely successor of Archdeacon Pulteney, and no disappointment was in store for him. He was duly installed, and entered with zeal upon the discharge of those functions which are appropriate to one in his position. A considerable space in his journals is occupied with exclamations upon the confusion in which Archdeacon Pulteney had left the business of his office and the documents appertaining to it. Dues upon Ringham and Barnswood have been uncollected for something like twelve years, and are largely irrecoverable. No visitation has been held for seven years. Four chancels are almost past mending. The persons deputized by the archdeacon have been nearly as incapable as himself. It was almost a matter for thankfulness that this state of things had not been permitted to continue, and a letter from a friend confirms this view. Reader's Note The letter begins with a phrase in Greek. End of Reader's Note Heo Catacon It says, in rather cruel allusion to the second epistle to the Thessalonians, is removed at last. My poor friend, upon what a scene of confusion will you be entering? I give you my word that, on the last occasion of my crossing his threshold, there was no single paper that he could lay hands upon, no syllable of mine that he could hear, and no fact in connection with my business that he could remember. But now, thanks to a negligent maid and a loose stair-carpet, there is some prospect that necessary business will be transacted without a complete loss alike of voice and temper. This letter was tucked into a pocket in the cover of one of the diaries. There can be no doubt of the new archdeacon's zeal and enthusiasm. Give me but time to reduce to some semblance of order the innumerable errors and complications with which I am confronted, and I shall gladly and sincerely join with the aged Israelite, in the canticle which too many, I fear, pronounce, but with their lips. This reflection, I find, not in a diary, but a letter. The doctor's friends seem to have returned his correspondence to his surviving sister. He does not confine himself, however, to reflections. His investigation of the rights and duties of his office are very searching and businesslike and there is a calculation in one place that a period of three years will just suffice to set the business of the archdeaconry upon a proper footing. The estimate appears to have been an exact one, for just three years he is occupied in reforms, but I look in vain at the end of that time for the promised nunc dimittis. He has now found a new sphere of activity. Hitherto his duties have precluded him from more than an occasional attendance at the cathedral services. Now he begins to take an interest in the fabric and the music. Upon his struggles with the organist, an old gentleman who had been in office since 1786, I have no time to dwell. They were not attended with any marked success. More to the purpose is his sudden growth of enthusiasm for the cathedral itself and its furniture. There is a draft of a letter to Sylvanus Urban, which I do not think was ever sent, describing the stalls in the choir. As I have said, these were of fairly late date, of about the year 1700, in fact. The archdeacon's stall, situated at the southeast end, west of the episcopal throne, now so worthily occupied by the truly excellent prelate who adorns the see of Barchester, 
is distinguished by some curious ornamentation. In addition to the arms of Dean West, by whose efforts the whole of the internal furniture of the choir was completed, the prayer desk is terminated at the eastern extremity by three small but remarkable statuettes in the grotesque manner. One is an exquisitely modelled figure of a cat, whose crouching posture suggests with admirable spirit the suppleness, vigilance, and craft of the redoubted adversary of the genus Mus. Opposite to this is a figure seated upon a throne, and invested with the attributes of royalty, but it is no earthly monarch whom the carver has sought to portray. His feet are studiously concealed by the long robe in which he is draped, but neither the crown nor the cap which he wears suffice to hide the prick ears and curving horns which betray his Tartarian origin. And the hand which rests upon his knee is armed with talons of horrifying length and sharpness. Between these two figures stands a shape muffled in a long mantle. This might at first sight be mistaken for a monk or friar of orders grey, for the head is cowled, and a knotted cord depends from somewhere about the waist. A slight inspection, however, will lead to a very different conclusion. The knotted cord is quickly seen to be a halter, held by a hand all but concealed within the draperies, while the sunken features and, horrid to relate, the rent flesh upon the cheekbones, proclaim the King of Terrors. These figures are evidently the production of no unskilled chisel, and should it chance that any of your correspondents are able to throw light upon their origin and significance, my obligations to your valuable miscellany will be largely increased. There is more description in the paper, and seeing that the woodwork in question has now disappeared, it has a considerable interest. A paragraph at the end is worth quoting. Some late researches among the chapter accounts have shown me that the carving of the stalls was not as was very usually reported, the work of Dutch artists, but was executed by a native of this city or district named Austin. The timber was procured from an oak copse in the vicinity, the property of the dean and chapter, known as Holywood. Upon a recent visit to the parish within whose boundaries it is situated, I learned from the aged and truly respectable incumbent that traditions still lingered amongst the inhabitants of the great size and age of the oaks employed to furnish the materials of the stately structure which has been, however imperfectly, described in the above lines. Of one in particular, which stood near the centre of the grove, it is remembered that it was known as the Hanging Oak. The propriety of that title is confirmed by the fact that a quantity of human bones was found in the soil about its roots, and that at certain times of the year it was the custom for those who wished to secure a successful issue to their affairs, whether of love or the ordinary business of life, to suspend from its boughs small images or puppets, rudely fashioned of straw, twigs, or the like rustic materials. So much for the Archdeacon's archaeological investigations, to return to his career as it is to be gathered from his diaries. Those of his first three years of hard and careful work show him throughout in high spirits, and doubtless during this time that reputation for hospitality and urbanity which is mentioned in his obituary notice was well deserved. After that, as time goes on, I see a shadow coming over him, destined to develop into utter blackness, which I cannot but think must have been reflected in his outward demeanour. He commits a good deal of his fears and troubles to his diary, there was no other outlet for them. He was unmarried, and his sister was not always with him, but I am much mistaken if he has told all that he might have told. A series of extracts shall be given. August the 30th, 1816 The days begin to draw in more perceptibly than ever. Now that the archdeaconry papers are reduced to order, I must find some further employment for the evening hours of autumn and winter. It is a great blow that Letitia's health will not allow her to stay through these months. Why not go on with my defence of episcopacy? It may be useful. September the 15th. 
Letitia has left me for Brighton. October the 11th. Candles lit in the choir for the first time at evening prayers. It came as a shock. I find that I absolutely shrink from the dark season. November the 17th. Much struck by the character of the carving on my desk. I do not know that I have ever carefully noticed it before. My attention was called to it by an accident. During the Magnificat, I was, I regret to say, almost overcome with sleep. My hand was resting on the back of the carved figure of a cat, which is the nearest to me of the three figures on the end of my stall. I was not aware of this, for I was not looking in that direction, until I was startled by what seemed a softness, a feeling as of rather rough and coarse fur, and a sudden movement, as if the creature were twisting round its head to bite me. I regained complete consciousness in an instant, and I have some idea that I must have uttered a suppressed exclamation, for I noticed that Mr. Treasurer turned his head quickly in my direction. The impression of the unpleasant feeling was so strong that I found myself rubbing my hand upon my surplice. This accident led me to examine the figures after prayers more carefully than I had done before, and I realized for the first time with what skill they are executed. December the 6th. I do indeed miss Letitia's company. The evenings, after I have worked as long as I can at my defense, are very trying. The house is too large for a lonely man, and visitors of any kind are too rare. I get an uncomfortable impression when going to my room that there is company of some kind. The fact is, I may as well formulate it to myself, that I hear voices. This, I am well aware, is a common symptom of incipient decay of the brain, and I believe that I should be less disquieted than I am if I had any suspicion that this was the cause. I have none, none whatever, nor is there anything in my family history to give colour to such an idea. Work, diligent work, and a punctual attention to the duties which fall to me is my best remedy, and I have little doubt that it will prove efficacious. January the 1st. My trouble is, I must confess it, increasing upon me. Last night, upon my return after midnight from the deanery, I lit my candle to go upstairs. I was nearly at the top when something whispered to me, Let me wish you a happy new year. I could not be mistaken. It spoke distinctly and with a peculiar emphasis. Had I dropped my candle, as I all but did, I trembled to think what the consequences must have been. As it was, I managed to get up the last flight, and was quickly in my room with the door locked, and experienced no other disturbance. January the 15th. I had occasion to come downstairs last night to my workroom for my watch which I had inadvertently left on my table when I went up to bed. I think I was at the top of the last flight when I had a sudden impression of a sharp whisper in my ear, Take care! I clutched the balusters and naturally looked round at once. Of course there was nothing. After a moment I went on. It was no good turning back, but I had as nearly as possible fallen. A cat, a large one by the feel of it, slipped between my feet, but again, of course, I saw nothing. It may have been the kitchen cat, but I do not think it was. February the 27th. A curious thing last night, which I should like to forget. Perhaps if I put it down here I may see it in its true proportion. I worked in the library from about nine to ten. The hall and staircase seemed to be unusually full of what I can only call movement without sound. By this I mean that there seemed to be continuous going and coming, and that whenever I ceased writing to listen, or looked out into the hall, the stillness was absolutely unbroken. Nor in going to my room at an earlier hour than usual, about half-past ten, was I conscious of anything that I could call a noise. It so happened that I had told John to come to my room for the letter to the bishop, which I wished to have delivered early in the morning at the palace. He was to sit up, therefore, and come for it when he heard me retire. This I had for the moment forgotten. 
though I had remembered to carry the letter with me to my room, but when, as I was winding up my watch, I heard a light tap at the door, and a low voice saying, May I come in? which I most undoubtedly did hear, I recollected the fact, and took up the letter from my dressing-table, saying, Certainly, come in. No one, however, answered my summons, and it was now that, as I strongly suspect, I committed an error, for I opened the door and held the letter out. There was certainly no one at that moment in the passage, but in the instant of my standing there, the door at the end opened and John appeared carrying a candle. I asked him whether he had come to the door earlier, but am satisfied that he had not. I do not like the situation, but although my senses were very much on the alert, and though it was some time before I could sleep, I must allow that I perceived nothing further of an untoward character. With the return of spring, when his sister came to live with him for some months, Dr. Haynes's entries become more cheerful, and indeed no symptom of depression is discernible until the early part of September, when he was again left alone. And now, indeed, there is evidence that he was incommoded again, and that more pressingly. To this matter I will return in a moment, but I digress to put in a document which, rightly or wrongly, I believe to have a bearing on the thread of the story. The account books of Dr. Haynes, preserved along with his other papers, show from a date but little later than that of his institution as archdeacon, a quarterly payment of twenty-five pounds to J. L. Nothing could have been made of this had it stood by itself, but I connect with it a very dirty and ill-written letter, which, like another that I have quoted, was in a pocket in the cover of a diary. Of date or postmark there is no vestige and the decipherment was not easy. It appears to run, Dear Sir, I have been expecting to hear of you these last weeks, and not having done so, must suppose you have not got mine, which was saying how me and my man had met in with bad times this season, all seems to go cross with us on the farm, and which way to look for the rent we have no knowledge of it. This been the sad case with us, if you would have the great liberality probably, but the exact spelling defies reproduction, to send forty pounds, otherwise steps will have to be took, which I should not wish. As you was the means of me losing my place with Dr. Pulteney, I think it only just what I am asking, and you know best what I could say if I was put to it. But I do not wish anything of that unpleasant nature, being one that always wished to have everything pleasant about me. Your obedient servant, Jane Lee. About the time at which I suppose this letter to have been written, there is in fact a payment of forty pounds to J. L. We return to the diary. October the 22nd. At evening prayers during the Psalms, I had that same experience which I recollect from last year. I was resting my hand on one of the carved figures, as before. I usually avoid that of the cat now, and I was going to have said a change came over it, but that seems attributing too much importance to what must, after all, be due to some physical affection in myself. At any rate, the wood seemed to become chilly and soft, as if made of wet linen. I can assign the moment at which I became sensible of this. The choir was singing the words, Set thou an ungodly man to be ruler over him, and let Satan stand at his right hand. The whispering in my house was more persistent to-night. I seemed not to be rid of it in my room. I have not noticed this before. A nervous man, which I am not, and hope I am not becoming, would have been much annoyed if not alarmed by it. The cat was on the stairs to-night. I think it sits there always. There is no kitchen cat. November the 15th. Here again I must note a matter I do not understand. I am much troubled in sleep. No definite image presented itself, but I was pursued by the very vivid impression that wet lips were whispering into my ear with great rapidity and emphasis for some time together. After this, I suppose, I fell asleep, 
but was awakened with a start by feeling as if a hand were laid on my shoulder. To my intense alarm I found myself standing at the top of the lowest flight of the first staircase. The moon was shining brightly enough through the large window to let me see that there was a large cat on the second or third step. I can make no comment. I crept up to bed again. I do not know how. Yes, mine is a heavy burden. Then follows a line or two which has been scratched out. I fancy I read something like, Acted for the Best. Not long after this, it is evident to me that the archdeacon's firmness began to give way under the pressure of these phenomena. I omit, as unnecessarily painful and distressing, the ejaculations and prayers which, in the months of December and January, appear for the first time, and become increasingly frequent. Throughout this time, however, he is obstinate in clinging to his post. Why he did not plead ill health, and take refuge at Bath or Brighton, I cannot tell. My impression is that it would have done him no good. That he was a man who, if he had confessed himself beaten by the annoyances, would have succumbed at once, and that he was conscious of this. He did seek to palliate them by inviting visitors to his house. The result he has noted in this fashion. January the 7th. I have prevailed on my cousin Alan to give me a few days, and he is to occupy the chamber next to mine. January the 8th. A still night. Alan slept well, but complained of the wind. My own experiences were as before. Still whispering and whispering. What is it that he wants to say? January the 9th. Alan thinks this is a very noisy house. He thinks, too, that my cat is an unusually large and fine specimen, but very wild. January the 10th. Alan and I in the library until 11. He left me twice to see what the maids were doing in the hall. Returning the second time, he told me he had seen one of them passing through the door at the end of the passage, and said if his wife were here she would soon get them into better order. I asked him what coloured dress the maid wore. He said grey or white. I supposed it would be so. January the 11th. Alan left me today. I must be firm. These words, I must be firm, occur again and again on subsequent days. Sometimes they are the only entry. In these cases they are in an unusually large hand, and dug into the paper in a way which must have broken the pen that wrote them. Apparently the archdeacon's friends did not remark any change in his behaviour, and this gives me a high idea of his courage and determination. The diary tells us nothing more than I have indicated of the last days of his life. The end of it all must be told in the polished language of the obituary notice. The morning of the 26th of February was cold and tempestuous. At an early hour, the servants had occasion to go into the front hall of the residence occupied by the lamented subject of these lines. What was their horror upon observing the form of their beloved and respected master lying upon the landing of the principal staircase in an attitude which inspired the gravest fears? Assistance was procured, and an universal consternation was experienced upon the discovery that he had been the object of a brutal and a murderous attack. The vertebral column was fractured in more than one place. This might have been the result of a fall. It appeared that the stair carpet was loosened at one point. But, in addition to this, there were injuries inflicted upon the eyes, nose, and mouth, as if by the agency of some savage animal, which, dreadful to relate, rendered those features unrecognizable. The vital spark was, it is needless to add, completely extinct, and had been so upon the testimony of respectable medical authorities for several hours. The author or authors of this mysterious outrage are alike buried in mystery, and the most active conjecture has hitherto failed to suggest a solution of the melancholy problem afforded by this appalling occurrence. The writer goes on to reflect upon the probability that the writings of Mr. Shelley, Lord Byron, and M. Voltaire may have been instrumental in bringing about the disaster, and concludes by hoping, somewhat vaguely, that this event may 
operate as an example to the rising generation, but this portion of his remarks need not be quoted in full. I had already formed the conclusion that Dr. Haynes was responsible for the death of Dr. Pulteney, but the incident connected with the carved figure of death upon the archdeacon's stall was a very perplexing feature. The conjecture that it had been cut out of the wood of the hanging oak was not difficult, but seemed impossible to substantiate. However, I paid a visit to Barchester, partly with the view of finding out whether there were any relics of the woodwork to be heard of. I was introduced by one of the canons to the curator of the local museum, who was, my friend said, more likely to be able to give me information on the point than any one else. I told this gentleman of the description of certain carved figures and arms formerly on the stalls, and asked whether any had survived. He was able to show me the arms of Dean West, and some other fragments. These, he said, had been got from an old resident, who had also once owned a figure, perhaps one of those which I was inquiring for. There was a very odd thing about that figure, he said. The old man who had it told me he picked it up in a woodyard, whence he had obtained the still extant pieces, and had taken it home for his children. On the way home he was fiddling about with it, and it came in two in his hands, and a bit of paper dropped out. This he picked up, and, just noticing that there was writing on it, put it into his pocket, and subsequently into a vase on his mantelpiece. I was at his house not very long ago, and happened to pick up the vase, and turn it over to see whether there were any marks on it, and the paper fell into my hand. The old man, on my handing it to him, told me the story I have told you, and said I might keep the paper. It was crumpled and rather torn, so I have mounted it on a card which I have here. If you can tell me what it means, I shall be very glad, and also, I may say, a good deal surprised. He gave me the card. The paper was quite legibly inscribed in an old hand, and this is what was on it. When I grew in the wood, I was watered with blood. Now in the church I stand. Who that touches me with his hand, if a bloody hand he bear, I counsel him to be ware, lest he be fetched away, whether by night or day, but chiefly when the wind blows high in a night of February. This I dreamt, 26th February, anno 1699. John Austin. I suppose it is a charm or a spell. Wouldn't you call it something of that kind? said the curator. Yes, I said. I suppose one might. What became of the figure in which it was concealed? Oh, I forgot, said he. The old man told me it was so ugly and frightened his children so much that he burnt it. The End of The Stalls of Barchester Cathedral From Ghost Stories of an Antiquary by M. R. James This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Yearsley. Ghost Stories of an Antiquary by M. R. James. Martin's Close. Some few years back, I was staying with the rector of a parish in the west, where the society to which I belong owns property. I was to go over some of this land, and on the first morning of my visit, soon after breakfast, the estate carpenter and general handyman, John Hill, was announced as in readiness to accompany us. The rector asked which part of the parish we were to visit that morning. The estate map was produced, and when we had showed him our round, he put his finger on a particular spot. "'Don't forget,' he said, "'to ask John Hill about Martin's Close when you get there. "'I should like to hear what he tells you.' "'What ought he to tell us?' I said. "'I haven't the slightest idea,' said the rector. 
or if that is not exactly true, it will do till lunch-time. And here he was called away. We set out. John Hill is not a man to withhold such information as he possesses on any point, and you may gather from him much that is of interest about the people of the place and their talk. An unfamiliar word, or one that he thinks ought to be unfamiliar to you, he will usually spell as C-O-B, Cobb, and the like. It is not, however, relevant to my purpose to record his conversation before the moment when we reached Martin's Close. The bit of land is noticeable, for it is one of the smallest enclosures you are likely to see, a very few square yards, hedged in with quickset on all sides, and without any gate or gap leading into it. You might take it for a small cottage garden long deserted, but that it lies away from the village and bears no trace of cultivation. It is at no great distance from the road, and is part of what is there called a moor, in other words a rough upland pasture cut up into largish fields. Why is this little bit hedged off so? I asked, and John Hill, whose answer I cannot represent as perfectly as I should like, was not at fault. That's what we call Martin's Close, sir. Tis a curious thing about that bit of land, sir. Goes by the name of Martin's Close, sir. M-A-R-T-I-N. Martin. Beg pardon, sir. Did Rector tell you to make inquiry of me about that, sir? Yes, he did. Ah, I thought so much, sir. I was telling Rector about that last week, and he was very much interested. It appears there's a murderer buried there, sir, by the name of Martin. Old Samuel Saunders, that formerly lived here at uh, what we call South Town, sir, he had a long tale about that, sir. Terrible murder done upon a young woman, sir. Cut her throat and cast her in the water down here. Was he hung for it? Yes, sir. He was hung just up here on the roadway. But what I've heard, on the Holy Innocence Day, many hundred years ago, by the man that went by the name of the Bloody Judge. Terrible red and bloody, I've heard. Was his name Jeffreys, do you think? Might be possible t'was. Jeffreys. J-E-F. Jeffreys. I reckon t'was. And the tale I've heard many times from Mr. Saunders, how this young man Martin, George Martin, was troubled before his cruel action come to light by the young woman's spirit. How was that? Do you know? No, sir. I don't exactly know how t'was with it, but by what I've heard, he was fairly tormented. And rightly, too. Old Mr. Saunders, he told a history regarding a cupboard down here in the new inn. According to what he related, this young woman's spirit came out of this cupboard, but I don't recollect the matter. This was the sum of John Hill's information. We passed on, and in due time I reported what I had heard to the rector. He was able to show me, from the parish account books, that a gibbet had been paid for in 1684 and a grave dug in the following year, both for the benefit of George Martin, but he was unable to suggest any one in the parish, Saunders being now gone, who was likely to throw any further light on the story. Naturally, upon my return to the neighbourhood of libraries, I made search in the more obvious places. The trial seemed to be nowhere reported. A newspaper of the time, and one or more newsletters, however, had some short notices, from which I learnt that on the ground of local prejudice against the prisoner, he was described as a young gentleman of a good estate, the venue had been moved from Exeter to London, that Jeffreys had been the judge, and death the sentence, and that there had been some singular passages in the evidence. Nothing further transpired till September of this year. A friend who knew me to be interested in Jeffreys then sent me a leaf torn out of a second-hand bookseller's catalogue, with the entry, Jeffreys, Judge, Interesting Old Manuscript Trial for Murder, and so forth, from which I gathered, to my delight, that I could become possessed for a very few shillings of what seemed to be a verbatim report, in shorthand, of the Martin trial. I telegraphed for the manuscript, and got it. It was a thin, bound volume, 
provided with a title written in longhand by someone in the eighteenth century, who had also added this note. My father, who took these notes in court, told me that the prisoner's friends had made interest with Judge Jeffreys, that no report should be put out. He had intended doing this himself when times were better, and had showed it to the Reverend Mr. Glanville, who encouraged his design very warmly, but death surprised them both before it could be brought to an accomplishment. The initials W.G. are appended. I am advised that the original reporter may have been T. Gurney, who appears in that capacity in more than one state trial. This was all that I could read for myself. After no long delay, I heard of someone who was capable of deciphering the shorthand of the seventeenth century, and a little time ago the typewritten copy of the whole manuscript was laid before me. The portions which I shall communicate here help to fill in the very imperfect outline which subsists in the memories of John Hill and, I suppose, one or two others who live on the scene of the events. The report begins with a species of preface, the general effect of which is that the copy is not that actually taken in court, though it is a true copy in regard to the notes of what was said, but that the writer has added to it some remarkable passages that took place during the trial, and has made this present fair copy of the whole, intending at some favourable time to publish it, but has not put it into long hand, lest it should fall into the possession of unauthorised persons, and he or his family be deprived of the profit. The report then begins. This case came on to be tried on Wednesday, the 19th of November, between our Sovereign Lord the King and George Martin Esquire of I take leave to omit some of the place names, at a sessions of Oya and Termina, and jail delivery at the Old Bailey, and the prisoner, being in Newgate, was brought to the bar. Clerk of the Crown. George Martin, hold up thy hand, which he did. Then the indictment was read, which set forth that the prisoner, not having the fear of God before his eyes, but being moved and seduced by the instigation of the devil, Upon the fifteenth day of May, in the thirty-sixth year of our Sovereign Lord, King Charles the Second, with force and arms in the parish aforesaid, in and upon Anne Clark Spinster, of the same place, in the peace of God and of our said Sovereign Lord the King, then and there, being feloniously, willfully, and of your malice aforethought, did make an assault, and with a certain knife value a penny, the throat of the said Anne Clark then and there did cut, of the which wound the said Anne Clark then and there did die, and the body of the said Anne Clark did cast into a certain pond of water situate in the same parish, with more that is not material to our purpose, against the peace of our sovereign lord the king, his crown and dignity. Then the prisoner prayed a copy of the indictment. Lord Chief Justice, Sir George Jeffreys. What is this? Surely you know that is never allowed. Besides, here is as plain indictment as ever I heard. You have nothing to do but to plead to it. Prisoner, my lord, I apprehend there may be matter of law arising out of the indictment, and I would humbly beg the court to assign me counsel to consider of it. Beside, my lord, I believe it was done in another case. Copy of the indictment was allowed. Lord Chief Justice. What case was that? Prisoner. Truly, my lord, I have been kept close prisoner ever since I came up from Exeter Castle, and no one allowed to come at me, and no one to advise with. Lord Chief Justice. But I say, what was that case you allege? Prisoner. My lord, I cannot tell your lordship precisely the name of the case, but it is in my mind that there was such a one, and I would humbly desire, Lord Chief Justice, all this is nothing. Name your case, and we will tell you whether there be any matter for you in it. God forbid, but you should have anything that may be allowed you by law, but this is against law, and we must keep the course of the court. Attorney General, Sir Robert Sawyer, my lord, we pray for the king that he may be asked to plead. Clerk of the court. 
Are you guilty of the murder whereof you stand indicted, or not guilty? Prisoner. My lord, I would humbly offer this to the court. If I plead now, shall I have an opportunity after to accept against the indictment? Lord Chief Justice. Yes, yes, that comes after the verdict. That will be saved to you, and counsel assigned if there be matter of law. But that which you have now to do is to plead. Then, after some little parleying with the court, which seemed strange upon such a plain indictment, the prisoner pleaded not guilty. Clerk of the Court. Culprit, how wilt thou be tried? Prisoner. By God and my country. Clerk of the Court. God send thee a good deliverance. Lord Chief Justice. Why, how is this? Here has been a great to-do that you should not be tried at Exeter by your country, but be brought here to London, and now you ask to be tried by your country. Must we send you to Exeter again? Prisoner. My lord, I understood it was the form. Lord Chief Justice. So it is, man. We spoke only in the way of pleasantness. Well, go on and swear the jury. So they were sworn. I omit the names. There was no challenging on the prisoner's part, for, as he said, he did not know any of the persons called. Thereupon the prisoner asked for the use of pen, ink, and paper, to which the Lord Chief Justice replied, Aye, aye, in God's name let him have it. Then the usual charge was delivered to the jury, and the case opened by the junior counsel for the King, Mr. Dolben. The Attorney General followed. May it please your Lordship, and you gentlemen of the jury, I am of counsel for the King against the prisoner at the bar. You have heard that he stands indicted for a murder done upon the person of a young girl. Such crimes as this you may perhaps reckon to be not uncommon, and indeed in these times, I am sorry to say it, there is scarce any fact so barbarous and unnatural but what we may hear almost daily instances of it. But I must confess that in this murder that is charged upon the prisoner there are some particular features that mark it out to be such as I hope has but seldom, if ever, been perpetrated upon English ground. For, as we shall make it appear, the person murdered was a poor country girl, whereas the prisoner is a gentleman of a proper estate, and besides that, was one to whom Providence had not given the full use of her intellects, but was what is termed among us commonly an innocent or natural. Such an one, therefore, as one would have supposed a gentleman of the prisoner's quality more likely to overlook, or, if he did notice her, to be moved to compassion for her unhappy condition, than to lift up his hand against her in the very horrid and barbarous manner which we shall show you he used. Now, to begin at the beginning, and open the matter to you orderly, about Christmas of last year, that is the year 1683, this gentleman, Mr. Martin, having newly come back into his own country from the University of Cambridge, some of his neighbours, to show him what civility they could, for his family is one that stands in very good repute all over that country, entertained him here and there at their Christmas merrymakings so that he was constantly riding to and fro from one house to another, and sometimes, when the place of his destination was distant, or for other reason, as the unsafeness of the roads, he would be constrained to lie the night at an inn. In this way it happened that he came, a day or two after the Christmas, to the place where this young girl lived with her parents, and put up at the inn there, called the New Inn, which is, as I am informed, a house of good repute, here was some dancing going on among the people of the place, and Anne Clark had been brought in, it seems, by her elder sister, to look on, but being, as I have said, of weak understanding, and besides that very uncomely in her appearance, it was not likely she should take much part in the merriment, and accordingly was but standing by in a corner of the room. The prisoner at the bar, seeing her, one must suppose by way of a jest, asked her would she dance with him, and in spite of what her sister and others could say to prevent it and to dissuade her, Lord Chief Justice, 
Come, Mr. Attorney, we are not set here to listen to tales of Christmas parties in taverns. I would not interrupt you, but sure you have more weighty matters than this. You will be telling us next what tune they danced to. Attorney General. My lord, I would not take up the time of the court with what is not material, but we reckon it to be material to show how this unlikely acquaintance begun. And as for the tune, I believe, indeed, our evidence will show that even that hath a bearing on the matter in hand. Lord Chief Justice. Go on, go on, in God's name, but give us nothing that is impertinent. Attorney General. Indeed, my lord, I will keep to my matter. But, gentlemen, having now shown you, as I think, enough of this first meeting between the murdered person and the prisoner, I will shorten my tale so far as to say that, from then on, there were frequent meetings of the two. For the young woman was greatly tickled with having got hold, as she conceived it, of so likely a sweetheart, and he being once a week at least in the habit of passing through the street where she lived, she would always be on the watch for him. And it seems they had a signal arranged. He should whistle the tune that was played at the tavern. It is a tune, as I am informed, well known in that country, and has a burden. Madam, will you walk, will you talk with me? Lord Chief Justice. I, I remember it in my own country, in Shropshire. It runs somehow thus, does it not? Here his lordship whistled a part of a tune, which was very observable, and seemed below the dignity of the court, and it appears he felt it so himself, for he said, but this is by the mark, and I doubt it is the first time we have had dance tunes in this court. The most part of the dancing we give occasion for is done at Tyburn, looking at the prisoner, who appeared very much disordered. You said the tune was material to your case, Mr. Attorney, and upon my life I think Mr. Martin agrees with you. What ails you, man, staring like a player that sees a ghost? Prisoner, my lord, I was amazed at hearing such trivial, foolish things as they bring against me. Lord Chief Justice. Well, well, it lies upon Mr. Attorney to show whether they be trivial or not. But I must say, if he has nothing worse than this he has said, you have no great cause to be in a maze. Does it not lie something deeper? But go on, Mr. Attorney. Attorney. My lord and gentlemen, all that I have said so far you may indeed very reasonably reckon as having an appearance of triviality, and, to be sure, had the matter gone no further than the humouring of a poor silly girl by a young gentleman of quality, it had been very well. But to proceed, we shall make it appear that after three or four weeks the prisoner became contracted to a young gentlewoman of that country, one suitable every way to his own condition and such an arrangement was on foot that seemed to promise him a happy and a reputable living. But within no very long time it seems that this young gentlewoman, hearing of the jest that was going about that countryside with regard to the prisoner and Anne Clark, conceived that it was not only an unworthy carriage on the part of her lover, but a derogation to herself that he should suffer his name to be sport for tavern company, and so without more ado she, with the consent of her parents, signified to the prisoner that the match between them was at an end. We shall show you that upon the receipt of this intelligence the prisoner was greatly enraged against Anne Clark as being the cause of his misfortune, though indeed there was nobody answerable for it but himself and that he made use of many outrageous expressions and threatenings against her, and subsequently upon meeting with her both abused her and struck at her with his whip. But she, being but a poor innocent, could not be persuaded to desist from her attachment to him, but would often run after him, testifying with gestures and broken words the affection she had to him, until she was become, as he said, the very plague of his life. Yet being that affairs in which he was now engaged, necessarily took him by the house in which she lived, he could not, as I am willing to believe he would otherwise have done, avoid meeting with her from time to time. We shall further show you that this was the posture of things up to the fifteenth day of May in this present year, 
Upon that day the prisoner comes riding through the village, as of custom, and met with the young woman, but in place of passing her by, as he had lately done, he stopped and said some words to her, with which she appeared wonderfully pleased, and so left her, and after that day she was nowhere to be found, notwithstanding a strict search was made for her. The next time of the prisoner's passing through the place, her relations inquired of him whether he should know anything of her whereabouts, which he totally denied. They expressed to him their fears lest her weak intellects should have been upset by the attention he had showed her, and so she might have committed some rash act against her own life, calling him to witness the same time how often they had beseeched him to desist from taking notice of her, as fearing trouble might come of it. But this too he easily laughed away. But in spite of this light behaviour, it was noticeable in him that about this time his carriage and demeanour changed, and it was said of him that he seemed a troubled man, and here I come to a passage to which I should not dare to ask your attention, but that it appears to me to be founded in truth, and is supported by testimony deserving of credit, and, gentlemen, to my judgment it doth afford a great instance of God's revenge against murder and that he will requite the blood of the innocent. Here Mr. Attorney made a pause, and shifted with his papers, and it was thought remarkable by me and others, because he was a man not easily dashed. Lord Chief Justice. Well, Mr. Attorney, what is your instance? Attorney. My Lord, it is a strange one, and the truth is that of all the cases I have been concerned in, I cannot call to mind the like of it. But to be short, gentlemen, we shall bring you testimony that Anne Clark was seen after this 15th of May, and that at such time as she was so seen, it was impossible she could have been a living person. Here the people made a hum, and a good deal of laughter, and the court called for silence, and when it was made, Lord Chief Justice, why, Mr. Attorney, you might save up this tale for a week. It will be Christmas by that time, and you can frighten your cookmaids with it. At which the people laughed again, and the prisoner also, as it seemed. God, man, what are you prating of ghosts and Christmas jigs and tavern company? And here is a man's life at stake. To the prisoner. And you, sir, I would have you know there is not so much occasion for you to make merry neither. You are not brought here for that. And if I know Mr. Attorney, he has more in his brief than he has shown yet. Go on, Mr. Attorney. I need not, mayhap, have spoken so sharply, but you must confess your course is somewhat unusual. Attorney. Nobody knows it better than I, my lord, but I shall bring it to an end with a round turn. I shall show you, gentlemen, that Anne Clark's body was found in the month of June, in a pond of water with the throat cut that a knife belonging to the prisoner was found in the same water, that he made efforts to recover the said knife from the water, that the coroner's quest brought in a verdict against the prisoner at the bar, and that therefore he should by course have been tried at Exeter, but that suit being made on his behalf, on account that an impartial jury could not be found to try him in his own country, he hath had that singular favour shown him that he should be tried here in London, and so we will proceed to call our evidence. Then the facts of the acquaintance between the prisoner and Anne Clark were proved, and also the coroner's inquest. I pass over this portion of the trial, for it offers nothing of special interest. Sarah Ascot was next called and sworn. Attorney, what is your occupation? Sarah, I keep the new inn at... Uh, Reader's note, name of the village has been removed from the document. End of reader's note. Attorney, do you know the prisoner at the bar? Sarah. Yes, he was often at our house, since he come first at Christmas of last year. Attorney, did you know Anne Clark? Sarah. Yes, very well. Attorney, pray, what manner of person was she in her appearance? 
Sarah. She was a very short, thick-made woman. I do not know what else you would have me say. Attorney. Was she comely? Sarah. No, not by no manner of means. She was very uncomely, poor child. She had a great face and hanging chops and a very bad colour like a puddock. Lord Chief Justice. What is that, mistress? What say you she was like? Sarah. My lord, I ask pardon. I heard Esquire Martin say she looked like a puddock in the face, and so she did. Lord Chief Justice. Did you that? Can you interpret her, Mr. Attorney? Attorney. My lord, I apprehend it is the country word for a toad. Lord Chief Justice. Oh, a hop toad. Aye, go on. Attorney. Will you give an account to the jury of what passed between you and the prisoner at the bar in May last? Sarah. Sir, it was like this. It was about nine o'clock the evening after that, and did not come home, and I was about my work in the house. There was no company there, only Thomas Snell, and it was foul weather. The squire Martin came in and called for some drink. I, by way of pleasantry, I said to him, Squire, have you been looking after your sweetheart? And he flew out at me in a passion, and desired I would not use such expressions. I was amazed at that, because we were accustomed to joke with him about her. Lord Chief Justice. Who? Her? Sarah. Anne Clark, my lord. And we had not heard the news of his being contracted to a young gentlewoman elsewhere, or I am sure I should have used better manners. So I said nothing, but, being I was a little put out, I began singing, to myself as it were, the song they danced to the first time they met, for I thought it would prick him. It was the same that he was used to sing when he come down the street. I've heard it very often, Madam, will you walk, will you talk with me? And it fell out that I needed something that was in the kitchen, so I went out to get it, and all the time I went on singing something louder and more bold-like. And as I was there, all of a sudden, I thought I heard someone answering outside the house. But I could not be sure, because of the wind blowing, so I. So then I stopped singing, and now I heard it plain, saying, Yes, sir, I will walk, I will talk with you. And I knew the voice for Anne Clark's voice. Attorney how did you know it to be her voice? Sarah. It was impossible I could be mistaken. She had a dreadful voice, a kind of a squalling voice, in particular if she tried to sing. And there was nobody in the village that could counterfeit it, for they often tried. So, hearing that, I was glad, because we were all in an anxiety to know what was gone with her, for though she was a natural, she had a good disposition and was very tractable, and says I to myself, What, child, are you returned, then? And I ran into the front room, and I said to Squire Martin as I passed by, Squire, here is your sweetheart back again, shall I call her in? And with that I went to open the door, but Squire Martin, he caught hold of me, and it seemed to me he was out of his wits or near upon. Old woman, says he, in God's name, and I know not what else. He was all of a shake. Then I was angry, and said I, What, are you not glad that poor child is found? And I called to Thomas Snell, and said, If the squire will not let me, do you open the door and call her in. So Thomas Snell went and opened the door, and the wind set in that way, blew in and overset the two candles that was all we had lighted. And a squire Martin fell away from holding me. I think he fell down on the floor, but we were wholly in the dark and it was a minute or two before I got a light again, and while I was feeling for the firebox, I am not certain, but I heard someone step across the floor, and I am sure I heard the door of the great cupboard that stands in the room open and shut too. Then, when I had a light again, I see a squire Martin on the settle, all white and sweaty, as if he had swounded away, and his arms hanging down, and I was going to help him, but just then it caught my eye that there was something like a bit of a dress stuck into the cupboard door, and it came to my mind I had heard that door shut, 
so I thought it might be some person had run in when the light was quenched, and was hiding in the cupboard. So I went up closer and looked, and there was a bit of a black stuff cloak, and just below it an edge of a brown stuff dress, both sticking out of the shut of the door, and both of them was low down, as if the person that had them on might be crouched down inside. Attorney, what did you take it to be? Sarah, I took it to be a woman's dress. Attorney, could you make any guess whom it belonged to? Did you know anyone who wore such a dress? Sarah, it was a common stuff by what I could see. I have seen many women wearing such a stuff in our parish. Attorney, was it like Anne Clark's dress? Sarah, she used to wear just such a dress, but I could not say on my oath it was hers. Attorney, did you observe anything else about it? Sarah, I did notice that it looked very wet, but it was foul weather outside. Lord Chief Justice, did you feel of it, mistress? Sarah, no, my lord, I did not like to touch it. Lord Chief Justice, not like? Why that? Are you so nice that you scruple to feel of a wet dress? Sarah, indeed, my lord, I cannot very well tell why. Only it had a nasty, ugly look about it. Lord Chief Justice, well, go on. Sarah, then I called again to Thomas Snell, and bid him come to me, and catch any one that come out when I should open the cupboard door. For, says I, there is someone hiding within, and I would know what she wants. And with that, Squire Martin gave a sort of cry or a shout, and ran out of the house into the dark, and I felt the cupboard door pushed out against me while I held it, and Thomas Snell helped me, but for all we pressed to keep it shut as hard as we could, it was forced out against us, and we had to fall back. Lord Chief Justice. And pray, what came out? A mouse? Sarah. No, my lord. It was greater than a mouse. But I could not see what it was. It fleeted very swift over the floor and out the door. Lord Chief Justice. But come, what did it look like? Was it a person? Sarah. My lord, I cannot tell what it was, but it ran very low, and it was of a dark colour. We were both daunted by it, Thomas Snell and I but we made all the haste we could after it to the door that stood open, and we looked out, but it was dark, and we could see nothing. Lord Chief Justice. Was there no tracks of it on the floor? What floor have you there? Sarah. It is a flagged floor and sanded, my lord, and there was an appearance of a wet track on the floor, but we could make nothing of it, neither Thomas Snell nor me, and besides, as I said, it was a foul night. Lord Chief Justice. Well, for my part, I see not, though to be sure it is an odd tale she tells, what you would do with this evidence. Attorney. My lord, we bring it to show the suspicious carriage of the prisoner immediately after the disappearance of the murdered person, and we ask the jury's consideration of that, and also to the matter of the voice heard without the house. Then the prisoner asked some questions, not very material, and Thomas Snell was next called, who gave evidence to the same effect as Mrs. Ascot, and added the following. Attorney. Did anything pass between you and the prisoner during the time Mrs. Ascot was out of the room? Thomas. I had a piece of twist in my pocket. Attorney. Twist of what? Thomas. Twist of tobacco, sir, and I felt a disposition to take a pipe of tobacco. So I found a pipe on the chimney-piece, and being it was twist, and in regard of me having by an oversight left me knife at me house, and me not having over many teeth to pluck at it, as your lordship or any one else might have a view by their own eyesight. Lord Chief Justice. What is the man talking about? Come to the matter, fellow. Do you think we sit here to look at your teeth? Thomas. No, my lord, nor I would not you should do, God forbid. I know your honours have better employment, and better teeth, I would not wonder. Lord Chief Justice. Good God, what a man is this! Yes, I have better teeth, and that you shall find if you keep not to the purpose. Thomas. 
I humbly ask pardon, my lord, but so it was. And I took upon me, thinking no arm, to ask Squire Martin to lend me his knife to cut my tobacco. And he felt first of one pocket, and then of another, and it was not there at all. And says I, What? Have you lost your knife, Squire? And up he gets and feels again. And he sat down, and such a groan as he gave. Good God, he says, I must have left it there. But, says I, Squire, by all appearance it is not there. Did you set a value on it, says I? You might have it cried. But he sat there, and put his head between his hands, and seemed to take no notice to what I said. And then it was Mistress Ascot came trucking out of the kitchen place. Asked if he heard the voice singing outside the house. He said no, but the door into the kitchen was shut, and there was a high wind, but says that no one could mistake Anne Clark's voice. Then a boy, William Redaway, about thirteen years of age, was called, and by the usual questions put by the Lord Chief Justice, it was ascertained that he knew the nature of an oath, and so he was sworn. His evidence referred to a time about a week later. Attorney. Now, child, don't be frighted. There is no one here will hurt you if you speak the truth. Lord Chief Justice. Aye, if he speak the truth. But remember, child, thou art in the presence of the great God of heaven and earth, that hath the keys of hell, and of us, that are the king's officers, that have the keys of Newgate. And remember, too, there is a man's life in question. And if thou tellest a lie, and by that means he comes to an ill end, thou art no better than his murderer, and so speak the truth. Attorney, tell the jury what you know, and speak out. Where were you on the evening of the 23rd of May last? Lord Chief Justice, why, what does such a boy as this know of days? Can you mark the day, boy? William, yes, my lord. It was the day before our feast, and I was to spend sixpence there, and that falls a month before Midsummer Day. One of the jury. My lord, we cannot hear what he says. Lord Chief Justice. He says he remembers the day because it was the day before the feast they had there, and he had sixpence to lay out. Set him up on the table there. Well, child, and where wast thou then? William. Keeping cows on the moor, my lord. But the boy, using the country speech, my lord could not well apprehend him, and so asked if there was any one that could interpret him, and it was answered the parson of the parish was there, and he was accordingly sworn, and so the evidence given. The boy said, I was on the moor about six o'clock, and sitting behind a bush of firs near upon the water, and the prisoner came very cautiously and looking about him, having something like a long pole in his hand, and stopped a good while as if he would be listening, and then began to feel in the water with the pole, and I, being very near the water, not above five yards, heard as if the pole struck up against something that made a wallowing sound, and the prisoner dropped the pole and threw himself on the ground, and rolled himself about very strangely with his hands to his ears, and so after a while got up and went creeping away. Asked if he had had any communication with the prisoner. Yes, a day or two before, the prisoner, hearing I was used to be on the moor, he asked me if I had seen a knife laying about, and said he would give sixpence to find it. And I said I had not seen any such thing, but I would ask about, and he said he would give me sixpence to say nothing, and so he did. Lord Chief Justice. And was that the sixpence you were to lay out at the feast? William. Yes, if you please, my lord. Asked if he had observed anything particular as to the pond of water, he said, No, except that it begun to have a very ill smell, and the cows would not drink of it for some days before. Asked if he had ever seen the prisoner and Anne Clark in company together, he began to cry very much, and it was a long time before they could get him to speak intelligibly. At last the parson of the parish, Mr. Matthews, got him to be quiet, and the question being put to him again, he said he had seen Anne Clark waiting on the moor for the prisoner at some way off, several times since last Christmas. Attorney. 
Did you see her close, so as to be sure it was she? William. Yes, quite sure. Lord Chief Justice. How quite sure, child? William. Because she would stand and jump up and down and clap her arms like a goose, which he called by some country name, but the parson explained it to be a goose, and then she was at such a shape that it could not be no one else. Attorney. What was the last time that you so saw her? Then the witness began to cry again, and clung very much to Mr. Matthews, who bid him not to be frightened. And so at last he told his story, that on the day before their feast, being the same evening that he had before spoken of, after the prisoner had gone away, it being then twilight, and he very desirous to get home, but afraid for the present to stir from where he was, lest the prisoner should see him, remained some few minutes behind the bush, looking on the pond, and saw something dark come up out of the water at the edge of the pond farthest away from him, and so up the bank. And when it got to the top, where he could see it plain against the sky, it stood up and flapped the arms up and down, and then run off very swiftly in the same direction the prisoner had taken. And being asked very strictly who he took it to be, he said upon his oath that it could be nobody but Anne Clark. Thereafter his master was called, and gave evidence that the boy had come home very late that evening, and had been chided for it, and that he seemed very much amazed, but could give no account of the reason. Attorney. My lord, we have done with our evidence for the king. Then the Lord Chief Justice called upon the prisoner to make his defence, which he did, though at no great length and in a very halting way, saying that he hoped the jury would not go about to take his life on the evidence of a parcel of country people and children that would believe any idle tale, and that he had been very much prejudiced in his trial. At which the Lord Chief Justice interrupted him saying that he had had singular favour shown to him in having his trial removed from Exeter, which the prisoner acknowledging said that he meant rather that, since he was brought to London, there had not been care taken to keep him secured from interruption and disturbance, upon which the Lord Chief Justice ordered the marshal to be called, and questioned him about the safekeeping of the prisoner, but could find nothing, except the marshal said that he had been informed by the under-keeper that they had seen a person outside his door, or going up the stairs to it, but there was no possibility the person should have got in. And it being inquired further what sort of person this might be, the marshal could not speak to it, save by hearsay, which was not allowed. And the prisoner, being asked if this was what he meant, said no, he knew nothing of that, but it was very hard that a man should not be suffered to be at quiet when his life stood on it but it was observed he was very hasty in his denial, and so he said no more, and called no witnesses, whereupon the Attorney-General spoke to the jury. A full report of what he said is given, and if time allowed I would extract that portion in which he dwells on the alleged appearance of the murdered person. He quotes some authorities of ancient date as St. Augustine, to cura pro mortuis gerenda, a favourite book of reference with the old writers on the supernatural and also cites some cases which may be seen in Glanville's, but more conveniently in Mr. Lang's books. He does not, however, tell us more of those cases than is to be found in print. The Lord Chief Justice then summed up the evidence for the jury. His speech, again, contains nothing that I find worth copying out, but he was naturally impressed with the singular character of the evidence, saying that he had never heard such given in his experience but that there was nothing in law to set it aside, and that the jury must consider whether they believed these witnesses or not. And the jury, after a very short consultation, brought the prisoner in guilty. So he was asked whether he had anything to say in arrest of judgment, and pleaded that his name was spelt wrong in the indictment, being Martin with an I, whereas it should be with a Y. But this was overruled as not material, Mr. Attorney saying, moreover, that he could bring evidence to show that the prisoner by times wrote it as it was laid in the indictment, and 
The prisoner, having nothing further to offer, sentence of death was passed upon him, and that he should be hanged in chains upon a gibbet near the place where the fact was committed, and that execution should take place upon the 28th of December next ensuing, being Innocent's Day. Thereafter, the prisoner, being to all appearance in a state of desperation, made shift to ask the Lord Chief Justice that his relations might be allowed to come to him during the short time he had to live. Lord Chief Justice Aye, with all my heart, so be it in the presence of the keeper, and Anne Clark may come to you as well for what I care. At which the prisoner broke out and cried to his lordship not to use such words to him, and his lordship very angrily told him he deserved no tenderness at any man's hands for a cowardly, butcherly murderer that had not the stomach to take the reward of his deeds. And I hope to God, said he, that she will be with you by day and by night, till an end is made of you. Then the prisoner was removed, and, so far as I saw, he was in a swound, and the court broke up. I cannot refrain from observing that the prisoner, during all the time of the trial, seemed to be more uneasy than is commonly the case, even in capital cases. That, for example, he was looking narrowly among the people, and often turning round very sharply, as if some person might be at his ear. It was also very noticeable at this trial what a silence the people kept, and further, though this might not be otherwise than natural in that season of the year, what a darkness and obscurity there was in the courtroom, lights being brought in not long after two o'clock in the day, and yet no fog in the town. It was not without interest that I heard lately from some young men who had been giving a concert in the village I speak of, that a very cold reception was accorded to the song which had been mentioned in this narrative, Madam, Will You Walk? It came out in some talk they had next morning with some of the local people, that that song was regarded with an invincible repugnance. It was not so, they believed, at North Torton, but here it was reckoned to be unlucky. However, why that view was taken, no one had the shadow of an idea. The End of Martin's Close From Ghost Stories of an Antiquary by M. R. James This is a LibriVox recording. All the LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Yearsley. Ghost Stories of an Antiquary by M. R. James. Mr. Humphreys and His Inheritance. About fifteen years ago, on a date late in August or early in September, a train drew up at Willsthorpe, a country station in eastern England. Out of it stepped, with other passengers, a rather tall and reasonably good-looking young man, carrying a handbag and some papers tied up in a packet. He was expecting to be met, one would say, from the way in which he looked about him, and he was, as obviously, expected. The station-master ran forward a step or two, and then, seeming to recollect himself, turned and beckoned to a stout and consequential person with a short round beard, who was scanning the train with some appearance of bewilderment. "'Mr. Cooper,' he called out, "'Mr. Cooper, I think this is your gentleman.' And then, to the passenger who had just alighted, "'Mr. Humphrey, sir, glad to bid you welcome to Willsthorpe. There's a cart from the hall for your luggage.' and here's Mr. Cooper, what I think you know." Mr. Cooper had hurried up, and now raised his hat and shook hands. "'Very pleased, I'm sure,' he said, "'to give the echo to Mr. Palmer's kind words. I should have been the first to render expression to them, 
but for the face not being familiar to me, Mr. Humphreys. May your residence among us be marked as a red-letter day, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Cooper, said Humphreys, for your good wishes, and Mr. Palmer also. I do hope very much that this change of, uh, tenancy, which you must all regret, I am sure, will not be to the detriment of those with whom I shall be brought in contact. He stopped, feeling that the words were not fitting themselves together in the happiest way, and Mr. Cooper cut in, Oh, you may rest satisfied of that, Mr. Humphreys. I'll take it upon myself to assure you, sir, that a warm welcome awaits you on all sides. And as to any change of propriety, turning out detrimental to the neighbourhood, well, your late uncle, and here Mr. Cooper also stopped, possibly in obedience to an inner monitor, possibly because Mr. Palmer, clearing his throat loudly, asked Humphreys for his ticket. The two men left the little station, and, at Humphreys's suggestion, decided to walk to Mr. Cooper's house, where luncheon was awaiting them. The relation in which these personages stood to each other can be explained in a very few lines. Humphreys had inherited, quite unexpectedly, a property from an uncle. Neither the property nor the uncle had he ever seen. He was alone in the world, a man of good ability and kindly nature, whose employment in a government office for the last four or five years had not gone far to fit him for the life of a country gentleman. He was studious and rather diffident, and had few out-of-door pursuits except golf and gardening. Today he had come down for the first time to visit Willsthorpe and confer with Mr. Cooper the bailiff as to the matters which needed immediate attention. It may be asked how this came to be his first visit. Ought he not in decency to have attended his uncle's funeral? The answer is not far to seek. He had been abroad at the time of the death, and his address had not been at once procurable. So he had put off coming to Willsthorpe till he heard that all things were ready for him. And now we find him arrived at Mr. Cooper's comfortable house, facing the parsonage and having just shaken hands with the smiling Mrs. and Miss Cooper. During the minutes that preceded the announcement of luncheon, the party settled themselves on elaborate chairs in the drawing-room, Humphreys, for his part, perspiring quietly in the consciousness that stock was being taken of him. "'I was just saying to Mr. Humphreys, my dear,' said Mr. Cooper, "'that I hope and trust that his residence among us here in Willsthorpe will be marked as a red-letter day. Yes, indeed, I'm sure, said Mrs. Cooper heartily, and many, many of them. Miss Cooper murmured words to the same effect, and Humphreys attempted a pleasantry about painting the whole calendar red, which, though greeted with shrill laughter, was evidently not fully understood. At this point they proceeded to luncheon. Do you know this part of the country at all, Mr. Humphreys? said Mrs. Cooper, after a short interval. This was a better opening. "'No, I'm sorry to say I do not,' said Humphreys. "'It seems very pleasant, what I could see of it coming down in the train.' "'Oh, it is a pleasant part. Really, I sometimes say I don't know a nicer district for the country, and the people round, too. Such a quantity always going on. But I'm afraid you've come a little late for some of the better garden parties, Mr. Humphreys.' "'I suppose I have. Dear me, what a pity!' said Humphreys, with a gleam of relief, and then, feeling that something more could be got out of this topic. "'But after all, you see, Mrs. Cooper, even if I could have been here earlier, I should have been cut off from them, should I not? My poor uncle's recent death, you know.' "'Oh, dear, Mr. Humphreys, to be sure! What a dreadful thing of me to say!' And Mr. and Miss Cooper seconded the proposition inarticulately. What must you have thought? I am sorry. You must really forgive me. Not at all, Mrs. Cooper, I assure you. I can't honestly assert that my uncle's death was a great grief to me, for I had never seen him. All I meant was that I supposed I shouldn't be expected to take part for some little time in festivities of that kind. Now, really, it's very kind of you to take it in that way, Mr. Humphreys, isn't it, George? And you do forgive me. But only fancy, you never saw poor old Mr. Wilson. Never in my life. 
nor did I ever have a letter from him. But, by the way, you have something to forgive me for. I've never thanked you, except by letter, for all the trouble you've taken to find people to look after me at the hall. Oh, I'm sure that was nothing, Mr. Humphreys, but I really do think that you'll find them give satisfaction. The man and his wife, whom we've got for the butler and housekeeper, we've known for a number of years. Such a nice, respectable couple. And Mr. Cooper, I'm sure, can answer for the men in the stables and the gardens. Yes, Mr. Humphreys, they're a good lot. The head gardener's the only one who's stopped on from Mr. Wilson's time. The major part of the employees, as you no doubt saw by the will, received legacies from the old gentleman and retired from their posts. And as the wife says, your housekeeper and butler are calculated to render you every satisfaction. So everything, Mr. Humphreys, is ready for you to step in this very day, according to what I understood you to wish, said Mrs. Cooper. Everything, that is, except company, and there I'm afraid you'll find yourself quite at a standstill. Only we did understand it was your intention to move in at once. If not, I'm sure you know we should have been only too pleased for you to stay here. I'm quite sure you would, Mrs. Cooper, and I'm very grateful to you. But I thought I had really better make the plunge at once. I'm accustomed to living alone, and there will be quite enough to occupy my evenings, looking over papers and books and so on, for some time to come. I thought if Mr. Cooper could spare the time this afternoon to go over the house and grounds with me. Certainly, certainly, Mr. Humphreys. My time is your own, up to any hour you please. Till dinner time, father, you mean? said Miss Cooper. Don't forget we're going over to the Bresnets. And have you got all the garden keys? Are you a great gardener, Miss Cooper? said Mr. Humphreys. I wish you would tell me what I am to expect at the hall. "'Oh, I don't know about a great gardener, Mr. Humphreys. "'I'm very fond of flowers, but the whole garden might be made quite lovely, I often say. "'It's very old-fashioned as it is, and a great deal of shrubbery. "'There's an old temple besides, and a maze.' "'Really? Have you explored it ever?' "'No,' said Miss Cooper, drawing in her lips and shaking her head. "'I've often longed to try, but old Mr. Wilson always kept it locked. He wouldn't even let Lady Wardrop into it. She lives near here at Bentley, you know, and she's a great gardener, if you like. That's why I asked Father if he had all the keys. I see. Well, I must evidently look into that, and show you over it when I've learnt the way. Oh, thank you so much, Mr. Humphreys. Now I shall have the laugh of Miss Foster. That's our rector's daughter, you know. They're away on their holiday now. Such nice people. We always had a joke between us. Which should be the first to get into the maze? I think the garden keys must be up at the house, said Mr. Cooper, who had been looking over a large bunch. There is a number there in the library. Now, Mr. Humphreys, if you're prepared, we might bid good-bye to these ladies and set forward on our little tour of exploration. As they came out of Mr. Cooper's front gate, Humphreys had to run the gauntlet not of an organized demonstration, but of a good deal of touching of hats and careful contemplation from the men and women who had gathered, in somewhat unusual numbers, in the village street. He had further to exchange some remarks with the wife of the lodgekeeper as they passed the park gates, and with the lodgekeeper himself, who was attending to the park road. I cannot, however, spare the time to report the progress fully. As they traversed the half-mile or so between the lodge and the house, Humphreys took occasion to ask his companion some question which brought up the topic of his late uncle, and it did not take long before Mr. Cooper was embarked upon a disquisition. "'It is singular to think, as the wife was saying just now, that you should never have seen the old gentleman. And yet you won't misunderstand me, Mr. Humphreys, I feel confident.' when I say that, in my opinion, there would have been but little congeniality betwixt yourself and him. Not that I have a word to say in deprecation, not a single word. I can tell you what he was, said Mr. Cooper, pulling up suddenly, and fixing Humphreys with his eye, can tell you what he was in a nutshell, as the saying goes. He was a complete, thorough, valentudinarian. That describes him to a T. That's what he was, sir, a complete valentudinarian. No participation in what went on around him. 
I did venture, I think, to send you a few words of cutting from our local paper, which I took the occasion to contribute on his decease. If I recollect myself aright, such is very much the gist of them. But don't, Mr. Humphreys, continued Cooper, tapping him impressively on the chest, don't you run away with the impression that I wish to say aught but what is most creditable, most creditable, of your respected uncle and my late employer, upright, Mr. Humphreys, open as the day, liberal to all in his dealings. He had the heart to feel and the hand to accommodate. But there it was, there was the stumbling block, his unfortunate health, or, as I might more truly phrase it, his want of health. Yes, poor man, did he suffer from any special disorder before his last illness, which I take it was little more than old age? Just that, Mr. Humphreys, just that. The flash flickering slowly away in the pan, said Mr. Cooper, with what he considered an appropriate gesture. The golden bowl, gradually ceasing to vibrate. But as to your other question, I should return a negative answer. General absence of vitality? Yes. Special complaint? No. Unless you reckon a nasty cough he had with him. Why, here we are pretty much at the house. A handsome mansion, Mr. Humphreys, don't you consider? It deserved the epithet on the whole, but it was oddly proportioned. A very tall red brick house, with a plain parapet concealing the roof almost entirely. It gave the impression of a town house set down in the country. There was a basement and a rather imposing flight of steps leading up to the front door. It seemed also, owing to its height, to desiderate wings, but there were none. The stables and other offices were concealed by trees. Humphreys guessed its probable date as 1770 or thereabouts. The mature couple, who had been engaged to act as butler and cook-housekeeper, were waiting inside the front door, and opened it as their new master approached. Their name, Humphreys already knew, was Calton. Of their appearance and manner he formed a favourable impression in the few minutes' talk he had with them. It was agreed that he should go through the plate and the cellar next day with Mr. Calton, and that Mrs. C. should have a talk with him about linen, bedding, and so on, what there was and what there ought to be. Then he and Cooper, dismissing the Caltons for the present, began their view of the house. Its topography is not of importance to this story. The large rooms on the ground floor were satisfactory, especially the library, which was as large as the dining room, and had three tall windows facing east. The bedroom prepared for Humphreys was immediately above it. There were many pleasant, and a few really interesting, old pictures. None of the furniture was new, and hardly any of the books were later than the seventies. After hearing of and seeing the few changes his uncle had made in the house, and contemplating a shiny portrait of him which adorned the drawing-room, Humphreys was forced to agree with Cooper that in all probability there would have been little to attract him in his predecessor. It made him rather sad that he could not be sorry, dolebat se dolere non posse, readers note, the Latin phrase is translation of the phrase before, sad that he could not be sorry, end of readers note. It made him rather sad that he could not be sorry for the man who, whether with or without some feeling of kindliness towards his unknown nephew, had contributed so much to his well-being, for he felt that Willsthorpe was a place in which he could be happy, and especially happy, it might be, in its library. And now it was time to go over the garden. The empty stables could wait, and so could the laundry so to the garden they addressed themselves. And it was soon evident that Miss Cooper had been right in thinking that there were possibilities. Also, that Mr. Cooper had done well in keeping on the gardener. The deceased Mr. Wilson might not have, indeed plainly had not, been imbued with the latest views on gardening, but whatever had been done here had been done under the eye of a knowledgeable man, and the equipment and stock were excellent. Cooper was delighted with the pleasure Humphreys showed, and with the suggestions he let fall from time to time. "'I can see,' he said, "'that you've found your meteor here, Mr. Humphreys, 
you'll make this place a regular Sinosia before very many seasons have passed over our heads. I wish Clutterham had been here. That's the head gardener, and here he would have been, of course, as I told you, but for his son's being horse Dover with a fever, poor fellow. I should like him to have heard how the place strikes you. Yes, you told me he couldn't be here today, and I was very sorry to hear the reason, but it will be time enough tomorrow. What is that white building on the mound at the end of the grass ride? Is it the temple Miss Cooper mentioned? That it is, Mr. Humphreys, the temple of friendship, constructed of marble brought out of Italy for the purpose by your late uncle's grandfather. Would it interest you, perhaps, to take a turn there? You get a very sweet prospect of the park. The general lines of the temple were those of the Sibyl's temple at Tivoli, helped out by a dome only the whole was a good deal smaller. Some ancient sepulchral reliefs were built into the wall, and about it all was a pleasant flavour of the grand tour. Cooper produced the key, and with some difficulty opened the heavy door. Inside there was a handsome ceiling, but little furniture. Most of the floor was occupied by a pile of thick circular blocks of stone, each of which had a single letter deeply cut on its slightly convex upper surface. "'What is the meaning of these?' Humphreys inquired. "'Meaning? Well, all things, we are told, have their purpose, Mr. Humphreys, and I suppose these blocks have had theirs as well as another. But what that purpose is or was—' Mr. Cooper assumed a didactic attitude here. "'I, for one, should be at a loss to point out to you, sir. All I know of them—' and it's summed up in a very few words, is just this, that they are stated to have been removed by your late uncle, at a period before I entered on the scene, from the maze. That, Mr. Humphreys, is— Oh, the maze! exclaimed Humphreys. I'd forgotten that. We must have a look at it. Where is it? Cooper drew him to the door of the temple, and pointed with his stick. Guide your eye, he said somewhat in the manner of the second elder in Handel's Susanna. Far to the west direct your straining eyes, where yon tall holm tree rises to the skies. Guide your eye by my stick here, and follow out the line directly opposite to the spot where we're standing now, and I'll engage, Mr. Humphreys, that you'll catch the archway over the entrance. You'll see it just at the end of the walk, answering to the one that leads up to this very building. Did you think of going there at once? Because if that be the case, I must go to the house and procure the key. If you would walk on there, I'll rejoin you in a few moments' time. Accordingly, Humphreys strolled down the ride leading to the temple, past the garden front of the house, and up the turfy approach to the archway which Cooper had pointed out to him. He was surprised to find that the whole maze was surrounded by a high wall, and that the archway was provided with a padlocked iron gate. But then he remembered that Miss Cooper had spoken of his uncle's objection to letting anyone enter this part of the garden. He was now at the gate, and still Cooper came not. For a few minutes he occupied himself in reading the motto cut over the entrance, Secretum meum mihi et filiis domus miei and in trying to recollect the source of it. Reader's note. The Latin translates to My secret is for me and the sons of my house. End of reader's note. Then he became impatient, and considered the possibility of scaling the wall. This was clearly not worth while. It might have been done if he had been wearing an older suit. Or could the padlock, a very old one, be forced? No, apparently not and yet, as he gave a final irritated kick at the gate, something gave way, and the lock fell at his feet. He pushed the gate open, inconveniencing a number of nettles as he did so, and stepped into the enclosure. It was a yew maze, of circular form, and the hedges, long untrimmed, had grown out and upwards to a most unorthodox breadth and height. The walks, too, were next door to impassable. Only by entirely disregarding scratches, nettle stings, and wet could Humphreys force his way along them. 
but at any rate this condition of things, he reflected, would make it easier for him to find his way out again, for he left a very visible track. So far as he could remember, he had never been in a maze before, nor did it seem to him now that he had missed much. The dankness and darkness, and smell of crushed goose-grass and nettles, were anything but cheerful. Still, it did not seem to be a very intricate specimen of its kind. Here he was. By the way, was that Cooper arrived at last? No. Very nearly at the heart of it, without having taken much thought as to what path he was following. Ah, there at last was the centre, easily gained. And there was something to reward him. His first impression was that the central ornament was a sundial. But when he had switched away some portion of the thick growth of brambles and bindweed that had formed over it, he saw that it was a less ordinary decoration. A stone column about four feet high, and on the top of it a metal globe, copper to judge by the green patina, engraved, and finely engraved too, with figures in outline and letters. That was what Humphreys saw and a brief glance at the figures convinced him that it was one of those mysterious things called celestial globes, from which, one would suppose, no one ever yet derived any information about the heavens. However, it was too dark, at least in the maze, for him to examine this curiosity at all closely, and besides he now heard Cooper's voice, and sounds as of an elephant in the jungle. Humphreys called to him to follow the track he had beaten out and soon Cooper emerged, panting, into the central circle. He was full of apologies for his delay. He had not been able, after all, to find the key. But there, he said, you've penetrated into the heart of the mystery, unaided and unannealed, as the saying goes. Well, I suppose it's a matter of thirty to forty years since any human foot has trod these precincts. Certain it is that I've never set foot in them before. Well, well, What's the old proverb about angels fearing to tread? It's proved true once again in this case. Humphrey's acquaintance with Cooper, though it had been short, was sufficient to assure him that there was no guile in this illusion, and he forbore the obvious remark, merely suggesting that it was fully time to get back to the house for a late cup of tea, and to release Cooper for his evening engagement. They left the maze accordingly experiencing well nigh the same ease in retracing their path as they had in coming in. "'Have you any idea?' Humphreys asked as they went towards the house. "'Why my uncle kept that place so carefully locked?' Cooper pulled up, and Humphreys felt he must be on the brink of a revelation. "'I should merely be deceiving you, Mr. Humphreys, and that to no good purpose, if I laid claim to possess any information whatsoever on that topic. When I first entered upon my duties here, some eighteen years back, that maze was word for word in the condition you see it now, and the one and only occasion on which the question ever arose within my knowledge was that of which my girl made mention in your hearing. Lady Wardrop, I've not a word to say against her, wrote, applying for admission to the maze, your uncle showed me the note, a most civil note, everything that could be expected from such a quarter. Cooper, he said, I wish you'd reply to that note on my behalf. Certainly, Mr. Wilson, I said, for I was quite inured to acting as his secretary. What answer shall I return to it? Well, he said, give Lady Wardrop my compliments, and tell her that if ever that portion of the grounds is taken in hand, I shall be happy to give her the first opportunity of viewing it, but that it has been shut up now for a number of years, and I shall be grateful to her if she kindly won't press the matter. That, Mr. Humphreys, was your good uncle's last word on the subject, and I don't think I can add anything to it. Unless, added Cooper after a pause, it might be just this, that so far as I could form a judgment, he had a dislike as people often will for one reason or another, to the memory of his grandfather, who, as I mentioned to you, had that maze laid out. A man of peculiar teenet, Mr. Humphreys, and a great traveller. You'll have the opportunity on the coming Sabbath, 
of seeing the tablet to him in our little parish church, put up it was some long time after his death. Oh, I should have expected a man who had such a taste for building to have designed a mausoleum for himself. Well, I've never noticed anything of the kind you mention, and in fact, come to think of it, I'm not at all sure that his resting place is within our boundaries at all. That he lays in the vaults, I'm pretty confident, is not the case. Curious now that I shouldn't be in a position to inform you on that heading. Still, after all, we can't say, can we, Mr. Humphreys, that it's a point of crucial importance where the poor mortal coils are bestowed. At this point they entered the house, and Cooper's speculations were interrupted. Tea was laid in the library, where Mr. Cooper fell upon subjects appropriate to the scene. A fine collection of books, one of the finest I've understood from connoisseurs in this part of the country. Splendid plates, too, in some of these works. I recollect your uncle showing me one with views of foreign towns. Most absorbing it was. Got up in first-rate style. And another all done by hand, with the ink as fresh as if it had been laid on yesterday. And yet he told me it was the work of some old monk hundreds of years back. I've always taken a keen interest in literature myself. Hardly anything to my mind can compare with a good hour's reading after a hard day's work far better than wasting the whole evening at a friend's house. And that reminds me, to be sure, I shall be getting into trouble with the wife if I don't make the best of my way home, and get ready to squander away one of these same evenings. I must be off, Mr. Humphreys. And that reminds me, said Humphreys. If I'm to show Miss Cooper the maze to-morrow, we must have it cleared out a bit. Could you say a word about that to the proper person? Why, to be sure. A couple of men with scythes could cut out a track to-morrow morning. I'll leave word as I pass the lodge, and I'll tell them what'll save you the trouble, perhaps, Mr. Humphreys, of having to go up and extract them yourself, that they'd better have some sticks or a tape to mark out their way with as they go on. A very good idea. Yes, do that. And I'll expect Mrs. and Miss Cooper in the afternoon, and yourself about half-past ten in the morning. It'll be a pleasure, I'm sure, both to them and to myself, Mr. Humphreys. Good night. The end of part one of Mr. Humphreys and his inheritance in Ghost Stories of an Antiquary by M. R. James. Part two of Mr. Humphreys and His Inheritance, a LibriVox recording by Peter Yearsley. Humphreys dined at eight, but for the fact that it was his first evening, and that Calton was evidently inclined for occasional conversation, he would have finished the novel he had brought for his journey. As it was, he had to listen and reply to some of Calton's impressions of the neighbourhood and the season. The latter, it appeared, was seasonable and the former had changed considerably, and not altogether for the worse, since Calton's boyhood, which had been spent there. The village shop in particular had greatly improved since the year 1870. It was now possible to procure there pretty much anything you liked in reason, which was a conveniency, because suppose anything was required of a sudden, and he had known such things before now, he, Calton, could step down there, supposing the shop to be still open, and order it in without he borrowed it of the rectory, whereas in earlier days it would have been useless to pursue such a course in respect of anything but candles, or soap, or treacle, or perhaps a penny child's picture book. And nine times out of ten it'd be something more in the nature of a bottle of whisky you'd be requiring. Leastways, on the whole, Humphreys thought he would be prepared with a book in future. The library was the obvious place for the after-dinner hours. Candle in hand and pipe in mouth, he moved round the room for some time, taking stock of the titles of the books. He had all the predisposition to take interest in an old library, and there was every opportunity for him here to make systematic acquaintance with one for he had learned from Cooper that there was no catalogue save the very superficial one made for purposes of probate. 
the drawing up of a catalogue raison would be a delicious occupation for winter. There were probably treasures to be found, too, even manuscripts if Cooper might be trusted. As he pursued his round, the sense came upon him, as it does upon most of us in similar places, of the extreme unreadableness of a great portion of the collection. Editions of classics and fathers and Picard's religious ceremonies and the Harleian miscellany, I suppose, are all very well, but who is ever going to read Tostatus Abulensis or Pineda on Job or a book like this? He picked out a small quarto, loose in the binding, and from which the lettered label had fallen off, and observing that coffee was waiting for him, retired to a chair. Eventually he opened the book. It will be observed that his condemnation of it rested wholly on external grounds. For all he knew, it might have been a collection of unique plays, but undeniably the outside was blank and forbidding. As a matter of fact, it was a collection of sermons or meditations, and mutilated at that, for the first sheet was gone. It seemed to belong to the latter end of the seventeenth century. He turned over the pages till his eye was caught by a marginal note. A parable of this unhappy condition, and he thought he would see what aptitudes the author might have for imaginative composition. I have heard or read, so ran the passage, whether in the way of parable or a true relation, I leave my reader to judge, of a man who, like Theseus in the Attic tale, should adventure himself into a labyrinth or maze, and such an one indeed as was not laid out in the fashion of our topiary artists of this age, but of a wide compass, in which, moreover, such unknown pitfalls and snares, nay, such ill-omened inhabitants, were commonly thought to lurk as could only be encountered at the hazard of one's very life. Now you may be sure that in such a case the dissuasions of friends were not wanting. Consider of such an one, says a brother, how he went the way you wot of, and was never seen more. Or of such another, says the mother, that adventured himself but a little way in, and from that day forth is so troubled in his wits, that he cannot tell what he saw, nor hath passed one good night. And have you never heard, cries a neighbour, of what faces have been seen to look out over the palisados, and betwixt the bars of the gate? But all would not do. The man was set upon his purpose, for it seems it was the common fireside talk of that country that at the heart and centre of this labyrinth there was a jewel of such price and rarity that would enrich the finder thereof for his life, and this should be his by right that could persevere to come at it. What then? Quid Malta? The adventurer passed the gates, and for a whole day's space his friends without had no news of him, except it might be by some indistinct cries heard afar off in the night, such as made them turn in their restless beds and sweat for very fear, not doubting but that their son and brother had put one more to the catalogue of those unfortunates that had suffered shipwreck on that voyage. So the next day they went with weeping tears to the clerk of the parish to order the bell to be tolled, and their way took them hard by the gate of the labyrinth, which they would have hastened by from the horror they had of it, but that they caught sight of a sudden of a man's body lying in the roadway, and going up to it, with what anticipations may be easily figured, found it to be him whom they reckoned as lost, and not dead, though he were in a swoon most like death. They, then, who had gone forth as mourners, came back rejoicing, and set to by all means to revive their prodigal, who, being come to himself, and hearing of their anxieties and their errand of that morning, I, says he, you may as well finish what you are about, for, for all I have brought back the jewel, which he showed them, and was indeed a rare piece, I have brought back that with it, that will leave me neither rest at night nor pleasure by day whereupon they were instant with him to learn his meaning, and where his company should be that went so sore against his stomach. Oh, says he, tis here in my breast, 
I cannot flee from it, do what I may. So it needed no wizard to help them to a guess that it was the recollection of what he had seen that troubled him so wonderfully. But they could get no more of him for a long time but by fits and starts. However, at long and at last they made shift to collect somewhat of this kind. That at first, while the sun was bright, he went merrily on, and without any difficulty reached the heart of the labyrinth, and got the jewel, and so set out on his way back rejoicing. But as the night fell, wherein all the beasts of the forests do move, he begun to be sensible of some creature keeping pace with him, and, as he thought, peering and looking upon him from the next alley to that he was in, and that when he should stop, this companion should stop also, which put him in some disorder of his spirits. And indeed, as the darkness increased, it seemed to him that there was more than one, and it might be even a whole band of such followers, at least so he judged by the rustling and cracking that they kept among the thickets. Besides that, there would be at a time a sound of whispering, which seemed to import a conference among them. But in regard of who they were, or what form they were of, he would not be persuaded to say what he thought. Upon his hearers asking him what the cries were which they heard in the night, as was observed above, he gave them this account, that about midnight, so far as he could judge, he heard his name called from a long way off, and he would have been sworn it was his brother that so called him. So he stood still and hallooed at the pitch of his voice, and he supposed that the echo or the noise of his shouting disguised for the moment any lesser sound, because when there fell a stillness again, he distinguished a trampling, not loud, of running feet coming very close behind him, wherewith he was so daunted that himself set off to run, and that he continued till the dawn broke. Sometimes when his breath failed him, he would cast himself flat on his face, and hope that his pursuers might overrun him in the darkness but at such a time they would regularly make a pause, and he could hear them pant and snuff as it had been a hound at fault, which wrought in him so extreme an horror of mind that he would be forced to betake himself again to turning and doubling, if by any means he might throw them off the scent. And as if this exertion was in itself not terrible enough, he had before him the constant fear of falling into some pit or trap, of which he had heard, and indeed seen with his own eyes that there were several, some at the sides, and other in the midst of the alleys, so that, in fine, he said, a more dreadful night was never spent by mortal creature than that he had endured in that labyrinth, and not that jewel which he had in his wallet, nor the richest that was ever brought out of the Indies, could be a sufficient recompense to him for the pains he had suffered. I will spare to set down the further recital of this man's troubles, inasmuch as I am confident my reader's intelligence will hit the parallel I desire to draw. For is not this jewel a just emblem of the satisfaction which a man may bring back with him from a course of this world's pleasures? And will not the labyrinth serve for an image of the world itself? wherein such a treasure, if we may believe the common voice, is stored up. At about this point Humphreys thought that a little patience would be an agreeable change, and that the writer's improvement of his parable might be left to itself. So he put the book back in its former place, wondering as he did so whether his uncle had ever stumbled across that passage, and if so, whether it had worked on his fancy so much as to make him dislike the idea of a maze and determined to shut up the one in the garden. Not long afterwards he went to bed. The next day brought a morning's hard work with Mr. Cooper, who, if exuberant in language, had the business of the estate at his fingers' ends. He was very breezy this morning, Mr. Cooper was. Had not forgotten the order to clear out the maze. The work was going on at that moment. His girl was on the tentacles of expectation about it. He also hoped that Humphreys had slept the sleep of the just, and that we should be favoured with a continuance of this congenial weather. 
At luncheon he enlarged on the pictures in the dining-room, and pointed out the portrait of the constructor of the temple and the maze. Humphreys examined this with considerable interest. It was the work of an Italian, and had been painted when old Mr. Wilson was visiting Rome as a young man. There was, indeed, a view of the Colosseum in the background. A pale, thin face and large eyes were the characteristic features. In the hand was a partially unfolded roll of paper, on which could be distinguished the plan of a circular building, very probably the temple, and also part of that of a labyrinth. Humphreys got up on a chair to examine it, but it was not painted with sufficient clearness to be worth copying. It suggested to him, however, that he might as well make a plan of his own maze, and hang it in the hall for the use of visitors. This determination of his was confirmed that same afternoon, for when Mrs. and Miss Cooper arrived, eager to be inducted into the maze, he found that he was wholly unable to lead them to the centre. The gardeners had removed the guide marks they had been using, and even Clutterham, when summoned to assist, was as helpless as the rest. The point is, you see, Mr. Wilson, I should say Humphreys, these mazes is purposely constructed so much alike with a view to mislead. Still, if you'll follow me, I think I can put you right. I'll just put my hat down here as a starting point. He stumped off, and after five minutes brought the party safe to the hat again. Now that's a very peculiar thing, he said with a sheepish laugh. I made sure I'd left that hat just over against a bramble bush, and you can see for yourself there ain't no bramble bush not in this walk at all. If you'll allow me, Mr. Humphreys, that's the name in it, sir, I'll just call one of the men in to mark the place like. William Crack arrived, in answer to repeated shouts. He had some difficulty in making his way to the party. First he was seen or heard in an inside alley, then, almost at the same moment, in an outer one. However, he joined them at last, and was first consulted without effect, and then stationed by the hat, which Clutterham still considered it necessary to leave on the ground. In spite of this strategy, they spent the best part of three-quarters of an hour in quite fruitless wanderings, and Humphreys was obliged at last, seeing how tired Mrs. Cooper was becoming, to suggest a retreat to tea, with profuse apologies to Miss Cooper. "'At any rate you've won your bet with Miss Foster,' he said. "'You have been inside the maze, and I promise you the first thing I do shall be to make a proper plan of it with the lines marked out for you to go by.' "'That's what's wanted, sir,' said Clutterham. "'Someone to draw out a plan and keep it by them. "'It might be very awkward, you see, anyone getting into that place "'and a shower of rain come on, and them not able to find their way out again. "'It might be hours before they could be got out, "'without you'd permit of me making a short cut to the middle. "'What my meaning is, taking down a couple of trees in each edge, "'in a straight line so you could get a clear view right through. "'Of course, that'd do away with it as a maze.' but I don't know as you'd approve of that. No, I won't have that done yet. I'll make a plan first, and let you have a copy. Later on, if we find occasion, I'll think of what you say. Humphreys was vexed and ashamed at the fiasco of the afternoon, and could not be satisfied without making another effort that evening to reach the centre of the maze. His irritation was increased by finding it without a single false step. He had thoughts of beginning his plan at once, but the light was fading, and he felt that by the time he had got the necessary materials together, work would be impossible. Next morning, accordingly, carrying a drawing-board, pencils, compasses, cartridge paper, and so forth, some of which had been borrowed from the coopers and some found in the library cupboards, he went to the middle of the maze, again without any hesitation, and set out his materials. He was, however, delayed in making a start. The brambles and weeds that had obscured the column and globe were now all cleared away, and it was for the first time possible to see clearly what these were like. The column was featureless, resembling those on which sundials are usually placed. Not so the globe. I have said that it was finely engraved with figures and inscriptions, and that on a first glance Humphreys had taken it for a celestial globe but he soon found that it did not answer to his recollection of such things. One feature seemed familiar, a winged serpent, Draco, 
encircled it about the place which on a terrestrial globe is occupied by the equator. But on the other hand, a good part of the upper hemisphere was covered by the outspread wings of a large figure whose head was concealed by a ring at the pole or summit of the hole. Around the place of the head, the words Princep Tenebrarum could be deciphered. Reader's note, Princeps Tenebrarum is the Prince of Darkness. End of reader's note. In the lower hemisphere there was a space hatched all over with cross lines and marked as Umbra Mortis. Reader's note, the Shadow of Death. End of reader's note. Near it was a range of mountains, and among them a valley with flames rising from it. This was lettered, will you be surprised to learn it, Valis Filiorum Hinum. Reader's note, the valley of the sons of Gehenna. End of reader's note. Above and below Draco were outlined various figures not unlike the pictures of the ordinary constellations, but not the same. Thus a nude man with a raised club was described not as Hercules, but as Cain. Another, plunged up to his middle in earth and stretching out despairing arms, was Kore, not Ophiuchus. And the third, hung by his hair to a snaky tree, was Absalon. Near the last, a man in long robes and high cap, standing in a circle and addressing two shaggy demons who hovered outside, was described as Hostanes Magus, a character unfamiliar to Humphreys. Reader's note, Hostanes Magus is Hostanes, the mage of Xerxes, king of Persia. End of reader's note. The scheme of the whole, indeed, seemed to be an assemblage of the patriarchs of evil, perhaps not uninfluenced by a study of Dante. Humphreys thought it an unusual exhibition of his great-grandfather's taste, but reflected that he had probably picked it up in Italy, and had never taken the trouble to examine it closely. Certainly, had he set much store by it, he would not have exposed it to wind and weather. He tapped the metal, it seemed hollow and not very thick, and turning from it addressed himself to his plan. After half an hour's work he found it was impossible to get on without using a clue, so he procured a roll of twine from Clutterham and laid it out along the alleys from the entrance to the centre, tying the end to the ring at the top of the globe. This expedient helped him to set out a rough plan before luncheon, and in the afternoon he was able to draw it in more neatly. Towards tea-time Mr. Cooper joined him, and was much interested in his progress. "'Now this,' said Mr. Cooper, laying his hand on the globe, and then drawing it away hastily, "'Whew! Holds the heat, doesn't it, to a surprising degree, Mr. Humphreys. I suppose this metal—copper, isn't it?—would be an insulator, or conductor, or whatever they call it.' The sun has been pretty strong this afternoon, said Humphreys, evading the scientific point. But I didn't notice the globe had got hot. No, it doesn't seem very hot to me, he added. Odd, said Mr. Cooper. Now I can't hardly bear my hand on it. Something in the difference of temperament between us, I suppose. I dare say you're a chilly subject, Mr. Humphreys. I'm not, and that's where the distinction lies. All this summer I've slept, if you'll believe me, practically in statu quo, and had my morning tub as cold as I could get it, day out and day in. Let me assist you with that string. It's all right, thanks, but if you'll collect some of these pencils and things that are lying about, I shall be much obliged. Now, I think we've got everything, and we might get back to the house. They left the maze, Humphreys rolling up the clue as they went. The night was rainy. Most unfortunately, it turned out that, whether by Cooper's fault or not, the plan had been the one thing forgotten the evening before. As was to be expected, it was ruined by the wet. There was nothing for it but to begin again. The job would not be a long one this time. The clue, therefore, was put in place once more, and a fresh start made. But Humphreys had not done much before an interruption came in the shape of Calton with a telegram. His late chief in London wanted to consult him. Only a brief interview was wanted, but the summons was urgent. This was annoying, yet it was not really upsetting. There was a train available in half an hour, and, unless things went very cross, he could be back possibly by five o'clock, certainly by eight. 
He gave the plan to Calton to take to the house, but it was not worth while to remove the clue. All went as he had hoped. He spent a rather exciting evening in the library, for he lighted to-night upon a cupboard where some of the rarer books were kept. When he went up to bed, he was glad to find that the servant had remembered to leave his curtains undrawn and his windows open. He put down his light and went to the window which commanded a view of the garden and the park. It was a brilliant moonlit night. In a few weeks' time the sonorous winds of autumn would break up all this calm. But now the distant woods were in a deep stillness. The slopes of the lawns were shining with dew. The colours of some of the flowers could almost be guessed. The light of the moon just caught the cornice of the temple and the curve of its leaden dome, and Humphreys had to own that, so seen, these conceits of a past age have a real beauty. In short, the light, the perfume of the woods, and the absolute quiet called up such kind old associations in his mind that he went on ruminating them for a long, long time. As he turned from the window, he felt he had never seen anything more complete of its sort. The one feature that struck him with a sense of incongruity was a small Irish yew, thin and black, which stood out like an outpost of the shrubbery through which the maze was approached. That, he thought, might as well be a way. The wonder was that anyone should have thought it would look well in that position. However. Next morning, in the press of answering letters and going over books with Mr. Cooper, the Irish U was forgotten. One letter, by the way, arrived this day, which has to be mentioned. It was from that Lady Wardrop, whom Miss Cooper had mentioned, and it renewed the application which she had addressed to Mr. Wilson. She pleaded, in the first place, that she was about to publish a book of mazes, and earnestly desired to include the plan of the Wilsthorpe maze and also that it would be a great kindness if Mr. Humphreys could let her see it, if at all, at an early date, since she would soon have to go abroad for the winter months. Her house at Bentley was not far distant, so Humphreys was able to send a note by hand to her, suggesting the very next day, or the day after, for her visit. It may be said at once that the messenger brought back a most grateful answer to the effect that the morrow would suit her admirably. The only other event of the day was that the plan of the maze was successfully finished. This night again was fair and brilliant and calm, and Humphreys lingered almost as long at his window. The Irish yew came to his mind again as he was on the point of drawing his curtains, but either he had been misled by a shadow the night before, or else the shrub was not really so obtrusive as he had fancied. Anyhow, he saw no reason for interfering with it. What he would do away with, however, was a clump of dark growth which had usurped a place against the house wall, and was threatening to obscure one of the lower range of windows. It did not look as if it could possibly be worth keeping. He fancied it dank and unhealthy, little as he could see of it. Next day, it was a Friday, he had arrived at Wilsthorpe on a Monday, Lady Wardrop came over in her car soon after luncheon. She was a stout, elderly person, very full of talk of all sorts, and particularly inclined to make herself agreeable to Humphreys, who had gratified her very much by his ready granting of her request. They made a thorough exploration of the place together, and Lady Wardrop's opinion of her host obviously rose sky-high when she found that he really knew something of gardening. She entered enthusiastically into all his plans for improvement but agreed that it would be a vandalism to interfere with the characteristic laying out of the ground near the house. With the temple she was particularly delighted, and said she, Do you know, Mr. Humphreys, I think your bailiff must be right about those lettered blocks of stone. One of my mazes, I'm sorry to say the stupid people have destroyed it now, it was at a place in Hampshire, had the track marked out in that way. There were tiles there, but lettered just like yours, and the letters, taken in the right order, formed an inscription. What it was, I forget, something uh, about Theseus and Ariadne. I have a copy of it, as well as the plan of the maze where it was. How people can do such things! I shall never forgive you if you injure your maze. 
Do you know they're becoming very uncommon? Almost every year I hear of one being grubbed up. Now, do let's get straight to it, or if you're too busy I know my way there perfectly, and I'm not afraid of getting lost in it, I know too much about mazes for that. Though I remember missing my lunch not so very long ago either, through getting entangled in the one at Busbury. Well, of course, if you can manage to come with me, that will be all the nicer. After this confident prelude, justice would seem to require that Lady Wardrop should have been hopelessly muddled by the Will's Thorpe amaze. Nothing of that kind happened. Yet it is to be doubted whether she got all the enjoyment from her new specimen that she expected. She was interested, keenly interested, to be sure, and pointed out to Humphreys a series of little depressions in the ground, which, she thought, marked the places of the lettered blocks. She told him, too, what other mazes resembled his most closely in arrangement, and explained how it was usually possible to date a maze to within twenty years by means of its plan. This one, she already knew, must be about as old as 1780, and its features were just what might be expected. The globe, furthermore, completely absorbed her. It was unique in her experience, and she pored over it for long. "'I should like a rubbing of that,' she said, "'if it could possibly be made. Yes, I am sure you would be most kind about it, Mr. Humphreys, but I trust you won't attempt it on my account. I do, indeed. I should not like to take any liberties here. I have the feeling that it might be resented. Now, confess,' she went on, turning and facing Humphreys, don't you feel, haven't you felt ever since you came in here, that a watch is being kept on us, and that if we overstepped the mark in any way there would be a, well, a pounce? No, I do, and I don't care how soon we are outside the gate. After all, she said, when they were once more on their way to the house, it may have been only the airlessness and the dull heat of that place that pressed on my brain. Still, I'll take back one thing I said. I'm not sure that I shan't forgive you after all if I find next spring that that maze has been grubbed up. Whether or no that's done, you shall have the plan, Lady Wardrop. I have made one, and no later than tonight I can trace your copy. Admirable. A pencil tracing will be all I want, with an indication of the scale. I can easily have it brought into line with the rest of my plates. Many, many thanks. Very well. You shall have that to-morrow. I wish you could help me to a solution of my block puzzle. What, those stones in the summer-house? That is a puzzle. They are in no sort of order? Of course not. But the men who put them down must have had some directions. Perhaps you'll find a paper about it among your uncle's things. If not, you'll have to call in somebody who's an expert in ciphers. Advise me about something else, please, said Humphreys. That bush thing under the library window... You would have that away, wouldn't you? Which? That? Oh, I think not, said Lady Wardrop. I can't see it very well from this distance, but it's not unsightly. Perhaps you're right. Only, looking out of my window just above it last night, I thought it took up too much room. It doesn't seem to as one sees it from here, certainly. Very well. I'll leave it alone for a bit. Tea was the next business tea was the next business, soon after which Lady Wardrop drove off, but halfway down the drive she stopped the car and beckoned to Humphreys, who was still on the front door steps. He ran to glean her parting words, which were, "'It just occurs to me it might be worth your while to look at the underside of those stones. They must have been numbered, mustn't they? Good-bye again. Home, please.' The main occupation of this evening, at any rate, was settled, the tracing of the plan for Lady Wardrop, and the careful collation of it with the original meant a couple of hours' work at least. Accordingly, soon after nine, Humphreys had his materials put out in the library, and began. It was a still, stuffy evening, windows had to stand open, and he had more than one grisly encounter with a bat. These unnerving episodes made him keep the tail of his eye on the window. Once or twice it was a question whether there was not a bat, but something more considerable, that had a mind to join him. How unpleasant it would be if someone had slipped noiselessly over the sill and was crouching on the floor. 
The tracing of the plan was done. It remained to compare it with the original, and to see whether any paths had been wrongly closed or left open. With one finger on each paper, he traced out the course that must be followed from the entrance. There were one or two slight mistakes, but here near the centre was a bad confusion, probably due to the entry of the second or third bat. Before correcting the copy, he followed out carefully the last turnings of the path on the original. These at least were right. They led without a hitch to the middle space. Here was a feature which need not be repeated on the copy, an ugly black spot about the size of a shilling. Ink? No. It resembled a hole, but how should a hole be here? He stared at it with tired eyes. The work of tracing had been very laborious, and he was drowsy and oppressed. But surely this was a very odd hole. It seemed to go not only through the paper, but through the table on which it lay. Yes, and through the floor below that, down and still down, even into infinite depths. He craned over it, utterly bewildered. Just as, when you were a child, you may have pored over a square inch of counterpane until it became a landscape with wooded hills, and perhaps even churches and houses, and you lost all thought of the true size of yourself and it, so this hole seemed to Humphreys for the moment the only thing in the world. For some reason it was hateful to him from the first, but he had gazed at it for some moments before any feeling of anxiety came upon him, and then it did come, stronger and stronger, a horror lest something might emerge from it, and a really agonizing conviction that a terror was on its way, from the sight of which he would not be able to escape. Oh, yes, far, far down there was a movement, and the movement was upwards, towards the surface. Nearer and nearer it came, and it was of a blackish-gray color, with more than one dark hole. It took shape as a face, a human face, a burnt human face, and with the odious writhings of a wasp creeping out of a rotten apple, there clambered forth an appearance of a form, waving black arms, prepared to clasp the head that was bending over them. With a convulsion of despair, Humphreys threw himself back, struck his head against a hanging lamp, and fell. There was concussion of the brain, shock to the system, and a long confinement to bed. The doctor was badly puzzled, not by the symptoms, but by a request which Humphreys made to him as soon as he was able to say anything. I wish you would open the ball in the maze. Hardly enough room there, I should have thought, was the best answer he could summon up. But it's more in your way than mine. My dancing days are over. At which Humphreys muttered and turned over to sleep, and the doctor intimated to the nurses that the patient was not out of the wood yet. When he was better able to express his views, Humphreys made his meaning clear, and received a promise that the thing should be done at once. He was so anxious to learn the result that the doctor, who seemed a little pensive next morning, saw that more harm than good would be done by saving up his report. Well, he said, I am afraid the ball is done for. The metal must have worn thin, I suppose. Anyhow, it went all to bits with the first blow of the chisel. Well, go on, do, said Humphreys impatiently. Oh, you want to know what we found in it, of course. Well, it was half full of stuff like ashes. Ashes? What did you make of them? I haven't thoroughly examined them yet. There's hardly been time. But Cooper's made up his mind, I dare say from something I said, that it's a case of cremation. Now, don't excite yourself, my good sir. Yes, I must allow. I think he's probably right. The maze is gone, and Lady Wardrop has forgiven Humphreys. In fact, I believe he married her niece. She was right, too, in her conjecture that the stones in the temple were numbered. There had been a numeral painted on the bottom of each. Some few of these had rubbed off, but enough remained to enable Humphreys to reconstruct the inscription. It ran thus, Penetrans ad interiora mortis. Reader's Note penetrating into the interior places of death. End of reader's note. Grateful as Humphreys was to the memory of his uncle, 
he could not quite forgive him for having burnt the journals and letters of the James Wilson who had gifted Wilsthorpe with the maze and the temple. As to the circumstances of that ancestor's death and burial, no tradition survived, but his will, which was almost the only record of him accessible, assigned an unusually generous legacy to a servant who bore an Italian name. Mr. Cooper's view is that, humanly speaking, all these many solemn events have a meaning for us, if our limited intelligence permitted of our disintegrating it. While Mr. Calton has been reminded of an aunt now gone from us, who, about the year 1866, had been lost for upwards of an hour and a half in the maze at Covent Gardens, or it might be Hampton Court. One of the oddest things in the whole series of transactions is that the book which contained the parable has entirely disappeared. Humphreys has never been able to find it since he copied out the passage to send to Lady Wardrop. The End of Mr. Humphreys and His Inheritance From Ghost Stories of an Antiquary And the End of that book by M. R. James